So first of all, uh, this meeting is being recorded and the recording is going to be posted on our website uh, pretty soon. And all meeting materials are now available on our Innovative Clean Trends website. Uh, when it comes to the uh, presentation today, I do apologize that we basically chunked the entire presentation into a few um, different parts. Uh, because uh, different slides have uh, uh, different levels of uh, ADA remediation. Our goal was to put, post the old slides uh, before this meeting. So that's what we had to do in order to uh, get it done. Uh, later this week, we're going to uh, compile everything into one presentation. So if you're willing to come back later uh, this week, you can see a fully compiled presentation from today. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, hand this over to Annalisa. Thanks, Yuchen. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Annalisa Bevan. I am CARB Zero Emission Infrastructure Specialist, and I oversee um, all of CARB's uh, programs that are requiring zero emission vehicles and are dependent on fueling infrastructure deployment. Um, and so in this capacity, I work with all of our internal program staff and external stakeholders, and of course our sister agencies to identify um, strategies uh, for success and um, where policy development is needed. Um, and I really wanna thank uh, Yao Chen and the staff who've been putting this meeting together. Um, I am here to help out and, uh, but they are really, uh, the brains behind all of this effort. Um, the Innovative Clean Transit Regulation was adopted in December 2018 with a goal of transitioning all transit buses to zero emission by 2040. We're also anticipating that zero emission buses serve as a technology beachhead leading uh, other medium and heavy duty vehicle applications. To date, there are more than 1600 zero emission buses deployed. Um, on order or just funded, and this is ahead of our regulations 2027 target. Um, California transit agencies are going strong on zero emission bus deployment, and a lot of them are no longer in the pilot stage. Uh, it's time for us to plan and strategize how infrastructure scale up and full transition can take place in order to meet um, our goals for this regulation. Um, today, we have two tracks of discussion. In the morning, we'll discuss hydrogen and fuel cell buses. In the afternoon, we'll focus on electrical upgrade for battery electric buses. Um, each track will include case studies, discussion topics, questions and comments, and very importantly, to identify any next steps that we should all be working on. Uh, today's panelists include experienced transit agencies and consultants state agencies, hydrogen suppliers, and station builders, and electric utilities. I believe we're going to have a fruitful discussion today. Um, also, I want to introduce two guests today. One is Gia Basin, who is the Deputy Director of ZEV Market Development at GoBiz, and the other is Kyle Gradinger. Kyle is the Division Chief of Rail and Mass Transportation from Caltrans. We want to welcome them and sh uh, to share the state's vision and plan for zero emission buses. Um, Gia? Good morning, hey everyone. Thank you, Annalisa. Uh, welcome to, uh, to, to this great meeting today. I'm excited to be here and just wanted to start by thanking our colleagues at CARB for all their work in, in bringing us together on, on this important topic. Um, I just wanted to share a few thoughts and and then um, to kick us off, we'll hear from Kyle and then, you know, when his stuff will be good too, we'll get into good stuff. So I'll speak and then we'll get into the good stuff. <laughs> um, so as we think about our transition to zero emissions in the medium and heavy duty space and in the road ahead, I think transit really is in the forefront, um, as Annalisa said, and we've already 
have so much that we can draw from as we expand uh, zero emission buses and also as, as we think about applying it to other segments. Um, and this is an area that we have active and growing deployments and we have lessons learned that we can incorporate as we go forward. And so in my mind, it really is an area of early success. And um, certainly there have been some bumps and some twists um, to carry forward the, the road pun, um, but also we've shown uh, that it can be done and what can be done. So as I think about our journey ahead, um, two words really come to mind and that's implementation and scale. And these don't always coincide uh, with one another. So in many ways, we're relying on you, the zero emission bus community, um, to help realize the future that we're pursuing. And when it comes to infrastructure, of course, there are concerns. It's the backbone that makes all of this work. Um, and it needs to be affordable, uh, scale, you know, should bring down the capital cost for that, but uh, operations and maintenance is maybe perhaps even a, a bigger piece of, of this picture and one that we need to be working on to bring down costs and, and also ensure reliability. Um, so we're not under any illusion that this is going to be easy. Um, 10 or 20 buses, okay, you know, uh, that's a, a challenge too, but, you know, 2000 buses, it starts to get interesting, right? Um, so today we're here to learn from and with you all, and we're here to try to make your jobs easier. So the state agencies are, are committed to overcoming barriers and working with you to identify and overcome those. And I just wanted to share a quick update and an example here of something that we've been working on and thinking about. So we've heard from several transit agencies that having um, fuel cell electric buses in their, in, in their fleet as part of their solution would really make the best sense for them, but that costs and especially you know, ongoing fuel costs are a serious concern for doing that. Um, and so we have an effort underway to create a statewide procurement contract for hydrogen for transit agencies. Um, and this has been a lot of work in the making up until now, uh, but wanted to share that the formal request has been submitted to Department of General Services and the process is underway to move forward with that contract. So, um, you know, we... Uh, we understand that these types of requests from, you know, from DGS can take about a year to complete. Um, and so we're looking and, and get it out kind of on the streets. And so we're looking at early 2024 when we expect that to be um, in place, but we've hit a pretty big milestone getting this far. So I wanted to share uh, that success. Um, and then I'll just say a couple more things. Uh, all agencies that are here today and, and those that aren't as well, we're committed to success here. And we're really taking an ecosystem approach where we're working together and among each other and, and we can help. So uh, we realize that sometimes the state agencies you know, have overlapping roles or it can be confusing who's doing what, um, but we, we really do talk to each other a lot and you're always welcome to start with GoBiz if you're confused and, and we can help. Um, of course, if you have connections with other agencies, that's a, that's a great inroad too. So with that, I'm looking forward to the day today and interesting pre presentations and some robust conversations. And uh, I'll hand it back over to Annalisa. Thank you. Thanks, Dia. Um, Kyle? All right. Thank you, Annalisa. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Gia, that's great news. Congratulations on that milestone with the uh, the DGS statewide hydrogen procurement uh, contract. I know you've been working very hard on that for for many years. So so great to hear that. So uh, good morning. I'm Kyle Gradinger. I'm the division chief for rail and mass transportation at Caltrans. Um, so my division is rail and mass transit. And so while today's discussion is focused on transit buses, um, it's always hard for me not to start with trains. Uh, I'm a little bit of a fanatic. <laughs> um, and as the owner of passenger rail equipment in California, uh, here at Caltrans, we have set an ambitious goal to convert our inner city passenger rail fleet from diesel to zero emissions operations by 2035. Uh, we have been exploring hydrogen fuel cell and battery electric options, and we're leading multiple R&D efforts uh, for both technologies around the state. In fact, there's currently, uh, as you're probably aware, the San Bernardino County Transportation Authority, it will be receiving the first hydrogen fuel cell train set in North America, uh, should be arriving here um, sometime in 2023 and going into operation hopefully in 2024. That's for the uh, Redlands Rail Extension or the Aero project from uh, in, in the eastern uh, area of Los Angeles. Um, we are also working right now on finalizing a contract for the first interregional, sort of longer distance 
uh, hydrogen fuel cell train in North America. These are um, not locomotive haul, these are lightweight uh, uh, multiple unit vehicles. Um, and there are examples uh, that have been running in revenue service for uh, three or four years now uh, in Europe. And we're working to develop and adapt that technology here for the US. Uh, we're also working with uh, other passenger rail agencies and the freight railroads in California to explore uh, the opportunities for battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell locomotives. Um, obviously, the, the, the calculus there is much different, especially on the freight side. But even when you get to uh, locomotive hauled trains with many, many coaches, um, the, the, the science is going to be a little bit, well, science will be the same, but the calculations will be different uh, than what we're working on right now with these um, smaller train sets. But we're very excited to be bringing this, uh, this, this new technology to North America. Um, we've been working with uh, partners, uh, including CARB, CEC, um, think tanks, universities, uh, rail and other transit agencies around the country for about five years now, um, starting with a, a little brown bag uh, group that we developed in 2017, 2018, uh, and growing it into a rail fleet consortium where we've brought in passenger commuter and intercity rail operators across the country. We have members all the way uh, on the East Coast and via rail in Canada, uh, where we have been working to identify what are the opportunities who can we partner with? How can we get? Uh, uh, how can we put out opportunities that that industry will want to respond to? Uh, and that's been driving a lot of the the work that's now leading to these R and D efforts and the first prototypes arriving uh, onto the actual rail properties. Through this working group, through these working groups, the Rail Fleet Consortium and others, um, we we've discovered we think there are a lot of opportunities across multiple industry sectors. Uh, as we begin our transition away from diesel. Um, you know, the multimodal use opportunities of this charging infrastructure, combining locomotives with on-road EVs, whether that's transit vehicles or Caltrans own heavy, uh, uh, mid medium and heavy duty equipment, um, street sweepers, plows, et cetera, uh, that we think there's a lot of opportunities uh, for, for grid demand balancing. The great thing is that a lot of these vehicles have different duty cycles, different times of day when they're being used. So we think there's a lot of opportunities to make investments in the fueling and charging infrastructure that can potentially uh, even be improved. The utilization can be improved uh, by serving other vehicles and other purposes. On the hydrogen side, we know that, that hydrogen rail is going to require high volume hydrogen procurement, first of all, thank you again, Gia, um, but high volume hydrogen storage and dispensing infrastructure at very high pressures. And hopefully those big investments can be leveraged to achieve economies of scale for, for non-rail users. Um, and then on the battery electric side, rail-centric you know, shared charging hubs, I think, again, are another opportunity to help decarbonize regional multimodal transport and by enabling large-scale vehicle-to-grid balance uh, utilization. So more specific to today's workshop, um, we're also playing a lead role in developing zero emission intercity bus technology. One of our responsibilities is um, to support the intercity bus program, federal uh, 5311F intercity bus program in the state. Uh, and we also support the Amtrak throughway services that connect to the San Joaquin's, the Capitol Corridor and the Pacific Surfliner trains here in California. Um, and those buses, we've, we've realized there's been a great deal of advancement on the local transit bus vehicle side in the last few years, um, but now we need to turn our attention to those longer distance vehicles. And because of the range and the duty cycle requirements needed for long distance intercity bus services, again, we're focusing on hydrogen fuel cell bus technology. Uh, and so on that front, uh, I see Lauren uh, on the call as well uh, from Sunline um, and, and other partners. We have um, flexed some FHWA funds at Caltrans to, uh, to the transit side. Uh, about $27 million that we're going to be working on a project with three transit agencies, uh, Sunline, uh, Lavda, um, CCTA in, in the East Bay, and Shasta uh, Regional Transportation Authority up in Reading, uh, where we're working to develop uh, the inner city fuel cell bus platform, uh, working with manufacturers and constructing hydrogen fueling stations so that we can uh, get those products out on the road and begin testing. And it's just such a great place to be doing that testing out here in California because we have every use case. We have short duty cycles, we have long, long range trips, we have deserts, we have mountains, <laughs> anything you can you do to put a bus through its paces. 
Um, so we're really looking forward to getting that program under under underway uh, with Sunline and our other partners so that we can uh, once again in California lead the way and, and uh, hopefully develop a product and a technology that will work for places all across the US. So uh, with that, I will pass it back to Annalisa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gia and Kyle. Um, that was really helpful. Uh, I think I take away from that that um, Gia made a really great point that um, the state of California government agencies are here to help. And if you are trying to connect with agencies that have programs that support infrastructure uh, and the transition to zero emission vehicles and you don't know where to start, start with GoBiz. Um, and uh, from Kyle, uh, I'm really taking away that you are um, gaining extensive experience with that scaling up um, that we're about to enter into um, with transit and gaining a lot of knowledge uh, about the transfer of um, experience across different vehicle sectors. So really appreciate um, your experience there and um, insights. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it back to Yachen. Thanks a lot, Annalisa. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Yachin Chao and the manager of Zero Emission Truck and the Bus section here at ARB. My team is also tasked with the implementation of the Innovative Clean Transit Regulation. Today, my colleague Leslie Goodbody and I will moderate discussions and also meeting, uh, meeting flow. We also want to make sure that we provide sufficient time for audience comments, questions, and the input. As uh, Annalisa, um, uh, Gia, and Kyle have identified earlier that uh, um, uh, today's goal is really to kind of identify uh, our uh, mutual opportunities, uh, solutions, and the next steps. So we really want to uh, make sure that we uh, monitor time for that purpose. With that, uh, Leslie. We're all multitasking behind the scenes here. <laughs> Hi, Leslie, good body. Um, yeah, I right now I'm planning on kicking off the first track of today, which is uh, our focus and discussion on hydrogen fuel cell buses and the supporting infrastructure needed. And we're gonna be talking about some case studies with some success stories and some places where the challenges exist. And then we'll be, um, closing that up with some guided discussion. So we're hoping to really generate some good discussion for folks to um, chime in and get some fab fabulous feedback from your um, uh, various hydrogen suppliers who are also on the call. Um, so with that, I would like to hand the mic over to Roland Cart Cordero. He's the Director of Maintenance and Vehicle Technology at Foothill Transit. Hi, good morning. Um, next slide, please. Oh, we... Next slide. Hi, good morning. Uh, this morning, I'm gonna talk about our timeline in terms of uh, acquiring the uh, uh, services to uh, develop and construct our uh, hydrogen fueling station, which is being built right now at the uh, at Pomona bus yard. First off, we needed to hire a uh, expert consulting services uh, for the development of our requirements for a hydrogen fueling station. Um, what's listed before you is the uh, list of the major scopes of work for, for the uh, consulting services. Um, we hired uh, uh, CTE for the uh, development of, of the specifications for a fueling station. Uh, the uh, joint use fueling facility was to uh, determine whether uh, we needed to provide a public access uh, fueling station. Part of that was to determine if there's a market within the Pomona uh, area. Unfortunately, that didn't pan out. Uh, grant funding, uh, we um, require the uh, consultant to uh, help us in terms of, of finding uh, funding for sources for our facility and uh, procurement of buses. And this is just not for our current project, for but for uh, further projects in terms of acquiring additional hydrogen fuel cell bus. 
the specifications for the fueling facility um, included analyzing uh, the 33 buses that would be operated on two separate lines, line 486 and line 291. Uh, what are the fuel requirements in terms of those services that we're going to provide? Uh, also developing the fuel cell bus specifications. Part of that was to, uh, uh, we did a testing on two um, uh, OEMs, New Flyer and El Dorado bus. We took those buses out on service uh, in terms of where those buses will be operated. And they provided an analysis of which bus can meet the requirements uh, of those two lines uh, and also analyzing the term in terms of the cost of, of those buses. Uh, developing the project management uh, in terms of the timeline and developing some training programs uh, included in uh, including the uh, uh, requirements for um, in-plan inspection of those buses. Next slide, please. Um, other required procurements. Again, the bus procurement was um, instead of having a CHA bus procurement, we bought our 33 hydrogen fuel cell buses uh, with new flyer through the California Department of General Services. Uh, design, build, and install fueling stations as part of the RFP for a construction company, design, build of a fueling station. Um, you're required to have maintenance facility upgrades. Our current facility does not have the uh, proper uh, ventilation and uh, um, hydrogen sensors uh, in order to allow us to uh, uh, maintain uh, and uh, uh, repair hydrogen fuel cell bus in our facility. We also have a contract for uh, the operations and maintenance of a fuel, fuel cell station. This is a three-year contract with clean energy and also a three-year contract with a provision of, of, of hydrogen. This is a, um, uh, a liquid uh, hydrogen, hydrogen that's being delivered to our facility. Uh, we have a 25,000 gallon tank and the vaporizers are also, uh, will be installed to turn the uh, gas in, uh, to turn the liquid into a gas in order to allow us to fuel our, our buses. Um, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Cliff Thorne. I guess I'll take it from here. I'd like to share OCTA's experience in terms of our station, uh, hydrogen fueling station timeline. Next slide, please. Um, so this kind of gives you an idea, a rough idea of what uh, what we experienced. Uh, it took 30 months to complete the station. Um, the RFP process was is pretty pretty straightforward. Six months. I won't go through each one of those bullets, but um, you, you, every agency has its own um, process. Uh, but we we did give the vendors or the proposers a short timeline to to uh, submit bids. We only gave them two months. Uh, we needed the two months to evaluate the bids. And then, of course, to award a contract. Our station is a liquid hydrogen um, station, um, just like Foothills. It converts the liquid into a gas to go into the buses. Um, as a design build, we needed to provide enough time for the vendor to, to design the station. Um, and that took about eight months. Um, usually six, seven months is a good timeline for um, um, for putting together a scope like that. Now, as we're seeing it, these stations growing in the industry, uh, experience is growing too. So I think that a lot of these designs are, are pretty straightforward now. I've seen Foothill and, and some other agencies that are pursuing hydrogen and they're, they're pretty straightforward. So they're pretty, uh, they shouldn't spend a lot of time designing. Um, really the, the interesting part is in the construction, right? Because every property is unique. You're going to have your own unique set of circumstances. So we, this, our station was delayed by six to seven months, and it was just a combination of several little issues. Um, but some of them were, for instance, you know, getting documents submitted like safety submittals from the vendors. Um, there's a lot of requirements for hydrogen fueling, and again, this is new, although it's similar to something like a CNG station. Um, there are some new things, and even your local fire authority. Uh, may need to look into it a little bit. There's not a lot of hydrogen stations going up. So, um, uh, you know, there was a little bit of uh, delays in the permits. And then there was unforeseen items such as uh, for us, um, as soon as we, we peeled back the concrete, we found that our soil had liquefaction. So uh, some mitigation efforts had to take place in order to 
provide a, a stable foundation for the station. Um, and so every property is unique. I would, you know, I would say to expect some delays um, and um, um, give yourself a little bit of room for that. Next slide, please. And then I'd also like to just share some lessons learned for, for us. I think that, um, um, you know, understanding the permitting process from the very beginning, engaging the fire authority um, early on is a good idea. Uh, we did engage the fire authority early on, and I think that it, it paid dividends later uh, because they were, they were part of the process as we were developing the station. Um, also, understanding the lead time on equipment. Uh, we had one critical piece of equipment that uh, had an 18 month lead time. And so, and, and that was actually a 12 kilovolt uh, switch gear. So we had to find an al alternate source of electricity uh, in order to get the station up and running while that, while that piece of equipment was being procured. The good news is that the, uh, this, this type of, this typical uh, liquid hydrogen fueling station uh, doesn't use very much power uh, in, in Compared to a CNG station, it uses very little power. So we ended up um, connecting the station to an unused um, vehicle bus washer. Uh, so just to give you an idea, it doesn't use very much electricity and it's on our backup generator for the entire property so it can continue to run. But as I understand it, because we're looking at uh, building a second fueling station at another location, um, the lead time on the, on the big tank that you see in the picture there is about 12 months. So I think it's important to understand, you know, what are some of the things that could cause delays and how you can mitigate those uh, ahead of time. Also looking at your electrical demand, you know, in, in this case, of course, we were able to find another circuit, but if your station, if your property is fully um, you know, populated, you're not gonna be able to tap in. So you might wanna understand that ahead of time. And then of course, talking to transit agencies and private companies, doing things I think you might have gone on mute there Roland I mean Cliff oh yeah well you something go. popped up said I went on mute so did I get everything in uh, I you, yeah just continue you only on mute for a little bit okay I, well just to close um, I'm just, you know, talking to other agencies is valuable too. Um, you know, we built our station in, in between 2018 and 2020. Uh, you know, uh, Roland uh, just is, is recently building the station. So learning from some of those recent builds can help you prepare for what kind of lead times or what kind of electrical demands you may, you may uh, uh, encounter. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you very much. All right, um, next up we have Cecil Bandon. Uh, he's the Director of Maintenance from AC Transit and he's gonna share their back-to-back -back fueling experience. Good okay. morning, everyone. Next slide, please. So just to set, uh, you know, what the district has. So back in 2011, um, we built our first hydrogen station in Emeryville. And then in 2014, we built our second station in Oakland. Um, so our 2011 facility and our 2014 facility, those two properties were built identical. Um, they had a fueling capacity of 13 buses and uh, in, a, in a fueling window. So let's say in a 12-hour window, we could do uh, 13 buses. So that's a very small amount of buses if you have a large fleet. Um, so in 2019, um, we did an upgrade to our Emeryville facility um, that cost us about 3.8 million. Um, and that upgrade uh, was consisted of uh, dual cryogenic pumps. Um, originally, we had were compression pumps. Um, so this were the latest and greatest in technology uh, back in 2019 um, to get outfitted. We upgraded our liquid tank uh, to a higher capacity to 15,000 gallons, uh, did some repl replaced vaporizers, and uh, our storage, uh, high pressure storage tanks of 360 kilograms in there. Um, we also outfitted the division with two dispensers. Um, an item there with, with the dispensers to note is that back when we built our station in 2011, um, our dispensers used to be separated. They were not in line with our, our current uh, diesel dispensers. So over those years that uh, we learned were, were 
were valuable to us because we were able to uh, see that the, that the fueling process uh, could go in line with our diesel processes and not slow down our service island work that takes place in the nighttime. So with this upgrade, one of the things that uh, we did was uh, we learned very valuable things. We go to the next slide, please. So what did we find out when we did this upgrade for $3.8 million? So we found out that we were able to increase our capacity from that 13 buses that I mentioned to now 65 buses uh, for the station. And our fueling window uh, still remain in that six to eight minutes. Um, you know, the biggest lesson learned is that one cry liquid cryogenic pump can continuously support one dispenser. So what does that mean? So in our testing, one cryogenic pump was on directly to one dispenser, and we were able to continuously fill 65 buses nonstop. So we didn't have to worry about buffer tanks. We didn't have to worry about anything with the system. It was almost basically just a con continuous holding the nozzle down, and you could continue to fill 65 buses back to back. So that was very, that was a huge milestone for us because we went from 13 buses to 65 buses. Um, so one of the things as uh, Cliff and some of the other presenters have noted, this is the technology that's being used in all the new stations that's being, um, that are being built. Um, so the successes that Cliff had mentioned uh, you know, early on are what are being uh, expanded to in other, in other uh, build outs that are being completed. The other thing that we learned is also the availability and reliability of our, of our station became changed dramatically. Our older uh, compression pumps required, they were maintenance extensive and, um, and they had a lot of downtime and maintenance that just needed to be done. So we had built in resiliency, right? We had more than one compression, one compression pump so that when it went down, we had a backup to do that. We also implemented that with our current system. As I mentioned, there's two dual, dual cryogenic pumps, but we only use one at a time. The other one serves as a backup for our system. So I just want to hit to make sure that you build your resiliency in any stations that you built. Um, so that way, when if something does break, um, then you have a backup plan to make to be able to service your vehicle. So this technology um, for us has been very successful and we continue to deploy. And as we build our next station that we're going to be upgrading uh, uh, Oakland, um, we'll even be just that much step uh, better with the newest technology that we're going to be putting in there. So our newest one for Oakland, um, we're going to be outfitting it for 150 buses, and that'll leave that division ready for the future uh, expansion. So we just have to replace buses and no longer have to do any further upgrades. Thank you. Okay, so the next case study we have is um, about hydrogen cost and supply. One veteran Lauren Skyver and one newcomer are gonna share their experience. Take it away, Lauren. Thanks, Leslie. And thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about cost and some of the drivers of cost. My colleagues have pointed out a lot of really rich details for you to take into consideration. I can't hammer enough about uh, uh, power cost and planning, facility man, uh, maintenance plans, things like that, which Cliff went into a lot of detail on. So I hope you're taking notes of all of these things to put them together for your successful project. Next slide. So the bottom line for transport, um, we believe hydrogen is definitely going to be and is a part of that dialogue. Um, we see hydrogen, um, as you're hearing about today, Many of the transit systems in California are looking at hydrogen as a uh, complement to their uh, propulsion system offerings for their vehicles. And we do know that there's going to be a lot of movement in heavy duty transport. So if you think of light duty and medium duty as being battery electric, we believe class six to class eight um, will definitely be hydrogen in the future, not just in California, but across the country. Next slide. So I talk a lot about puzzles and one of the things I wanna point out, and you have heard this from some of my colleagues about the cost puzzle is just like charging, just like battery electric, um, there are some factors into cost. Um, obviously that's electricity cost. Um, if you're doing electrolytic hydrogen, it's water. Um, maintenance agreements. So if you wanna be an owner operator of a station or you wanna work with one of the many amazing partners that some of which are on this call, about creating a station, 
um, looking at those long-term costs for those O&M and other agreements that you'll need in order to keep that station up and running are an important part of looking at overall cost. And then one factor that a lot of people don't think about with hydrogen that has been Sunline's experience is production amount does matter in the overall cost of the molecule. So I, what I mean by that is, is when Sunline was producing a small amount, like 300 kilograms, our overall product was more expensive than as we see when we're scaling up into larger amounts of hydrogen, both dispensed and used. And so that's just an important factor to think about when you're thinking about your cost today and what your cost can be in the future, um, along with all of what you're going to hear about today that's happening on production. Gia just gave us great news about what's happening on the state level. So I do believe hydrogen costs are going to come down significantly. And the, the time it takes to have a project going is, you know, in the future from today for most of you. And so there's a lot of relief coming to the overall cost for this fuel type. Next slide. So one of the things I like to talk about is where are these opportunities for cost containment? And I've kind of gone over them briefly, but um, at Sunline, you know, we say to folks all the time, if you've come to our property or heard me speak, you know, if you've seen one transit agency, you've seen one transit agency. And so all of the things that all of us may be doing as speakers today may not be what you can do as an entire envelope, but you can think of parts and pieces of what we're doing and what could work for your operating environment, your yards, your, your employees, and your customers. Um, we are driving a microgrid. Right now, we have a portion of our electrolytic hydrogen being produced on solar power. I'm out here where the sun shines. Well, not this winter, but almost 362 days a year. Um, and so we will be driving our electrolytic hydrogen production on a microgrid. Um, one thing I want to stop and say is, like Brussels sprouts, Sunline has hydrogen three ways in the future. Uh, we not only electrolyze and produce hydrogen through electrolysis, we have an SMR, steam methane reforming project we're doing with SoCal Gas and uh, Silver Stars. And then we are going to be and have gone out to bid for a liquid station, which will be our resiliency piece, meaning that we'll be able to fuel hydrogen fuel cell electric buses, even in a power outage, um, because a, li a liquid station can really be managed with generator power. So. We've got, we're, we're looking at all of the feedstocks in hydrogen at our property, which again, will give other transit agencies an opportunity to see what works best for you. So a microgrid is possible for us. We have property around us and the ability to capture the sun. Um, one thing I would say in liquid delivery or any other kind of um, hydrogen is looking at long-term agreements. I mentioned O&M cost, making sure that you understand whether you're going to be an owner operator, you're going to have your own staff that understands the technology, or whether you're going to work with a partner to do that. And there is no path that is better, or it's, it's really a fit for your own organization. What is the culture of your organization when it comes to something like a hydrogen pro, uh, uh, project? What, what, are, what is the appetite of your board, your employees, and your customers on being an owner operator? Is it a better relationship to have a O&M or another provider come in and build a station and, and operate and maintain it for you? Um, we think that another opportunity, and we heard Gia talk about this, Kyle is talking about this, so this is a great time in the state of California. Um, on legislation to control utility costs for hydrogen production and making the molecules available. Um, I think that another thing that is real opportunity is the continuation of subsidies and the ability and incentives for us to move to hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. I think just the delta between battery electric um, and fuel cell electric vehicles and HFIP is one of those examples of how this can help with the adoption and the containment of costs. And then the further commercialization, you're going to hear from some of the folks that are actually building these systems, operating and maintaining them. And the more commercialization we have and adoption there, the cheaper the prices will get. That's just the way everything works, right? Next slide. Um, one of the things that you know I, I mentioned before about costing metrics is the more we use the cheaper the molecule becomes. And that may be counterintuitive, but it's certainly been Sunline's um, uh, 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 experience in 
um, utilizing hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. The other is really understanding electricity cost. It's crucial. Um, as good as we are, when we first put our electrolyzer in, we made a mistake on our bill. We made a mistake turning it on and, and incurring demand charges on that entire month's bill. And it was significant. Um, we haven't done it again, but we want to tell everyone else that being an energy manager, whether it's battery electric or fuel cell, having a wing, a arm, a person in your organization that is really understanding energy management is going to be the new paradigm for us as transit operators. And I don't say that with negativity. It's actually exciting for our staff to understand energy, to understand how we need to flip the switch in order to reduce our cost and ensure that we aren't making a mistake on timing. Um, I always talk about, and many of you heard me talk before about the fuel economy. I think that Cliff's experience with fuel economy is also better than CNG. So that figures into the cost. Um, we are all that are all of us that are running compressed natural gas now understand that there is a wave of increase coming our way. We're already seeing it. And so thinking about the cost of future CNG operations and, and hydrogen have become closer as far as cost for GGE. Um, and then range and reliability are key for Sunline. Um, we just put our fuel cell buses out as if they were a CNG bus and our electric buses take a little more time um, in consideration of the work that they're doing each day. Next slide. So I just, I want you guys to know that, you know, there are plenty of people and you're hearing from so many today that are here to help, that have already paved the way. I, that's why a big thank you to CARB to continue to bring us together. You have a brain trust all across California and many outside of California that are moving to zero emission. And so utilize this brain trust, this kitchen cabinet that's being built for you because that's what we do in transit. It's one of the huge benefits of working in transit is that we're very open to share, open to share our mistakes and our successes. And Sunline stands ready to do the same. Leslie, back to you. Thanks, Lauren. Jeez, I was just about to say something <laughs> like that. But so in, in closing with Lauren and um, Cecil, especially, I want a big shout out and a thanks to your transit agencies for helping to advance fuel cell bus technology to the place it is today in the United States and internationally. I, yeah, it's, yeah. Thank you so much because I, I really think it's ready for prime time. So our final speaker is um, Jerome Corsi. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, he's a transit planner at uh, Humboldt Transit Authority. And they, uh, last year they received a TIRCP grant to build a um, hydrogen station and purchase 11 fuel cell buses. Hum Humboldt Transit is a leading, leading the far North County's collaboration on ZEB deployment. And we wish Humboldt Transit the best and we wanna know what will make them successful. Take it away, Jerome. Thank you, Leslie. Um, so uh, next slide, I just have a single slide but was just gonna talk um, more about the context of what we're looking at here. Uh, so we're, as you stated, we're newcomers to the hydrogen world, uh, thanks to the excellent work that uh, Lauren and Cecil and others have have done in paving the way for hydrogen. Um, we've had the confidence and the clarity to know that this is the direction we need to go. Uh, but there is a lot of uncertainty that we still face, um, and I think that you know uh, is. Uh, in our board faces. Um, and I think this graph kind of demonstrates um, uh, what, you know, the primary concern on our end is regarding uh, increases to our operational costs. And um, we, you know, we've worked with bus manufacturers and we've worked with AC Transit and others and, and proven that this technology is going to work for us. We're excited, uh, but it's requiring a leap of faith. And um, and that leap of faith is around uh, what, you know, how are we going to cover these potential costs? And really, so what I'm showing here is on the left, uh, you're, I'm showing pretty extreme cases, uh, but to demonstrate, um, you know, uh, reasonable uh, conversations we're having with industry uh, partners, 
around what our potential costs could be around that key factor that Lauren mentioned, which, which has to do with our consumption, our volume, our daily consumption. And early on what we're looking at, uh, there are a lot of concerns around the, the ultimate cost per kilogram. And, uh, and it really is requiring a leap of faith to, um, to know that the state and other agencies are behind us and that we'll, we'll figure this out and we'll move forward. Um, but it does require a board that is willing to do this. Um, and, uh, you know, and also this accounts for our particular unique condition where we're quite remote. Our delivery distances uh, for liquid hydrogen are, are, are quite far. Uh, we have very particular resiliency needs. We're very isolated. Um, and, uh, and we also are very space constrained. The location of our facility is, uh, it, it, we're, we, we have very little room to grow. I'd say no room to, to grow at this point. Um, and so all of these factors lead into our decision to, to go with liquid hydrogen. Um, as Lauren pointed out, I think it's a great resiliency uh, decision, particularly in that it can be run on a backup generator fairly easily. Um, uh, but it presents challenges around uh, delivery and um, and also a concern around we'd be the only station within uh, I think around 200 miles. Um, so you know backup, uh, as Cecil had mentioned, is going to be really critical. Um, and so you know with with all of that context, Humboldt is really excited to demonstrate. Uh, how we can use transit to kickstart a hydrogen supply chain here on the North Coast and look forward to working with everyone. Back to you, Leslie. AC transit. Okay, so um, I'm sorry, I was looking around here. Uh, we're gonna learn now from um, Cecil. Cecil Blandon uh, is our next presenter and he will be talking about um, AC Transit Station. Okay, next slide. Thank you, Leslie. Next slide. So I have one quick slide here and, and really, um, you know, We've been running hydrogen since 2003 in different phases. Um, as I mentioned, we have two stations that we have been operating since uh, 2011. Um, and, you know, and what does that mean for us when it comes to all the challenges as an agency that we need to deploy buses, get, get the service, you know, and the number one priority is putting the service out for our riders, right? Um, that's every agency's number one concern. So what I highlighted here are some of the risks that um, that exist, whether in, in whether you have a, you know, a, in, in any scenario, whether it's a, whatever type of fuel you run, whether it's electric, diesel, or hydrogen. Um, so for us, you know, one of the things here being in Northern California, we have the PG&E power shutoffs. Um, I do have a facility that is in that, that vicinity and does encounter these scenarios. Um, and so you know, that, that's an item that we, we have to take seriously as, you know, what we are going to do with that facility and what type of technology would deploy. Uh, road incidents, you know, they happen all the time. You have a vehicle that may take out a transformer, takes out a light pole, and you create an issue where now you have no power to your, to your division. And that can be create an uncertainty of a length of time that is unknown, you know. Um, and then also state emergencies, you know, uh, here in the Bay Area, in the Bay Area, you know, earthquakes happen, you know, and um, and be, besides, amongst other items, you know, that may take place, and we need to get that vehicle out on the road, provide maybe some sort of emergency uh, in there, and how is that going to be? Of how is that vehicle going to perform? And I and I'm gonna go back to look at, you know, we are used to our diesel buses, or if you're um, a CNG user, natural gas user, then, you know, what you've been operating for the last 10 years, what you're accustomed and being able to turn around the vehicle, perform everything that you need to do. And I highlight those three items as far as the, the risks uh, related to, um, to any other fleet, because hydrogen in, a, in, a, in, a, in the scenarios that I mentioned there doesn't change. 
Um, the process doesn't change to what we know in, in, a, in a diesel platform. So my fleet is primarily diesel. Um, I don't have any natural gas, but in that same scenario, if I have, we have a PG&E power shutoff, as mentioned earlier by one of the speakers, they said, you know, hey, diesel generate, uh, a generator comes on and powers your station. So the, the energy that's required by the hydrogen station is, is minimal. So it runs on my bus system, on my, my backup system, and I can power my, my station and be able to continue with the service that's required. Um, so if I lose the grid, um, then I have no problem. The other item is state emergency. If I have to put vehicles out on the road for an emergency, I can bring my vehicle in in six to eight minutes, fuel that vehicle and put it back on the road for another 300 miles if I have to. So, you know, as, a, as an item that all our transit agencies, we serve as emergency providers for our different jurisdictions, it's important that we also understand how, how that uh, need may change or how you would be able to collaborate with those other um, that, that jurisdiction or that jurisdictional support that you may have to do in case of a state emergency. So the hydrogen aspect here helps with that because I don't, I don't have to deal with wait, waiting for a time frame for a vehicle to charge. I can continue with my current processes that we have established on how we are going to operate in case of an emergency. And then the other item here, I just noticed that, you know, as we look at new, new vendors are coming out with a lot of newer technology uh, for like microgrid applications, you know, we're exploring how we can uh, use our hydrogen to create our own energy on site so that we can power and, and have create our own little microgrids in this, in this aspect to, to build our, our own resiliency from the grid. Uh, that's all, Leslie, thank you. Can we show the next slide? Thanks. So next we're gonna, so we're on the subject of infrastructure resiliency. And so next we're gonna have a cliff Thorne from Orange County, Okta, talk about um, uh, hydrogen and resiliency. Thank you, Leslie. So when, so when people ask me what keeps you up at night, Cliff, when it comes to uh, hydrogen or fuel cell technology, to me, it's infrastructure resiliency. Um, right now, we have uh, 10 fuel cell electric buses, and the station does go down from time to time, usually because of a power outage or powder, power surge. Now we have a 100% CNG fleet, and as as uh, Cecil uh, mentioned, um, we have experience with that. Our vendor has experience with that. If the station goes down, it when the power comes back on, the station just doesn't resume, right? Somebody needs to um, trigger some switches and things to get it back to in, into its operational status. So the CNG station is very quick, get it right back up. The fuel cell is still. Uh, you know, I would say that our, our vendor is still learning how to bring that station up or, or the response time isn't as great. So if 10 buses don't get fueled, um, they get parked, right? And they don't go out for service. And we can absorb that. That's only maybe 2% of our fleet. Um, however, if I expand to 50 buses, 100 buses, um, now I can't have 50 or 100 buses sitting, um, not going into service because the station went down. Um, now, I want to be clear, though, that our, that our, our fuel, hydrogen fuel station is at, performing just as well as our CNG. In fact, it is completely at parity. They're both uh, operating very well. Um, but when the CNG station goes down, I could send buses to three other locations to get fuel. Currently, the hydrogen fuel station, um, when it goes down, I have no backup. Sure, I could bring it back up on, on uh, our backup power. Um, but someone needs to come out and reset things. And sometimes that process um, can take some time. That's our experience right now. I'm sure that'll improve, um, but I have no backup station. And so um, as part of our plan to expand our fleet, because we're purchasing, we're pursuing another 40 uh, fuel cell buses, it's important for me to have a second fueling station. So now I have a backup and that second fuel fueling station needs to have the same capacity as the first one to do the entire uh, bus of 50 fleet. So uh, with that, um, I think it's important to understand uh, if there's maybe areas nearby that, that you can get fuel from. 
and also that your bus is configured to use other stations. Um, you know, we had a situation with Foothill Transit, their buses arrived early and they, they wanted to come fuel them at our station and our conf bus configuration was different and I felt so bad I could not provide fuel for them uh, and they had to use an alternative uh, solution. Um, but that's important to know because uh, not all fuel stations are the same. Light duty stations are, are not, sometimes are not the same or they won't allow you to come. Um, during the, the construction of our, of our, uh, of our fuel, fuel station, um, the buses arrived before the station was built and we had to use some light duty stations. Well, we found out very quickly that the light duty stations don't like buses coming to their stations and taking all their fuel. So it was very difficult to find a backup station. Um, and so that's something that we're always thinking about going forward. And as and I just want to uh, reiterate what Cecil said that, you know, if I have um, uh, if I have 50 battery electric buses and no energy, um, they're not going out. But with the fuel station, it does take very little energy to run it as long as you can get somebody to start it back up. And you're back in business, uh, even if you have to do uh, mid midday fueling. And then just one final note, and this is going back to what Lauren said early, earlier about um, steam SMR uh, on-site production. Um, that is something we're also uh, exploring because if I could if I could fuel if I could produce fuel any time of the day, then I'm not I'm not stuck with my 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. window. Uh, so I can have fuel ready to go at the start of that shift. Um, so with that, thank you. And back to you, Leslie. Oh, thank you so much, Cliff. And I think what you, are, you and others are highlighting is the need not only for resiliency, but redundancy. And that's what we're all kind of hoping that scale will bring, that more as more and more come into line. And I just want to tee up also another thing that you're, you've brought up that I think is super important is the ability for the different station technologies to be able to communicate productively with the buses because fast fills, high, high pressure fills um, occur best when there's, when there's really good communication between the bus and the state, uh, the dispensers in the station. I realized that was sort of a, might've been also an issue. So this is something that, you know, for our hydrogen providers, um, our station, our dispenser manufacturers, how important it is going to have to have some consistency um, with that communication. So Lauren, I'm going to pass it back on over to you so you can talk about some of your, uh, about resiliency as well. Well, thank you, um, Leslie. And, you know, I've kind of talked about some of our plans for resiliency um, in the liquid station. Um, I think that on another note of resiliency, and again, not something that everyone can do, but you know, you've heard us talk about the molecule and the more molecules, um, sort of the better economy of scale you get. And so one of the things we're thinking about in our hydrogen program, which this has afforded us the ability to do is think about resiliency in a monetary way and how having a liquid station on board to fuel our vehicles not only you know protects the fueling capability as you heard cliff say um in, in some kind of emergency but also allows us to have molecules for sale and to create a revenue stream from that um you guys may know that we've been selling fuel for a long time this isn't our first time um working in the realm of, of selling fuel um but i think that understanding how what you may be doing not just for your own organization but in a community in the areas around you and how your program helps the state's goals in achieving zero emission and proliferates um, potentially hydrogen for other users is an important part of your thinking process and it may not work for you but i want to encourage you to put that in your matrix of decisions to make on whether there is a way for uh, public consumption of your product or a way for you to produce or have available for the public or the motoring public part of what your um, fuel stock is for your own vehicles. Um, I think on the resiliency side, um, one of the we things that we don't talk about a lot in resiliency, um, you're hearing about what we're doing in projects, which is 
a liquid station to protect our volume that we produce, but it's also resiliency as an agency and your human capital and your staff, your team, um, making sure that you're investing in their knowledge of what you are doing, not just from a safety standpoint, but just from understanding the technology. You'd be surprised how many people on your own team who would love the opportunity to be a part of what you're doing in zero mission and the zero mission decisions that you're making. And I think that a lot of times transit, we kind of get compartmentalized in making these decisions. So I put this company-wide push being part of your resiliency plan. Um, ensuring that everyone in your organization is a part of where you're moving to and why, and understand that even if they don't have a decision point to make for the decisions that the agency is making, that you brought them along with these decisions that you're making for your organization. It really does make a difference in your deployments when the entire team feels a part of that deployment. Um, I think resiliency is also about knowledge. Um, if you're going to, whether you, whatever propulsion system you're going to move to, you will build resiliency within your organization if you have knowledge of the products that you are going to deploy um, and that you have made a conscious decision as an organization for those products. And so I think that um, resiliency is a lot of things. Um, we don't have a lot of resiliency for the propulsion systems we run today. And we're very concerned about resiliency for the ones that we're running tomorrow. And I think we just need to look at our history. We have the formula for this. We've been doing transit and public transit has been available for hundreds of years, right? There's a reason why we do this. We have an ab amazing ability to find resiliency within our own organizations and unleash that. And I just don't want you to forget the history of all the amazing things your organization has already done get paralyzed in the decisions about what you're going to do forward and then leave people behind along the way. So that that's probably not scripted from CARB's point of view on resiliency, but that is what I think is real resiliency and real success story that I can share with Sunline that I didn't create. The agency has created over these many years of doing zero mission projects. Leslie, back to you. I love hearing Lauren talk <laughs> because I, I, I do think you literally did capture the whole picture. Um, and that's also the, um, you know, just how wonderful our, our folks are in the transit agencies, um, especially our pioneers in both in all, all facets of whether it's uh, battery electric or hydrogen of sharing your experience with others. So we really appreciate all of that. I'm trying to find my speaking notes here. So we're going to move on to the um, uh, discussion topics for the hydrogen tracks. I want all of the folks who have presented here, and then also maybe uh, some of our hydrogen providers and our so hydrogen fuel producers, those who deliver fuel to the sites, as well as those who um, help to manufacture stations. All of our panelists that we invited in the hydrogen space to maybe just turn your camera on. Um, and I wanna start with our, the topic uh, that, that Jerome uh, from Humboldt so eloquently stated, it's a leap of faith. Um, I often speak about, boy, once we have scale guys, once we're producing hydrogen throughout the state, with low carbon intensity, they can take advantage of LCFS credits and the IRA credits, boy, we're really gonna be in business. But we, but we know, that we're not there yet. We've got to get there. Um, but at the same time, that leap of faith, I think our transit agencies really are looking for certainty in what they're going to be paying for that delivered hydrogen, because that's really where the rubber meets the road. That's the bottom line here. Um, so I was hoping, you know, and I, this is going to be a conversation really between transit agencies and hydrogen providers of like, what can we expect for low carbon intensity hydrogen supply and price in the coming years? You know, where is this going? Um, so with that, uh, we'll take raised hands. Um, if somebody from a transition wants to elaborate on that, 
question. We have some participants raising hand already. I'm gonna have to just, um, yeah, roll in. Uh, yes, uh, I don't know if everybody's familiar. Uh, State of California has the ARCHES program, which is the Alliance for Renewable Clean Hydrogen and Energy Systems. Um, what that is, is they're trying to develop a, a hydrogen hub. Um, they're applying for, there's a $1.25 billion that's available through the federal government, the Department of Energy, uh, to help expand the, the manufacture uh, of, of hydrogen at a low price, expand the use of hydrogen in terms of not just in public transit, but in industry as well, and, and, and low vehicles. So, um, we're working with uh, CTE in terms of, of applying for part of the uh, application for the ARCHES program, which is due on April, April 7, I think. And the plan is to create a hydrogen hub for the state of California. So that's one of the, uh, one of the uh, opportunities for, for transit, not just for transit, but commercial application in terms of acquiring a low cost, uh, hopefully green, uh, hydrogen uh, provision for 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 all all of our use. That's a great. Thank you so much, um, David. You have your hand up. I do. Uh, so my name is Dave Edwards. I work for Air Liquide, a hydrogen provider into this market and historically into the industrial markets and other markets around the world. Um, when I when I think about this kind of question on carbon intensity and price, of course they're they're closely related, but they're also very much driven by policy. And, and now very much driven by the size of the markets. Um, I tend to think about, about this in sort of three generations. The first generation of hydrogen brought to, as a transportation fuel was really leveraging the existing infrastructure, that industrial infrastructure for hydrogen supply, mostly based on fossil-based, and in some cases using things like renewable natural gas to displace some of that. Um, the second generation is, I think, the, the hydrogen production facilities that are coming online right now, very much driven by California policy, very much driven by hydrogen as a transportation fuel, and aiming for things like maximizing LCFS credits and therefore minimizing carbon intensity, aiming for a, a zero CI because it allows for HRI credits and light duty, things along those lines, very policy driven. Um, but the price is still, as, as you've seen, uh, has, isn't reflective of where we need to be. And that'll come with the next generation of investments as we think about things like the IRA bringing uh, very broad, not just transportation fuels, but very broad hydrogen production capabilities and, and, and usages um, in line. And a price that's going to, that's probably going to bring diesel parity. I know for most of the, the, the significantly sized projects that we've looked at and we've looked at with other partners, that price parity for diesel is really a necessary step for the next generation of investments. So as you think about the hubs coming online, the production from current uh, program plans coming online, and this is probably two and three years away, those are the kind of targets that, that these projects are aiming for. So I think we will see in the next generation of supply, not only the low carbon we've been able to get to um, recently, but also the lower price, at least down to diesel parity, and, and eventually there, of course, is no significant tie between diesel price and, and hydrogen price. So if we can continue to lower our costs of capital and, and have access to low cost energy, we decouple from diesel altogether. That just becomes our target for, for broader market adoption, for example. Thank you. Let me just interject a little. Do you guys, and let's just add this into your response, foresee the, um, this price parity coming in, in the near term on a liquid delivery front? Yeah, price parity has to be at the point of dispense at the station, whether that's a light duty station, a heavy duty station or a transit. What's gonna drive that to a large degree though is the overall size of the market. And the heavy duty market is probably the gating parameter for, for that uh, massive influx of flow into the markets. But, but yes, it's, at the, it's gotta be at the station. That's the only place where diesel parity um, is a measurable um, differentiator. Do we have anybody else um, who'd like, oh, Jamaica from California Energy Commission. Hi, thanks, Leslie. I do have a question um, about scaling hydrogen as in terms of investment, because obviously that requires a heavy amount of incentivization. And uh, sorry, you know what I mean? Um, but do, do we see that being better spent towards large 
projects or dispersed and smaller projects throughout the state? And this subject for today, <laughs> that's a really good question. And I feel like it's a political landmine that I don't really want to step on. <laughs> Oh, how, sorry, wasn't how, trying to set you up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because there are arguments for both, but um, uh, it, for this conversation, uh, you know, transit agencies are public agencies. Um, you know, every their their revenue source, you know, from the fare box is minimal, um, and they rely on obviously on federal dollars as well. So. Um, I do think that attention to helping to support the capital, the capex of hydrogen station builds is important, as well as the um, need to support hydrogen production. Because as, at CARB, we really do believe that a rising tide lifts all boats. So if we're talking about scaled production of hydrogen, those molecules can be put in any vehicle. So. But we do know that with scale, we will be able to lower that price to the, at the pump for the light duty market. And um, that's gonna be the thing that needs to happen to really help develop and build out the light duty fuel cell vehicle market. But uh, someone else had their hand raised. Stacy, oh, who was first? Uh, go ahead, Stacy. <laughs> Right. Um, I, Leslie, I just wanted to add, you know, maybe a little bit of um, granularity to what Dave was talking about when he was talking about, uh, you know, large scale production and how it relates to price and where we're at today. You know, I, I know that right now, um, you know, everybody's looking to, you know, they want low CI, they want the price not only to come down, but they want something a little bit, you know, lower, more predictable so that they can, you know, predict the cost for their fleets. And know what's coming. So today, you know, our production is mostly gray hydrogen. Um, obviously, new production is expected to be clean hydrogen. Hydrogen, sorry, from uh, renewable and low carbon resources. Now, when it when it comes to price, um, it's driven by a number of factors. You know, certainly including you know your volume, your distribution, your your cost of capital for that new production, available incentives that we just touched on. But I think something that um, you know, we need to consider is that utility cost and feedstock that goes into the production today. Because we know that there are certain things that we need to do today to bridge that gap to get us to that sustainable future. And so you know, if there are ways that we can control some of the volatility uh, you know, as it relates to utilities and feedstocks, that would help, I know, the industry uh, tremendously with our production cost and to kind of levelize what we're able to offer to the marketplace and that stable pricing that you're looking for. Thank you, Stacy. Way to tee up the what can our state regulators do for you conversation. <laughs> we'll yeah, we'll have that one. Day. Oh, I just throw one out. <laughs> um, Cliff? Uh, just a quick comment based on what um, um, David, uh, David said. Um, when we look at price parity, um, I think it's important to understand what it is at the nozzle, when it's being dispensed. One of the things that was challenging for us is comparing our CNG costs to our hydrogen costs because hydrogen we pay for as dispensed and uh, with CNG it's dispensed, with hydrogen it's delivered. And I think many of you know that operate uh, hydrogen, there's a loss between the amount that's delivered and the amount that's dispensed. So there, there's kind of a loss there. Uh, so if there's a way to reach price parity at dispensed at the nozzle uh, would be beneficial. Yeah, good point. Leslie, well, can uh, I just, um, you know me, I mean, I always have something to say about everything and sometimes I shouldn't, but I'm going to in this particular case. Um, I get concerned about talking about pathways and renewableness and green and colors of hydrogen. Uh, we're not concerned about that when it comes to the grid and charging. We're not concerned about the fact that the grid is 33% or maybe renewable. And so I think that one of the things that both manufacturers and policymakers have to keep in mind is that if these pathways are too restrictive, it will hamper 
the market and the development of hydrogen alternatives and hydrogen deployment. And I think we spend a lot of time talking about obviously things that are super important like CI score and, and clean air and the goals of the state for clean air goals. As a transit agency, I can say this though, we also have to understand the playing field we have in front of us. And how will we get there with what's available and not concentrate so much on the color scheme today, but really what's available, what's possible, and how can we get to some of those goals in the future? Because price is gonna be important and skipping all the way to completely renewable sources may be hard to do with the price and the consumption that we're gonna need. And so hopefully that's not too provocative for this group, but it's my wish list for the state of California when we think about what are gonna be those pathways. And that's just not CARB, that's the state in a whole on how we're gonna make those pathways possible. Point well taken, Lauren. It's gonna be always something that we're gonna be looking at. It's always in the radar. Um, and it's also something that, you know, we have people are focusing on CARB, laser focusing on CARB when it comes to hydrogen production pathways. So we're, we have a delicate, uh, delicate balancing act here, but you know that. Um, Yao Chen. Yes, uh, thanks, Leslie. And uh, uh, I do want to clarify a few things um, when it comes to hydrogen and also zero emission technologies. So if we look at the entire state's emissions, 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions comes from mobile source tailpipe emissions. If we can control the tailpipe emissions, we can control that uh, um, 40%. And the 10% comes from refineries. So if we can control the fuel supply, we control that 10%. And the first state policy, we understand that very often, the fuel supply and also vehicle technologies, their development may not be fully aligned, but doesn't mean that one should wait for the other uh, to move forward. So it is very important that we don't forget about the 40% while we are working on the 10%. Also statewide, we have two major regulations the low carbon fuel standard regulation and the cap and trade regulation that to, uh, will um, regulate uh, the uh, carbon intensity of all the transportation fuels and uh, also uh, their uh, products um, uh, efficiency. So uh, it is a, I think it is very important that uh, fleet operators, you leave the fuel carbon intensity to the state to operate. And the hydrogen is going to become uh, a, a mandatory fuel under LCFS pretty soon uh, when um, a threshold is reached. So um, uh, it is just also important that as Gia mentioned early on that the state is uh, trying to put out a low carbon intensity uh, hydrogen procurement project. It is also important for fleets to um, to choose a, a fuel pathway that's under LCFS. Uh, when adjusted by a EER, you make sure that you also have uh, something there that you can deploy that's beneficial to both the tailpipe emissions and uh, also um, the fuel part of uh, the upstream emissions. Um, that is one thing and also, um, Secondly, when we are talking about uh, uh, criteria pollutants and those are air toxics emissions, mobile source vehicles account for 80%, 80% of statewide emissions. So controlling tailpipe emissions is something that we cannot wait. I just want to kind of emphasize this. And back to you, Leslie. Thank you so much, Yao Chen. Um, Stacy, you still have your hand up. Okay. If you wanted to chime in, let me know. Um, I'm thinking that we should move on to the next question because um, I really wanted to make sure we uh, cover this, uh, the, the rural piece of it. How is a rural station different from an urban station in terms of fuel cost, maintenance, support, fuel delivery frequency? 
Um, does anybody want to chime in? Allison, I see your hand up. Hi, thanks, Leslie. Yeah, so we've done a lot of, of work uh, at Air Products looking at how we how we go after our, our rural um, partners as well and, and help to provide a solution for them. I think the good news is on the liquid hydrogen, the distribution efficiencies are, are really great. So hydrogen travels long distances today and, and can continue to do that kind of cost effectively. But if you're looking at a uh, an area of the state that's not very well covered by hydrogen yet, um, you should think about things in terms of your resiliency, uh, maybe having more storage than you would have if you were closer to a, a source plant. Uh, there's a question around maintenance support, right? We might wanna do more training with the local staff at the agency to make sure that they can be a primary response to certain alarms and the like. So. We really can work together with the partners to come up with a solution. But what we've seen is your, your cost point, your total cost, it really doesn't vary that much uh, from, you know, coast Parity to coast. with diesel, you mean? No, with uh, a hydrogen supply in Orange County versus a hydrogen supply in Humboldt. Right? Oh, okay. So right. Really not that much different. Okay. Rick. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm making a note to self. Don't have a yellow background on. This <laughs> is the second time this has happened to me in two weeks. Uh, and, and no worries about that, Leslie. So for real quickly, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Rick Ramos here. I'm uh, with CalAct today, wearing my CalAct hat. And CalAct is a statewide association of over 300 Tend to, tend to be smaller transit operators, although uh, AC Transit and Okta are both members as well. And uh, I want to just broadly just make a point here off of something that is going on that's exciting uh, that GoBiz announced today and then tie it to what Allison just said, ironically. And that is the procurement, a joint procurement of hydrogen, I think could be quite helpful for the smaller, more rural uh, agencies like Humboldt, provided there's a couple of things I think we need to be keeping our, our eye on. And one is... The, the process has to be smooth and timely and and consistent and I know that when the state procures things they'll have to they'll have to go on another procurement and yet another procurement there won't be just a steady stream of hydrogen that will result from that first procurement that will last 10 15 20 years down the road while the infrastructure I think in my opinion slowly builds up across not only the state but the country as as we evolve into where we're going. Uh, and I think I think one of the things that would concern me um, is, and I'm sure uh, folks like Jerome is, is this is an area where I think the state can use our desire to move in this direction with our fuels to modernize the government structure. And this is not the responsibility of anybody here, but I'm hoping people will hear this and kind of, as you have conversations with your colleagues moving forward, this becomes a thing that gets discussed and bubbles up to somebody who might have responsibility for attacking this. And that is um, <clears throat> the state, when it procures things vis-a-vis -vis transit, often takes a very long time. And it can it can trap the transit provider into a, into a no man's land for a while while they're waiting for the state to finish their thing, but they need the thing now, whatever that thing may be. And this can happen with transit buses. This can happen with all kinds of things. And so... I think as the state endeavors to help the smaller operators, and I think that this GoBiz proposal is one way of doing it, it's an opportunity to look at how the state procures things so it can be done in a more timely, efficient manner. And so that the uh, operators who will take advantage of that opportunity can do so in a way that's timely and efficient vis-a-vis -vis their projects. And and I really, I really think this is a great effort and I wanted to just say so, and I wanted to just throw out that it's an opportunity, I think, to again, um, attack some other things that inadvertently get in the way of these projects that we don't even think of until an operator is right in the middle of it, trying to figure out how to overcome a, a sort of an odd, unexpected roadblock. Thank you. Bill? Yeah, I, th I think I'd just like to kind of reiterate and reinforce what, what Rick just said and really what I was hearing. 
is when it comes to Zeb transition, and I applaud the 100% approach now that the state's taking because the incremental steps really re required a different set of questions and therefore a different set of solutions coming out. So really looking at the end goal is important and that will lead us towards that scale discussion. And when it comes to ZEVs, it doesn't matter if we're talking batteries or hydrogen and fuel cells, it's the infrastructure that is typically the more challenging of the two. And everything I just heard that I really want to emphasize for the state generally to look at is how do we accelerate that transition timeline, but at the same time coming up, and again, the state leadership to help support through policies or other support mechanisms, and I'm going to say carrot sticks, everything, so that that transition process is the most efficient, effective, least painful, that we let everyone or help everyone make it through this transition. And I think that's the key part. At scale, hydrogen is really exciting because we can have a, in this case, a transit application that that works effectively to, to bring people uh, to where they need to go, but we've got to get to that scale. And I love the idea, we've talked about vehicles, but now to have a statewide procurement on the fuel side, I think would be really exciting. But for the state to focus on, I'm just, this isn't a made up timeline, but for the next decade or so, as that scale takes place, because as exciting as the hubs are and possibly billions of dollars into the California hydrogen economy, as other actions are going, these are going to be slow processes. And really Rick hit upon it is they can't go fast enough. And so how do you make sure the transit agencies are not just surviving, but thriving through that transition and all the different mechanisms? You know, the state's been really creative uh, and had to adapt and change even when those early steps weren't enough to go forward, but to keep focused on that transition period to make people whole and thriving in that in that period. Thanks, Bill. Um, I, I know I see Roland's hand is up, but I'm hoping that because I'm hearing stuff about financing and costs, I'm, I want to I want to talk. We can talk about both things or perhaps shift the discussion just a little bit to cover the the station itself, the economics of the station, the continued funding of the stations, um, and um, that kind of thing. So, the art, like, our designs becoming more replicable. Do we see prices and costs coming down? Because this is part of the big timing picture that a lot of folks are talking about, and how how quickly or slowly it takes to get government uh, money in place, but. I didn't want to completely cut you off there, Roland, but I just wanted to tee up that thought bubble for folks to for raise your to raise your hand and chime in on a minute. So your turn, Roland, go ahead. Yeah, we're talking about scaling, and I hear a lot of a lot of comments about scaling. How do we scale? And I think the issue is scaling is, is being hampered by the cost of hydrogen, being hampered by the cost of, of a hydrogen fuel cell bus. So what do we need to do to, to, to improve the scaling of, of, of the use of hydrogen? Simple, we all need money. <laughs> we all need funding. Uh, as mentioned before, our, our, um, our uh, fare box recovery ratio is down to like five or 4% without additional uh, funding to pay for the, the, the price difference between what we pay for CNG or electric versus hydrogen. There's no way we can we can uh, increase our use or our purchase of hydrogen fuel cell buses because there's no way for us to to support that. And our operating cost is just going to go up. And even you know our our services are contracted out to to uh, service contractors, and the price for that contract has also gone up. I mean substantially. So I think in terms of scaling, we need money. We need funding. And maybe we need some understanding from from hydrogen providers to to help us out in terms of what they're charging us. We need something that's consistent. Uh, we don't need pricing that's being charged twelve dollars per kilogram today, and then two years down the road, you come back and tell me you're going to charge me twenty four dollars per kilogram, or even just 
month to month it changes. We can't do that. We cannot operate that way. Hydrogen providers need to understand how public transit, how public transit agencies operate. We, we operate on grant money and we don't have extra funding to pay for, for uh, double, uh, doubling the price of, of hydrogen is my comment. Thank yeah, you. such a really good point. And many of you know me as uh, working in the incentive shop. So we, on the bus side of things, um, consistently we will be continuing to include HVIP um, as a priority. I mean, transit buses is one of our top priorities in HVIP. Um, and we do encourage transit agencies and bus manufacturers to um, participate in the processes when we um, revisit our funding plan every year. Um, because I do know that, unfortunately, costs of components that go into fuel cell buses is not going down. <laughs> There's always these supply chain issues and people are, are realizing some serious sticker shock when we were all hoping that perhaps, you know, so that isn't to say it won't, it's just that, you know, predictions are, are, are just that. Um, I was hoping that if we had somebody that could talk a little bit about station development on the call. I, I, don't, I don't know if I can see all the, I see a hand raid. Ashish from Trillium, take it away. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. Just a little background, I'm Ashish Bhakta. Uh, business developer for Trillium. Uh, and Trillium is part of the Love's uh, Travel Stops family of companies. And we essentially offer fueling or fueling stations, uh, fueling solutions for CNG, RNG, EV, hydrogen um, by EPCing uh, the design build process or and uh, having on staff mechanics. Uh, in fact, we're currently designing and building our third hydrogen fueling station for a transit. So just wanted to put that out there just as a background for what I'm about to describe. Um, so just looking at that topic, Leslie, you know, our, our station designs becoming more replicable now in, in theory, sure. Right. Uh, but in, in reality or in practice, uh, I don't think so. There's too many variables. Uh, I think Lauren earlier mentioned that you, if you saw one transit yard or saw one transit, you saw one, right. Each transit, uh, operates differently is, is just a different beast of its own. Right depending on the direction of technology, the fuel type, whether it's EV, hydrogen, whether you want on-site production or you want delivered in, uh, whether you're close to a, a, a plant and maybe you can take on gases delivery or maybe, maybe you're thinking liquid. Uh, utilities, what does that look like? What do are, what are your uh, footprint looks like in terms of physical space and then operating space if you're having delivered in uh, hydrogen, right? Uh, what kind of fueling speeds are you looking for? Um, you know. Today, you, you can get five minute, I mean, you can, you can get five minute fills, but then it increases cost, right? So trying to balance all of that stuff out. And in addition to that, the scaling plans as everyone has touched on. So balancing out all of that with the budget you have is, is where the difficulty lies, it's where the challenges lie. Um, I have many opinions on all these things that I just laid out there. Uh, if, and I'd be I'd more than be more than available to share those uh, opinions and, and our experience in, in the stations that we've built uh, offline, of course. Uh, but you know, permitting timelines as well. It, it's um, it's become more of an education uh, educational exercise, rightfully so. It's a new market, uh, and and you know those timelines haven't gotten any better just because they're. If you think about each permitting uh, jurisdiction or uh, um, entity or um, agency, um, they probably haven't even seen a hydrogen station uh, drawing set yet. You know, maybe they've seen one um, station built timelines. Um, they, I could say from pre COVID to now, now that we're in the COVID era, I think timelines on equipment have increased by about 50%, right? So just kind of keeping that in mind. Um, and you know the labor force has changed. Going back to the permitting side of things, it's just it's just different times that we're living in, and that's just not a, a fueling or an energy uh, market uh, challenge. It's just you know that's just the era we're in 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 every market, right? Uh, so yeah, essentially there's a lot of different variables. Uh, I don't think it's it's a it's replicable. In theory, there are certain ways you can think of it on what's best for your transit. But there's a lot of different variables, a lot of different parameters to think about as you bounce it all out. 
So one of the nice things I do appreciate you bringing that up, Ashish, because you have people on the call that are, are listening in. We're all ears um, about things that are needed. I see Bill diligently taking notes over there <laughs> because it's something the Fuel Cell Partnership offers. Um, I know GoBiz uh, on permitting assistance. So, um, and it's gonna ever be an ever evolving process. I'm pretty sure of it. Um, Cecil had his hand up. So, I, I, you know, I talked about it a little bit with our two stations, um, you know, as far as like the upgrades and the cost, you know, when we did those upgrades. And I think that's one of the answers. I mean, I would have loved back in to benefit from what we've learned of what our current stations are being developed. You know, that when I built those stations from 2011 and 2014, that they were delivering 65 bus capacity, I would, I'd be set for a couple of years, you know, and those original stations were 13, only only for 13 bus capacity. So to that point, the, you know, the replicable uh, is there. Um, you know, the station that we have in Emeryville is a very tight footprint and is really one of, you know, kind of what is being used out there for, for some of the, the build process that's there. Um, and that gives you a 65 bus capacity real easily out there, you know, for, for any of the agencies that's there uh, for a small cost fraction. And then you can scale up to a much larger from there, you know, to 150 bus real easily. So, so that aspect, you know, for the group and everybody that's, you know, anybody that's interested in hydrogen, you know, has changed drastically. You know, that original $6 million only got me 13 bus capacity. That $6, $7 million now gets me 65 bus capacity, you know, with all the things that uh, the pioneers have been learning and implementing. And, and I'm going to, like I'm telling you guys right now, what, I'm, what we're building for our Oakland, our next, our next facility, is even going to be better than what I currently have, you know, because we're taking it up another notch so that everything, our systems are, are being developed to be even better than what we already have. So what we did in 2019, our 2023 uh, build that's going to come in line is going to top that. So our pumps and everything are going to be even better. So we continue to, you know, to push forward so that we have things better for any of those agencies that are coming down the line. But when they make that investment into the hydrogen, they need to be clear on what their path is and what they want. Because for the most part, you know, we were doing pilot programs and a pilot is a test. And as we look to full scale deployment, once that path is clear, then I'm, like we're doing for Oakland, we're building that station for the future. I'm not gonna touch that station again. And, and it's done. And it's, that cost is only going to be there one time to, to set me up basically for the future. And I think that is important to what uh, was being discussed earlier is that you have to know what your clear path is, you know, and I know a lot of agencies don't want to put all their eggs in a basket, as they say, but we're going to deploy a mixed, mixed technology. So, you know, you need to look at that and look at, analyze all the, the you know, the parameters for your agency and, and don't be afraid, I'm gonna say that, you know, but because we're putting a lot of things in there and pushing the envelope for the technology to deliver what it needs to, you know, basically that like product for the diesel, which is what I'm looking for. You know, I need, to, I, need to I need to have a bus that's going to replace my diesel bus. And that's the way we're approaching uh, the technology and what we're doing. Thank you so much, Cecil. And, and you know, for all of the, the pilots, I mean, when we look at pilots, we look at those as the opportunity that AC Transits Online and Okta have taken to demonstrate this technology, to move it, push the needle towards commercialization, and then to benefit everybody else that's looking at it. They don't need to do a pilot. You know, if they can see what you've done, they can use everything that you've learned to basically move to maybe a something a little bit larger scale. We have until... Uh, 11.20, um, we're hoping to wrap up this discussion. So the order I have right now is um, Stacy. Well, no, you lowered your hand. It, okay, you were up first, Stacy. <laughs> and then you lowered it and then you raised it. And then it's Allison, Bill and Dave Edwards. Okay, so um, I, I think my comments land somewhere between Ashish and Cecil. So um, I agree that, um, you know, not every project is exactly the same. There is a little bit of engineering that needs to go into each project because they're all unique in their own ways. 
However, I think the technology, the base of the technology, I think that at this point, it's, it's pretty standard. There are some nuances, but I think um, some of the CapEx for that first time engineering and some of those types of activities has decreased. It's not gone away completely. Like I said, there are a few things you have to consider, but um, I, think it's, I think it's stabilized. You know, it's not a brand new concept out of the box um, every single time that we approach a project. Um, I think the other thing that I would mention is, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, these build times, I think one of the things that we're seeing here over the last, I'll call it three years, four years, you know, we have um, staffing challenges and supply chain challenges that are just completely unprecedented to where, you know, something that used to be off the shelf yesterday, you might get a lead time of 52 weeks. Now, I think the good news is, I really think that at some point in the near future, we're going to begin to see these supply chain issues beginning to resolve themselves. And when we do, I think those build times are going to reduce accordingly. Thank so you. That, that's my hope. Yeah, Allison. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to agree with Stacy here. But yeah, the way we get the cost down, that we get the build times down, and we strive for that high reliability is by productizing. And, and so if you want to drive your costs down, if you purchase 10 buses, I'm going to build you the same station I would as if you bought 100 buses, right? Because your bus, your station capacity is set by that fueling rate. So if you want to be able to fuel a bus in six minutes, that means I can fuel 100 to 120 buses a day. And, and so the, you know, thank your friends like Cecil and, uh, you know, like Cliff at, at, at Orange County. They've piloted for you. <laughs> Go to a scaled deployment, right? Get to 20 buses. That's going to help your cost stack immensely. And don't over-specify your RFPs either. Uh, let us quote to what we can provide that meets your fleet needs. Yeah. Ah, oh, words of wisdom. Bill. Yeah, I... I... I think both the transit agencies and the industry for what the government should look at is giving them market certainty. It's really what everyone's looking for. And so whether that's a, a large state vehicle procurement, fuel procurement that becomes sort of take or pay, we could kind of plan out a lower cost probably over time. I haven't thought through that fuel side of it ever. So I, I just throw that out there. The other piece I would say that provides market certainty is to hear and see from the state really clear success metrics towards 100% transition. And I'll say that the state has always been objective and neutral um, and always been aggressive, but there has been a very full-throated support for we need 100% electrification and you hear it on the battery side. You hear it for the vehicles, you hear it for the infrastructure, and it doesn't have that same full-throated response, both in what's our success level look like and then hearing the words, because one is very tangible to drive down costs, but the other is really believing and buying that the state's in it. And so I think now that we're looking at 100%, and frankly, the transit agencies and the whole ICT process have shown us one thing. There's no single solution. We're going to need both of these ZEV technologies to be incredible successes and we need them to be faster than we probably can pull out so the more market certainty and and market enthusiasm the state and all the agencies can provide around hydrogen and batteries uh, i think that'll go a long way point well taken dave I think uh, one of the things we should be aware of is the, the differences in dealing with a transit agency compared to dealing with the, what I would call a traditional private, um, maybe a trucking firm that's buying fuel and stations in a similar fashion. And that is that uh, transit agencies in general are set up so they have at least three different parts of their organization looking at this transition. There's the vehicle uh, purchase process, there is the um, station and infrastructure part, and then there's the fuel purchasing. And those um, over time with, with diesel and other fuels have been optimized to get the best cost because you can interchange suppliers across those different aspects. And really to go through this demonstration phase, which was what really most transit agencies need to do in those first steps, buy 10 buses before they buy 100, 
the idea of, of doing that as separate purchases that are line items off of standard equipment doesn't really fit the bill. Um, in most cases, you need a partner or a, a set of partners who can provide a comprehensive solution. But there's the conundrum of not being able to make the long-term commitment for fuel purchase that comes after that because they have contractual obligations to do a yearly purchase and the, mm -hmm. the, the different parts of the organization aren't well coordinated in that fashion. So we are, we as an outside supplier look at the transit agencies and really struggle with the, the demonstration projects, knowing there's not going to be a long-term commitment and knowing that the idea of leveraging the partnership and bringing value to that of that partnership to the broader organization is really a challenge um, in, in in most transit agencies. And I know I'm greatly oversimplifying um, sort of the, the different characteristics of, of private versus transit, but but that's one of the ones we see regularly. Yet another really good point, um, Jerome. Well, thank you, everyone, for the discussion. I did just want to bring a uh, a rural context back into this discussion um, and the point being made that volume is really key to getting that volume consumption up to get that price down. Um, however, there are a lot of fleets out there that have 10 buses and that hydrogen is what will work for them. Uh, they have aggressive duty cycles. Uh, they have long intracity runs. And so that don't forget that context that these agencies are bound to the same 2030 timeline, yet uh, they're looking at operational costs that are pretty daunting. Roland? Yeah, I have a comment on uh, regard. Well, I'm in response to Dave's comment about how transit agencies set their procurement. Uh, I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, Hydrogen providers need to understand how public transit agencies operate. And I'm, I'm, I'm pretty intense on that in terms of when I say that, because we're not, private companies can do whatever they want to do any time of the day. Public transit agencies depend on state funding, federal funding. And there are certain federal requirements that we have to meet in terms of procurement. That's why we cannot easily say, okay, I'll contract with you for the next 10 years for having you fuel. So you, you guys need to understand how we operate and change your approach when you're dealing with transit agencies. Don't treat us like we're private companies. We're not, we're not. Thank you. Well, that was a really good two cents in there. I'm wondering, are, are there some other topics we haven't covered? Because I don't see any more hand raised unless I'm missing that. Um, so we have started digging a little bit into those policy drivers. And I think that I'm capturing a few of those, um, obviously continued funding. Um, but if anybody wants to just really uh, put them, you know, put a fine point on it and talk about what policy drivers are needed um, to really kind of move move the needle in this market a little bit more. Let's see, what have we covered? Bill, I guess, yeah, <laughs> that equal treatment, if you will, um, from from because I, I what I've seen and I and I think there could be stuff in the works is with transportation electrification. We have um, the, the charge ready, make ready programs. We have rate payer based. Those programs are rate payer based to build up the utility infrastructure to be able to support transit fleets, electrify. And that's, that's uh, money that might've come out of their own agency's pocket to bring that power to the pole. Um, what do we see that we could possibly happen you know, from a utility perspective, maybe in the natural gas side of things, I don't know. Um, boy, I certainly don't write the rules. I just have to follow them. Um, Jerome, you have your hand up. Uh, I guess I'll uh, take a stab at um, adding to your question. I don't have an answer to policy drivers uh, that could solve my request, but, you know, ultimately, at least for the near term, we what we need is formula, increased formula operational funding to get us through this uncertainty and how we achieve that through various policy drivers. Um, I'll leave it up to the experts. 
Michael. Thank you, Leslie. And I think Jerome's uh, message is one that I just would want to redouble on uh, as we have this forum with various state parties. I think for the agencies who are today facing some tougher operational uh, funding challenges, uh, having some continued state support uh, to provide them with still a continued runway uh, to regrow ridership as they are making this transition is going to be critical uh, for ensuring uh, that our industry can make progress on both uh, reducing emissions from the tailpipe, but then also to reducing emissions by inciting mode shift. Uh, but I do want to maybe speak a, a bit more to policy drivers. And I think one of the areas uh, where we have certainly emphasized our interests as an association uh, has been uh, with continued uh, state funding for infrastructure development. Uh, I want to acknowledge that the California Transit Association is, of course, technology agnostic with regards to this transition, uh, but we frankly do need just continued uh, focus and investment from organizations like the California Energy Commission to ensure uh, that we have access to dollars uh, to build out the hydrogen infrastructure uh, well, Leslie, I recognize this was not your point in acknowledging uh, the various IOU programs that exist. Uh, the reality is that there is currently an imbalance in terms of funding that is available for moving both technologies forward uh, at the same clip. Uh, and by that, I mean we don't have an analog uh, for hydrogen infrastructure like we have uh, for support for back-end infrastructure for the deployment of battery electric buses. Uh, the CEC, I think, can play a critical role in that regard. Uh, but then also, too, the California State Transportation Agency can play a critical role through programs like its Transit and Intercity Rail Capital Program. Uh, that is a program that has historically uh, provided agencies with funding to both address uh, the needs of their fleet, meaning the purchase of new zero-emission buses, whether they're battery electric or hydrogen fuel cell, but also money for infrastructure. Now, it has become increasingly challenging for many agencies to access uh, dollars from that program uh, for the purposes of fleet conversion. And part of that is because in recent updates to the grant guidelines, uh, the California State Transportation Agency is requiring that agencies demonstrate not only emission reductions from the tailpipe, but emission reductions associated with further in, inciting of mode shift in this landscape where public transit agencies are frankly in a position of, of precision, where they're having to really think through uh, the level of funding that they still have available, having to, in some cases, scale back service or contemplate scaling back service. The idea that they can present a picture to the state that demonstrates mode shift and emission reductions from the tailpipe is becoming increasingly difficult. Uh, and so that is limiting the ability for agencies to draw down money from that program. And I know just from observing who is on this call that there are a few agencies who put in for recent TRCP grant applications in cycle five who weren't able to achieve an investment because they weren't able to demonstrate that mode shift. And so I do think that there needs to be a reevaluation if we are gonna have these infrastructure needs that are enormous to ensure that the state is stepping up in a co-equal way to meet those enormous uh, financial demands to support agencies and again, allow them to do both incite mode shift uh, and reduce emissions from the tailpipe. And so I'll stop there and uh, hand it back to uh, you, Leslie, uh, to facilitate yeah, so what we're, we're conversation. gonna be trying to, to move over to um, uh, folks in the audience who raised their hand, but when I, and I see Allison and Bill had their hands up, but then Esther raised her hand. And Esther's with the California Energy Commission. And I'm hoping that perhaps you don't, guys don't mind if she takes cuts. And um, thank you, Esther. Yeah, just uh, quickly wanted to respond to uh, Michael on uh, funding for specifically maybe hydrogen, even though the Energy Commission, again, is also technology agnostic. So we are looking at both battery electric and fuel cell electric. But in terms of hydrogen, of course, we have invested quite a lot in the light, light duty sector. And we're also looking at the medium duty and heavy duty sector as well. 
like uh, the current investment plan, we are located more than $90 million. And this is specifically for, of course, the hydrogen refueling infrastructure for the next few years. We already invested about 20 million of these in the uh, last fiscal year, 2022, to be able to meet, uh, uh, meet the, uh, the goal of the 100 stations that were required by the ABH requirements. And we are also utilizing uh, uh, funds from the general fund to try and uh, achieve the 200 station goal. So we are really working on this. And we do have a energized program and I have, I have a colleague on the call that is managing energized working on this. We are working with CAB to actually create this uh, funding link for transit agencies. We are working, uh, we have the group that is working on this. So I, I've always encouraged transit agencies to look out and participate in this kind of work group. And I believe this program today is actually very, very helpful to be able to hear from the different transit agencies, especially the rural transit agencies, what they are experiencing. So it's good to hear from uh, Humboldt, and it will also be nice to hear from other rural and small transit agencies what the state can really do to help them to, you know, be able to deploy and deploy successfully. Again, maybe not just uh, pilots, but deploying their entire fleet if possible. We also have invested in blueprint uh, for grant management. It's important that all these transit agencies have a blue, uh, blueprint in place before deploying their entire transit fleet. So the CAC is working on all this and we are having all these carve out lanes for transit agencies. We are listening, we're taking notes from today's workshop and we'll, uh, we will work on um, maybe grant solicitations to make sure we cater for every possible transit agency within the state in terms of the funding that's actually available that is being set aside for transit agencies. Thank, Thank you, you, Esther, <laughs> so much. Um, mm -hmm. I know, and I let you take cuts, and I know we need to move to audience, but I would really like to just hear one. Sorry, Bill. I really like to hear from Allison at Air Products, and then we're going to move on to questions from the audience. We're probably going to say the same thing anyway, but so the LCFS <laughs> value accrues right to the transit agency's bottom line, right? Sure. And hydrogen does have some parity issues in the LCFS realm. So CNG, you can purchase biogas attributes, marry it up on paper. I can run a liquefier with 100% renewable power, and I will get charged grid carbon intensity in that calculation. And so there are some changes we're trying to make at the LCFS calculation level, and that will all go to help drive down the cost, the net cost you know, after credits of hydrogen. Just want to bring that to your attention. Perfect. Thank you so much, Allison. You know how to work the proper channels within carbon. <laughs> we we totally appreciate that. Okay, so I guess next we want to let um, the members of our audience uh, go ahead and uh, you know start to ask questions. I think we have a moderator that's going to help us out through all of this. Um, I just need to get to my next slide. Um, so all the feedback is going to be provided verbally, but you can also talk to us on the side to ask questions or provide comments during our open discussion. Please use the Zoom raised hand function. To raise your hand, please click on the raised hand icon. For those on the phone, you'll need to press two or pound two. Please make sure to clearly state your name and affiliation before asking a question or making a comment. And please also be mindful that we want to hear from multiple stakeholders. So we'll move on if someone has continued to provide feedback, but there's still raised hands in the queue. So um, appreciate everyone's attention to detail, but also their brevity and um, yeah, working to get right to the point. Thank you. And Tim S, your mic is uh, unmuted. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. This is Tim Sassin. Uh, Director of Business Development, Market Development, and Public Relations for Ballard Power Systems. Thanks for your patience with uh, all my anxiousness for jumping in. Uh, this is a fantastic meeting. Really glad we're talking about this. I think we are entering an, uh, an era of unprecedented hydrogen development in California. Everybody can see that. And the prospects for low prices are there, but the story begins and ends with 
the grid, particularly in California, we have a very high priority for electrolyzed hydrogen. In many cases, even places that are building electrolyzers with dedicated renewables are using the grid as a backstop for those renewables. And those projects are totally dependent on interconnection and they're already being held up. We've heard from one fuel producer ready to provide hydrogen for 550 or less at the gate for low carbon hydrogen can't do it because they were denied their interconnection from the IOU. So it's already started and that's gonna be a problem for the battery fleets as well. The problem is conflicted incentives. Those investor owned utilities are required to make profits for their investors and that depends on how much they own. At the same time, they may be participating in selling gas and at the same time, they are the caretakers for the grid and they hold the keys to who gets to connect and who doesn't. And when you have electrolyzer versus large battery fleet, which do you decide and do those conflicting interests really mar your judgment? California needs a better way to plan how this grid infrastructure is going to serve battery and fuel cell fleets alike, as, long as, as well as the industrial customers, because the way that it's set up right now with the CPUC and the IOU, it's not some person's fault. It's the system's problem. It's not ready for a competitive marketplace that has to grow this fast and this flexibly. Uh, and that's a state of California problem. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Chris P. Um, I have unmuted your mic. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Chris Peoples. I'm a member of the board of directors of the Alameda Contra Costa Transit District. And as Cecil has pointed out, we've been running hydrogen fuel cell buses for over 20 years. We've used SMR, we've used electrolysis, but when we did the, the analysis and said, if we're gonna have large numbers of hydrogen fuel cell buses, we have to buy the hydrogen. We don't try to, to refine our own diesel fuel. That's partly because of where we are. Um, our yards are located in three different, very crowded cities. And we're not like Lauren, who's got acres of desert out there that she can put out um, solar cells. Or when Antelope Valley converted, they parked their buses out um, in the desert while they were building their, their electrolysis. So they, you really do have to, to look at your um, location and, and how you're set up. Second brief point um, has to do with, with cost of hydrogen. Most pr producers nowadays, and not the people on this call, but but the people that run their companies are used to hydrogen being a small input to a profitable process. Most hydrogen is used in refining oil or in, in making food. And there has to be a, a mind shift to hydrogen as a fuel. When we first started buying hydrogen, we were paying about $7 a kilogram and they told us it would probably go down as our quantities increased. Our quantities have vastly increased and we're now paying almost $9 a kilogram. That can't work. So we are about to go out for another RFP. We're hoping to see that hydrogen in the five to 550 a kilogram. But I know um, as Tim talked about, there are problems put on the, the industry by the state of California that's making that very difficult. And so we're eagerly awaiting what's going to happen with that. But anyway, thank you very much for this presentation. It's very useful. Michael V, uh, your, your mic is unmuted. Um, please continue.
Michael V, are you there? Um, we will move on to um, Michael S. Yeah. Hi, this is uh, Mikhail Scavarla. I'm here on behalf of the California Hydrogen Coalition and the California Hydrogen Business Council. Um, I want to draw attention uh, over the past two budget cycles, the legislature has appropriated roughly 900 million for um, clean trucks, buses, and off-road infrastructure, as well as the clean, uh, as well as the transit infrastructure program. So I think the opportunity for the California Energy Commission, and that's just on the infrastructure side, CARB has funds that are um, similarly appropriated for the buses themselves so just to the extent that we can equally invest uh, for the transit districts that are uh, pursuing uh, hydrogen in this uh, infrastructure i think there's a great opportunity over the next several years additionally i think the the broad policy signal of ab8 reauthorization uh, with more ambitious statewide goals for hydrogen will help drive the market in general both for the medium and light duty retail sector, but also for the heavy duty depot sector. Um, these fall in line with the increased ambition of innovative clean transit, advanced clean cars too, as well as advanced clean fleets regulation, which is being promulgated at the ARB right now, as well as setting up the redundancy that we've heard for the transit markets should they need to access uh, publicly available or depot refueling. Um, not only that, but it helps scale the components for the stations, which seems to be similar, even though the layouts may be uh, different station to station. And then again, most importantly, the extension of the extension and creation of HRI um, for heavy duty at the LCFS is, is going to be critically important. Uh, Sunline, you know, with their public refueling side, will receive access and it essentially allows you to invest in that larger station um, and and earn credits for capacity while we're building out the fleets. And then as was mentioned, ultimately, um, you know, the ability to use low carbon electricity for process energy like compression and liquefaction. And then the end all be all, we also, in order to drive low carbon uh, hydrogen, we're going to need to work with the IOUs to develop an electrolytic hydrogen tariff at the CPUC. This is going to allow us to get access to low cost wholesale electricity in order to do the electrolysis to bring green hydrogen to market. And while there's great opportunities in biomass and biogas for low carbon fuels, in the end, as this market scales, we will need tremendous amounts of electrolytic hydrogen. So that's necessary. Thank you and really appreciate Leslie and the CARB team for all the work you guys have put into this workshop. Hey, Mick. Yeah. Stay, stay on for the afternoon session, because if we don't have our PUC partner on this morning, um, that might be one of those um, things you might want to mention this afternoon when we talk about charging. Your very last point. <laughs> Thanks. Go ahead, Viv. Alex, I have unmuted um, your mic. Please go ahead. Alex, are you there? Um, we will move on to- Is my audio working? Oh, yes, it is. Oh, good, sorry, I had it set wrong. Uh, yes, I, I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, you can take them as editorial comments or um, take them please for what they're intended. I'm the CEO at San Joaquin RTD and I'd like to offer really some words of caution. Let's first and foremost not forget that the funds we use are for this adventure are public funds and we must use those funds with great care. Um, at RTD in San Joaquin, we've, we've uh, been good soldiers. We have invested since uh, 2013 in battery electric buses. We're now at 24. We just recently retired our first two buses. However, I was recently disappointed to see that the scheduled CARB ICT review recently did not result in pushing the impending purchase deadlines out a little bit. My position is this, we need to give fuel cell time to catch up in both technology and fuel supply. 
I'm really super grateful for the work that's been done by the innovators at Sunline, AC Transit, and Foothill. We can learn from their experience, but we cannot default to assuming that what works for them works for us in our region. Our first battery electric buses we purchased in 23 went 15, one five miles between charges. Our newest battery electrics go 200 miles. Nine years of innovation and development, but there's still range problems, vehicle weight problems, part problems, supply chain problems, I can go on and on. And contrary to what we've been told uh, way back when the ICT was first adopted, battery electric prices have not come down. Our most recent buses are priced at 1.3 million. That's way up from what our first buses were. So what RTD is doing is we're about ready to embark upon a fuel cell pilot. And again, we have to pilot here. We have to see what works for us in our region. We can't just take the experience of others. We need to pilot the fuel cell and compare the data to the battery electrics to determine what our future mix of battery electrics and fuel cells will look like. Fuel cell continues to evolve and improve. And my position is let's give it time to further develop and improve. That's a good thing for all. We should not be forced to buy more battery electrics or prematurely jump full scale into fuel cell until we determine which technology works best in the San Joaquin region. Finally, in closing, what about electric production and expansion? What about the availability of the megawatts we need to buy? If you go to the EPA website, you'll see that greenhouse gas emissions in the US are 27% transportation and 25% electric power generation, 25%. Where's the expanded power coming from? How clean will it be? We need to ask those questions and we need to pause and get those answers. In the transportation sector, public transit is a small greenhouse generator compared to all other mobile sources. Let's give transit a moment to breathe and evaluate and ask CARB to focus on other mobile source generators while we catch up. Thank you for the opportunity. Laurel, your mic is unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Laurel Moorhead, and I'm here on behalf of TransferFlow. And I'd like to make a couple comments. Um, first, I'd like to respond to Ms. Chain's comments that 40% of California's greenhouse gas emissions are produced by tailpipe emissions. And grouping all tailpipe emissions into the same category is a huge mistake and a logical fallacy. When I look at CARB's pathways, I see renewable natural gas with deeply negative carbon intensities. I see renewable natural gas made from swine manure creating a negative 486 carbon intensity. Um, and the current carbon intensity of the electric grid is 76. Um, so Cummings new uh, class eight 6.7 liter renewable natural gas powered engine tests at 0 0.02 grams of NOx, which is lower for the new standards for plug in hybrids that will go into effect in 2026. The emerging hydrogen internal combustion engines, they blow zero NOx. So saying that all internal combustion engines need to be outlawed is false. And so these other technologies that CARB is trying to outlaw, no matter how clean they are, those would be a really good solution for people like Jerome and other rural uh, transit agencies that are gonna have trouble scaling up. And maybe someone like Cecil, who's in um, Alameda County, where there's a lot of funding, that would be, he's done great things, but that's not a good blanket solution for everyone. And I would just like you to encourage policyholders to have a second look at their zero tailpipe emissions policy. Thank you for your time. I wanna just correct one, sorry, Laurel. Um, I'm not sure where you heard that the um, low NOx and that the, if, a, if a low NOx engine or an engine is running on hydrogen that it blows zero NOx, any combustion source creates NOx at the tailpipe. So um, that's not true. I've been an advanced emission specialist for almost 15 years. Okay. I've seen Let's the talk engine. I've been there. On this because I would really, I would really like to um, <laughs> learn more. Our email convention is um, consistent across the board. So, so please reach out to me 
on the side because I I'm very curious about that. Thank you. Go ahead. I'll do that. I look forward to our right. discussion. Thank you. Thank you too. Bye. Hussan, your mic is unmuted. Please go ahead. Thank you so much for that. So. This is uh, Hussein from, uh, I'm a PhD student at Drexel University, Department of Materials Engineering. And I would love to uh, thank you all for this great discussion. It really covered up most of the problems and challenges in hydrogen and fuel cells. My question here is, I can see all these great organizations and agencies. I actually wonder how can the university contribute in this generation of fuel cell revolution? Like, as you know, there are so many startups coming up out of universities and they end up falling in a black hole. So I wanna like fix this connection between university and between what are you guys doing now? Uh, my other question is actually for hydrogen providers and suppliers. I know you got a lot of problems, but what are key factors to reduce, to reduce hydrogen production for, and fuel down? It's it's a key, it's a very important question for us in the university, so we can meet up at some point. Thank you. Ed, Did we want to entertain a response on that one? There was that question that he just placed. I think the hydrogen providers um, want to chime in. Thanks, Allison. Oh, you're unmuted. Okay, let me try to unmute you. You're muted. Sorry. I was going to say, I think the, the holy grail that I, I wish every university was focused on is, is energy storage, right? So whereas you're running an elect electrolyzer, the sun's only out certain hours of the day, but we our processes are going to be more cost effective. We can run them 24-7. So any ways to store energy on, you know, that that kind of day to night period. Um, the other thing is ways to store hydrogen in a cost effective manner. You know, unless you're blessed with salt caverns, uh, it gets very difficult. And so I'd say storage of energy is, is number one to me. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the next question. Vivian, did you want to queue up the next person? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Ed, um, your mic is unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Ed Kruger. Uh, wanted to say, in our experience, the new generation of making hydrogen trailers helps make it easier for the small guys to get a start. And the timeline is much shorter and the cost shorter. But they ought to at least look at that, and it might make sense for the state to actually purchase a couple of hydrogen trailers to help get people started. Because right now, if it's taking 18 months to build a facility and 12 months to build the buses, we've got an offset. We need to get hydrogen at places quicker than the buses get there. And I think uh, Lauren at Sunline ran one for three months and it was a great experience. That's all I had. Thank you. Um, Mark, your mic is unmuted. Please go ahead. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. So um, we, I'm Mark Roost. I'm Director of Marketing and International Development with Sustainable Energy Inc. And we're in California and Iowa. Uh, Iowa because it's too expensive for a lab in California uh, when you're a startup. And we've done a proof of concept of a solid state non-lithium battery uh, and when we get the right materials to do it, do a better job, we're expecting to get, um, we're on our way to multiple kilowatts per kilogram 
you know, like 2.6, we think, when in early production, early volume production, and a cost of probably around $50 a kilowatt hour. And the thing is that the, uh, a, the IRA is offering $48, $45 for something that's made in the United States with North American or US materials. And we fit that. So that gives us a net battery cost of $3 a kilowatt hour. Um, <clears throat> or four or five, maybe, uh, for the customer. And we also have designs for wind turbine um, that is an evolution from the design that was, that Enril scaled up to make the 12 to 14 megawatt turbines that we have now. And um, I got into this business because I had done a thesis on commercial feasibility wind energy in Solano County in 1975 and designed a wind farm for that. So I know there's plenty of wind in some parts of the, some rural areas of the state and there is the offshore wind development and the new design we have is Ex a 30 excuse megawatt. Excuse me, Mark, did you have a comment or anything regarding, I, this isn't necessarily- I'm, I'm with the comment, yeah. Yeah, the comment is that there is, a, there is a cluster of technologies which solves all these problems and which, is, which can be made available quick, fairly quickly, like in a period of one to two years. Okay. And in to uh, mass production. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, can we go to Chris Peoples? I heard he was next. Um, I want to hear more about our transit experiences and how we can. Yeah, thank you. No, I'm, I'm just responding to the grad student from Berkeley. Um, oh, God. Professor Tim Littman at Berkeley has been working with AC Transit for a good 10, 15 years. Our current test of various different technologies is being done with the Parkourt Energy Center at, at Stanford. So there, there is a good deal of contact between some of the um, practitioners, some of the transit agencies and various universities, but you gotta poke around and find it because there's not a lot published yet. Thank you, Chris. And if you can, uh, sh our, our grad student on the phone, um, I love these types of connections. I think this is how we really move the needle forward and um, get those future CARB employees because we're hiring. <laughs> um, did we have any more, Vivian? No, so, that seems like everyone. Yeah, we did. Um, so, Ya Chen, um, we wanted to wrap this up we have, while we have 10 more minutes. Um, um, yeah. Lastly, we should really identify next steps because we have already heard a lot from the audience and those are uh, from the panelists. So uh, just uh, from the uh, uh, the entire group, uh, we want to uh, hear you uh, to see what kind of next steps we should be um, taking. I do see that we have one hand raised uh, from the audience, Nico. So I think we'll go with the Nico, Michael, and the Bell. Oh, I'm sorry, Lauren, you also have the same issue with <laughs> with with uh, Rick that uh, your raised hand is kind of uh, blended into your uh, background. So um, Nico, Lauren, Michael, and the Bell. That means you got to unmute Nico. Okay, so Nico, we have unmuted you. Please go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, good morning, Nico Baucom with GTI Energy. Um, thank you for this uh, overview and for all the points raised and the questions asked. Uh, it's it's a wonderful discussion and I'm looking forward to the next steps part. One point that I've not heard yet, and maybe I missed it, so correct me if I if I missed it. Um, is the point of uh, cost and price transparency. I know this is not a discussion about price, but hydrogen is one of those areas that is really difficult to benchmark. Um, there is no publicly known, uh, to my knowledge, a, a point where you can go and say like, okay, this is the average cost of hydrogen in the US, for example. If that were the case, 
um, that would be helpful because then you have something to go by. Um, because right now we're really depending on on different experiences, um, and different situations, and I think that has been brought up a few times that there are differences between transit agencies specifically. So that that may be interesting to hear more about uh, whether that's in the context of hydrogen hubs in the future. Or, or in general, uh, transparency and, and the cost of hydrogen. So I'll leave it with that. Obviously, a lot more thoughts, but that's uh, just the one main point I want to bring to this conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Nico. Lauren? I, I think this is a great discussion, and I appreciate all of the, the folks in the audience that raised um, questions and comments. One thing I think that has really stood out for me is when we talk about connecting you know, our universities and our, our grad students, the gentleman talking about his research and development project and batteries needs to connect with the university to prove that concept out. I mean, I think what we're trying to do today and want to continue to do is to steer operators, not just transit, but fleet operators away from research and development and into areas where real proof of concept is already on the ground and working. And so I think there's a connection between our gentlemen with the battery and our universities to get together and really provide data and, and not just what's the next thing coming down the pipeline. And so I'm appreciative to CARB and everyone who's been on this panel today. And I think it proves the point that we're trying to put across today. And that is there are plenty of people to talk to um, that can come to your aid when you need it and you need to make decisions about what works. And as you've heard today, we also understand that all of us are different. And so you can use this information in a way that works best for your agency. Thank, thanks, Lauren. Uh, Michael, you wanna go next? Yeah, thank you, Yaochen. And, and so folks, just wanna start off by thanking uh, CARB and uh, its partners across the state and bringing this forum together. I just wanna acknowledge that I see a lot of value in these types of continued uh, conversations, ongoing education for our industry. And we just encourage uh, that as we move forward, uh, that Carbon and state partners consider uh, making this somewhat of a serialized uh, set of uh, presentations and discussion. Uh, as you've heard a lot of the speakers uh, attest to, there are still lessons to be learned. And I think there is just measurable benefit in ensuring that those who have been early adopters, those who are just uh, starting to explore uh, the technology, are able to benefit from one another's experiences. And that can give rise to what may be uh, policy drivers and new considerations that organizations like mine might want to pursue state legislature, federal government, uh, to ensure that we have the right policy mechanisms in, in place to support this overall uh, transition. I also just want to uh, note that there is probably also some uh, value in uh, CARB and the CEC in particular, continuing to do uh, education that is targeted toward our communities. I think at, at times, I know that individual agencies have been met with skepticism about their choice of moving forward with fuel cell electric buses as opposed to battery electric buses, uh, concerns about uh, the source of generation for the hydrogen that's used. And I think there needs to be a rebaselining of the conversation uh, to make sure that folks understand uh, that we are moving into a direction of zero tailpipe emissions, that we are taking efforts to control uh, emissions that could be generated from uh, the source of fuel production. Uh, and I think that uh, will also give way for agencies uh, who are facing that type of local concern or opposition to be able to move forward with uh, projects with confidence, uh, recognizing that many agencies are considering this as a technology pathway, uh, given certain operational considerations that they have in terms of duty cycle, uh, the uh, long distances of their routes, uh, and to really just prove the validity of this technology. Uh, and so uh, with that, I'll just hand it back to you, Yao Chen. Uh, but again, thank you. Uh, for hosting this forum and excited to continue to par partner with you uh, on these types of Thanks, Michael, for the input. Um, Bill, you're up next. Yeah, thank you. And I'll start with that as well. Thank you for having this and keeping us all engaged. And I, I hope what I'm about to say is reinforcing where you were already thinking. And this stands true of hydrogen, but also batteries and charging side of this equation. 
now that you're getting all the feedback from the ICT plans, really taking a step back and looking not only at them individually, but collectively as a state transportation system, a transit system, and goes back to some of the opening comments about statewide vehicle and fuel purchase agreements. If you just then sat down with you know, Michael over at CTA and, and the transit industry as a whole and looked at them as a system, batteries and hydrogen, what you might do collectively. Again, now we know it's 100% Zeb transition. You're starting to get that initial feedback of how those two complementary technologies work. And then with that larger view, you can then engage the different stakeholders from the communities to the, the production side, the supply chain, and then really talk about the trite, both policy and private investments required to make this collectively whole and how you walk through that transition period, which is the hardest for everyone. So I think setting your sights on the end goal with the data and, and info you have and really working your way backwards is what I'd recommend. And you can find more of the details from there. So thanks for all this. And we're at the partnership, happy to help any and every way we can on any part of that engagement, technology development, et cetera. Thanks, Bill, really appreciate the support. So Rick, uh, you're between people and the people's lunch. Well, yeah, Chun, maybe I won't say anything then. No, <laughs> I never, I never step on the stand between people and their lunch. I want to thank you too for hosting this. Uh, this, you know, this first half I think has been really good. I would say as a next step, we need to have more of these, as Michael said, um, and and you know my thoughts on that. The other thought I, I'd like to just quickly put on the table before we we depart for lunch is, I think one of the themes we're hearing that's sort of an undertone here is. We need to move from a competitive model to a collaborative model. Uh, you know, the projects that are working better have a lot of collaboration. And uh, and again, to our state friends, and again, no one in particular, and again, no one in, on this call is particularly responsible for how this plays out. I think the state needs to move away from granting competition to steady streams of funds that partners can rely on and plan on because there's so many unpredictable pieces to this in the marketplace. We in government can remove one of those unpredictabilities by making the funding predictable and not based on competition, but more on the fact that everyone's got to at some point do these projects. Uh, so well said, um, Rick, this is such a great um, closing for the morning session. Uh, so we're coming back this afternoon at one o'clock to continue with the second track. And uh, uh, the Zoom link is going to stay the same. So uh, thanks everyone uh, from this morning, a lot of great discussions and a lot of great input. Thanks, see you at one. Uh, do we have any afternoon panelists that would like to um, test your audio video now if you didn't have a chance to do so earlier today? Um, hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, thanks, Amanda. Yes, we can hear you. We can also see you. Okay, great. And then my colleague, Michael from CalSTART, will be joining shortly as well. Um, he told me that he has to update his Zoom, so he'll be on before one. Okay, great. Thanks, Amanda. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, say that one more time, because uh, you started very... Uh, light and quiet. Can you hear me? Can you hear yes. me? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Steve, thanks. Hello, this is Roger Salas from Southern California Edison, checking audio. Awesome, Roger. Thanks a lot. Uh, Roger, when you have a second, uh, would you like to update your screen name to reflect that you're from Edison? I will do that. Thank you. Sure, yeah. Okay, so um, I think we've tested all the other panelists. So a quick question this is Roger again. Do you prefer 
us to be in a camera or just uh i'm, I'm okay either way just want to know what your preference is uh roger uh especially when you're talking we definitely would love to see you uh on the camera but also at the beginning uh when we're greeting people we would also love all the panelists to okay. be on the camera and uh, also, when we're doing a uh, group discussions for discussion topics, uh, we would also love uh, the panelists to be no. on camera. Okay, so this just then she's testing camera. Then looks like it works. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Yachun, I sent you a message text message on your phone so okay I'm, I'm reading it oh sorry the other phone okay so um well then your i think we can do that for you yeah yeah, I think um, it's yeah, it's before two o'clock. Unfortunately, we won't have you at the topics discussions if you have to leave at two. Right. Okay. But uh, your case studies will um finish before mm -hmm. two. I just won't be available for the Q and A. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I need to double check three. Yeah. Okay. Chan? Yes. Ah, so earlier I didn't have my microphone plugged in. So this might sound more uh more clear, loud, yeah. More cl yeah. clearly and, and I look prettier and I sound prettier. So sound is prettier but the only thing is that you sound less like Darth Vader so <laughs> Luke I am your father Steve, you do need to kind of sit back a little bit so we can see your entire face. At this, oh yeah, no. Gotta sit back. Lay back a little bit. Yes, this is good. Am I pretty again? You're always pretty. <laughs> Lie. Are you from the state? <laughs> That's not a discussion topic for today. Hey, Judy, would you like to share? Uh, start sharing your screen, please. Uh, maybe you can start uh, from the lunch. Oh, this one works too. Yeah, this one still works for two more minutes.
Okay, it's a one o'clock now. I think maybe uh I think people are still getting back, so uh maybe let's wait for um ten seconds before we start. I think starting punctually is important because we all want our transit buses to be punctual and we need to kind of uh, do that to ourselves for, as well. You mean uh, running on schedule? Always run on schedule, right? Not hot, not cold. Exactly. My commuter bus was always on schedule. Sometimes they were late for one minute then people started be getting anxious <laughs> one minute that's pretty uh pedantic on a bus <laughs> totally yes and then we are very lucky to have very dependent buses to be very dependable buses that's good yes okay so i guess uh i'm going to start so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back um, to the afternoon session about the electrical track. Uh, Julie, next slide, please. Just want to remind everybody that this meeting is still being recorded and the recording is going to be posted on our website uh, either later this week or next week. And all meeting materials are posted on our website as well. So this morning, we heard from our fleets and the hydrogen providers and the station builders about the opportunities and the potentials uh, of fuel cell electric buses. We also heard uh, that information sharing uh, is very important so that uh, um, fleets can really uh, make a, an informed decision. This is also very consistent uh, with what we have heard from working with transit agencies on their zero emission bus rollout plans. Uh, we heard you and uh, uh, we'll also kind of identify the best ways to get the correct information to you. So um, a few uh, items that I'm not going to repeat uh, everything discussed from this morning, but maybe just a uh, uh, recap a little bit about the next steps discussed. So uh, basically, uh, we heard that uh, um, uh, the low carbon fuel standard regulation, LCFS, they really need to uh, provide more uh, parity in treating all uh, zero emission uh, vehicle fuel pathways. Uh, the LCFS regulation right now has uh, opened their uh, rule amendment process. So all the interested parties should uh, really um, uh, connect with our LCFS team. Uh, again, education is so important. Uh, we were also strongly uh, encouraged to work with our sister agencies, particularly CEC, to get the information out and also pro to provide uh, more um, different um, forms and uh, uh, venues uh, for uh, information sharing. Also, uh, I think uh, another um, information Another uh, comment was also kind of teed up. I want to maybe give our uh, utility uh, panelists here um, a heads up. Uh, that is, and those are our CPUC um, colleague a uh, heads up that uh, um, a stakeholder was also kind of talking about uh, um, the interconnection issue and also a uh, rate design issue uh, to make sure that uh, electricity could uh, be used uh, to uh, facilitate um, all, all sorts of uh, uh, zero emission technologies. And also we heard strongly from uh, our uh, panelists and also our um, audience that public-private collaboration is going to be more important than ever in order to uh, make things happen. So, um, that kind of uh, summarizes the um, the next steps uh, discussion uh, from the morning. Uh, so for the afternoon track, we have five case studies and also three major um, areas of discussion topics. In order to uh, go through uh, uh, all of them uh, on time and in time, let's talk about our time management plan. So for each case study presenter, you have four minutes for each case study. 
that you are presenting. And uh, uh, again, we want to start with the successes and also lessons learned before we dive into discussion topics. For the case studies, we have speakers talking about both large transit agencies and also uh, small transit agencies. They also represent agencies uh, deploying either a single technology or dual technologies. So uh, uh, for the first one, we do have um, four different transit agencies uh, to talk about their successes and the lessons. They represent large, small, urban, and uh, also uh, more rural. So to start, we would like to invite um, Steve Chubak and uh, uh, John Drayden to talk about LM Metro's deployment. They both worked for Metro and were instrumental for Metro's planning and the deployment. We're very happy that Steve and John uh, could join us today. Steve is now uh, the Vice President for National Zero Mission Transit Lead at AECOM, and John is, um, is uh, the Zero Mission Mobility National Practice Lead at Burns Engineering. So uh, please uh, take it away, Steve. All right, thank you, Yachan. Um, a lot of you have heard, have heard some of this story before. Um, but uh, if I can just dive into the to the next slide and see uh, what LA Metro did on their early deployment, uh, we converted the orange line that actually John uh, helped identify as one of the um, low hanging fruit in LA Metro's um, uh, lines on which to that we could implement zero emission uh, vehicles on uh, at our, at our board's request. A quick overview of, of the line, it's a, it's a BRT, a, a true BRT, where it's, uh, it's got a dedicated right-of-way. Uh, it has off-vehicle um, fare collection. Uh, the stops are spaced far apart, so it has very high average speeds. Uh, it's 18 miles from one end to the other. Uh, we put 40 uh, new flyer, 60-foot articulated buses on with uh, 320 kilowatts of char of uh, battery capacity. Uh, we built three en route charging stations, uh, one at Canoga, one at Chatsworth, and one at North Hollywood. Uh, these have uh, uh, rapid chargers ranging from 450 kilowatts to uh, up, up to 600 kilowatts at, at uh, Canoga and Chatsworth. Uh, with those stations that effectively are at the endpoints of the line, we're able to put a vehicle under a charger uh, about every 45 minutes to an hour. And with that uh, service profile where it's, it's, it's just about flat, um, it's uh, uh, got high average speeds and uh, predictability, uh, the en route was the easy solution when we uh, were first designing it uh, and, and putting in um, uh, Lono applications as far back as 2015. So at the time, this was a, was a good solution. And, it, and uh, to date, as of about December, it had racked up over two and a half million miles of service uh, with the 40 vehicles. So it's been a it's been a pretty good success on on on. A, a type of alignment that will work for uh, en route charging and, and battery electric buses. So here are a couple of pictures. In addition to the um, uh, en route chargers uh, and the one on the far right is at North Hollywood Station. So that's uh, where the uh, orange line and the red lines come together. Uh, there's four panographs uh, provided by Siemens uh, at that location. Uh, middle is uh, some of the parking, and then also at Division 8, where the buses are, are housed, uh, we installed eight or 10 of these um, ABB 150 watt kilowatt, 150 kilowatt plug-in uh, chargers. So uh, originally the uh, depot chargers came in sooner than the on-route because constructing for on-route presented its own challenges. Uh, with what I term quote unquote buried treasure every time we took a shovel to dirt on our own property that was owned, managed by us, and we had all the as builts, we were still finding uh, newly discovered and unmarked things such as uh, uh, irrigation conduits, uh, electrical lines that uh, were live and didn't go anywhere, 
uh, and, and all kinds of, of interesting things. Uh, but like I said, so far it's been um, very successful and, and received, and it was fully converted to 100% zero emission uh, in March of 21. We had all the stations up online and all vehicles in, in service. So next slide. All right, I'm, I'm gonna jump in here, Steve. So Steve and I work very closely when we're both at Metro on this, um, John Drayton here, by the way. Um, so so I'll go back into some of the background of the mid 2015 timeframe. Um, why was this project selected? Why was this route selected? Um, and, and Steve hit it, where's the low hanging fruit? At the time, the best buses we could get out there had maybe even on an Arctic, we might be able to get 250 kilowatt hours on a, on a bus design. And you know, we, we all speculated how much more we might possibly get. Um, we needed to understand what the technology available at that time was. And we couldn't easily just put these buses out into regular service at Metro. There's too much variability. Um, our service routes could go anywhere from 150 to over 300 miles. Um, the BRT routes, there, there's the, what was then known as the orange and the silver line, seemed like very logical candidates. Um, we own the right of way, including the terminus at each end where we could install equipment. Um, and, and we knew that we could make those routes work with the technology available to us. And that's really tricky these days because even today, the project product development cycle is very short. Um, if you go to go to buy a charger today, you know one of these these drop down pantograph chargers, the configuration you get delivered isn't probably the configuration you start buying. Uh, the product development cycles are very short, and the technology is continually evolving. Um, second, we had very good alignment politically. There was enormous pressure back then between the mayor's office, the, the LA Metro board, and a lot of external constituents pushing us to get projects underway. Um, so again, we, we had strong leadership from both Phil Washington, our, 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 our uh, CEO, but also from Mayor Garcetti's office. Um, utility coordination was another big, you know, almost from day one, we were sitting down with LADWP and making sure we we're working with them. And then we built a very strong relationship between New Flyer, who was the, the prime there, and, and you know, got, got into a, what we called a, a regular cadence on our meetings where we were talking weekly, working through issues, problem solving. Um, the, these projects really do develop a cadence to them where, where it's on, on hands, active management to make sure you get through them. So thank you, I, I'll be around later and we can answer more questions about this. Thanks, Steve and John. Um, so uh, we have uh, uh, Roland again this afternoon. Roland is the uh, Director of Maintenance and the Vehicle Technology at the Foothill Transit. Uh, Roland is going to let us know about uh, their battery electric bus deployment experience. I also want to take this opportunity to thank Foothill's support to let ARB contract uh, with NREL National Renewable Energy Laboratory for a seven year study, which is the longest battery electric bus study in the world with detailed performance and the cost data that is publicly available. Uh, Roland. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, what I'm gonna talk about is our uh, experience, lessons learned during our uh, battery electric bus pilot program. Um, so we've been running the uh, bad electric uh, project since 2010. So we've got 11 to 12 years of experience. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> what we've learned over that time is that bad electric buses have a limited range. We started with the very first Proterra bad electric bus, which uh, had a 75 kilowatt battery pack, had a range of 35 miles, and we operated it on our line 291 which is a 16.1 mile round trip. We had a charging station at midpoint of the route at Pomona Transit Center uh, and able to extend the range of the bus. Uh, demanding charging requirement. What we mean by that is, um, so if, if you deploy a um, um, end depot charging station, you obviously are not gonna uh, provide a charge for every single bus that, that you operate simply because buses are in and out of the yard. 
Um, so when you designate a certain location of your bus yard as your uh, charging location, then you would have to move buses around within, within the uh, bus yard. And that causes an issue in terms of having people to move the buses around and, and uh, safety element. Uh, operational impacts, uh, we need to make sure that the buses are fully charged. Uh, since buses uh, take six to, uh, uh, you know, two to four hours of charging, depending on the state of charge, the dispatchers need to be aware of bus, what, which buses are, are uh, already available. Um, high cost of in-route chargers. Uh, in-route charger costs about, when we started our project, cost us a million dollars per, per charger station. So we had two of them at our Pomona Transit Center. Over time in 2017 or 18, we installed two chargers at the Azusa Intermodal Transit Center, and that cost us about $500,000 per charger. The price has dropped, but still, still a, a huge investment on, on the transit agency. Uh, high cost of technology parts. Uh, it's already been mentioned that the electric buses, uh, preventive maintenance cost is, is a lot lower than you know, maintaining your, your internal combustion engine buses because of, there's no consumable uh, items to replace like fluids, fan belts, filters and whatnot. However, we've experienced premature um, high technology parts failures with our bad electric buses. So an inverter can cost you about 12 to $14,000 per inverter. And not only is, the, is it costly, but it's hard to get. I mean, parts availability was another issue that we ran into. Next slide, please. Um, we engaged the um, engineering firm of Burns and McDonald, not the Burns uh, engineering firm that John works for right now, it's Burns and McDonald. And they identified it was gonna cost us $120 million to electrify our fleet by 2030. And uh, it's determined that battery electric buses is not a one-to-one -one replacement, it's a almost like one and a half to one. So we would have to increase our fleet size from over 300 buses to over 500 buses. And we don't, first off, we don't have the, the capital to invest and uh, we don't have the, uh, the space for those buses in our bus yard. Um, as I mentioned again earlier, buses will be charging, returning to the depot. I described this earlier in the previous slide. And then uh, technology only allows us to electrify 60% of our bus routes. So that's why we're looking at uh, hydrogen fuel cell buses. Another thing that we've experienced with, with bad electric buses is the uh, parts availability is really tough to get parts. Uh, we had service, quality of service was also not, not, not available. And then uh, we're staying away from in route charging. I mean, we're not, we don't fuel our CNG buses mid route. So why would we have to install uh, fueling locations uh, for, for our new zero emissions fleet? Uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Roland. So uh, after LA Metro study and also a uh, Foothill study, uh, now mm. let's hear about uh, how things could be for a small transit agency. <clears throat> Mr. Richard Tree is the executive director of the Tulare County Regional oh. Transit Agency. Rich is our um, longtime friend in deploying zero emission technology. Uh, Rich also previously oversee um, oversaw the Portville Transit um, uh, and also had uh, um, some great experience about their pilot experience, uh, pilot study. So Rich. Thanks, Yachan. chan I appreciate it. And, and thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to you all today. Um, really, what a wonderful event um, that, that we've had so far. And I want to just uh, give a shout out to CARB staff, in particular, Yachan and, and Leslie, in putting this together. Um, I was trying to think of words that, and immediately that came to mind was, you know, fantastic, amazing, um, and positive information uh, that that's been provided thus far. Um, I also wanted to to echo um, some of our previous uh, speakers in the first session. Um, I, I appreciated Lauren um, from Sunline mentioning that there are there are various pieces to the puzzle. Um, and in my presentation, I'll be specifically talking about, you know, um, partnerships um, in regards to planning and collaboration. And I, I feel strongly that, you know, that this is a critical piece. Um, actually, Yao Chan, in your opening statements, you said collaboration is, is more important than ever. 
and I appreciate that. I, I've, uh, I echo those words. Um, and then Rick from Calact uh, mentioned earlier that projects that collaborate perform better. Um, and then Michael from the California Transit Association, he's often spoke about um, the importance of collaborating and discussing and pushing the industry forward. And I appreciate participating in his um, association zero mission, zero mission um, bus work group, getting folks together, talking about their challenges, their successes, but um, ways that they that we can push the agency forward. And um, I think Michael with CTA is bringing that unified voice uh, to the state that we need. Um, Real quickly, uh, be, our, our, our transit agency really is built on, on building strong partnerships. So that's, that's our foundation. And I think with our zero emission de bus deployment, uh, we started planning in 2016. Um, we, were, we started deploying the vehicles in 2020, um, but it took building a partnership with our funding partners, and particularly CARB was instrumental for our agency really just be, be able to buy our first bus. And we're grateful that we, for our pilot, we were able to build uh, by 10, um, but we also were able to build strong partnerships with Caltrans, our local air district, and with the FTA to make it happen. So in, in 2020, uh, from a small agency perspective, and in this case, rural, um, we were able to accomplish through partnerships. Um, currently we're de deploying 28 uh, battery electric uh, vehicles. It's a mixed fleet, uh, really half and half of heavy duty transit buses and, and um, medium duty shuttle vans for our micro transit project. Um, we've been able to, um, with partnerships with our utility provider, uh, we'll, I'll be speaking a little bit more about that in another case study um, through their charge ready program. We were able to do three different infrastructure projects. The first two, were um, our depot uh, DC fast charging. Um, and then uh, we really quickly realized that opportunity charging uh, was in our future, especially when we operate uh, the medium duty shuttle vans in the micro transit uh, space. Um, as far as the fleet and even um, the charging stations, we took the approach to let's mix, let's try out everything that's available um, to see how they work. And then we'll decide in the future of what direction we go. We may just continue to, to try out new vehicles and new charging stations as they go. It has been a, a great learning ex uh, experience, and we we just grateful to share our experiences to others that are planning uh, planning out their projects. So getting into planning, if next slide, um, really. Uh, in regards to, to planning and collaboration, we, we had a unique approach um, where uh, the agency, most of our yards were also, were housed in municipality corporation yards. And so as we started to discuss how do we plan this out, um, we took a different approach, not just um, looking at our own needs as far as the transit agency, but can we maximize and, and uh, spread out the investment by bringing others along with us in this journey. So through our planning efforts, we not only were thinking of our transit needs, but we were discussing uh, and building partnership with, with our local school districts and even the public works department. We quickly found out that there are others that are along this journey and they need their help and what better way in potentially spreading out the expense is by, by partnering um, and so that's the approach that we're taking, especially with our blueprint plan uh, funded by the CEC is really looking at all fleet operators, um, how we can come together and help each other out. I will say in regards to planning and collaboration, our experience has been instrumental to, to engage early with our utility provider. Um, just keep pressing the issue, let them know First, what your, what your zero emission bus rollout plan is. They need to have a good understanding of what, what you're wanting to do and, and the timeline to do it. And then um, next, invite them to, to your site and so they can evaluate and start planning for. Um, the, the next area that I wanna talk about, which is also really important and we're finding um, 
some more interesting comments is in regards to, yes, um, you do need to analyze a grid to ensure that you have enough power, but uh, we're also hearing that there are others that need power just as bad as you. And so the first time that you check and uh, you get the nod that you to the providers, yep, we got no power, but there are other projects being planned. Uh, so I highly advise that you continue to recheck to ensure that um, there's sufficient power for, for your project. There may not be a project may have jumped ahead of you and then um, potentially are faced with uh, some upgrades within the grid that could extend out your timeline. And then last um, but not least is is really on your fleet and, and charging station acquisition, um, planning out exactly how you want to operate. We've heard from um, LA Metro and Foothill two different approaches. Um, I think there's not a, a perfect fit. Uh, every, uh, at least in my experience at the moment, uh, there are unique, each project is unique. Um, but we found our success is in the planning and collaboration and bringing others in along your journey. And I encourage you to do so as well if you have the opportunity. So thanks, Yao Chen. Thanks a lot, Rich. And also, uh, Rich has just reinforced the message we have heard from the morning about collaboration and uh, also um, cooperation. So I guess this is kind of the golden rule universally, regardless of which uh, technology pathway we are choosing. So before we go to the um, next uh, panelist, we do see some hands raised from the audience. Uh, so in order to keep the flow and also make sure that everyone has a chance um, to, um, to talk and also to contribute your feedback, uh, we are uh, saving the uh, group discussion and those are group commenting time after the panel discussions. So you can keep your hand raised and you're going to be the first in line uh, when we open that uh, um, discussions. But just want to uh, let you know that we want to get through all the panelist uh, case studies and those are uh, discussions first. So next, uh, we um, we have an AC Transit. AC Transit is one of the fuel transit agencies that um, deployed uh, both battery electric bus and also fuel cell electric bus technologies. In the morning, we heard from CISO about their um, their uh, uh, infrastructure uh, uh, construction and also their back-to-back -back fueling uh, experience and the success. This afternoon, we are going to hear from uh, Jose Vega uh, to talk about their uh, battery electric um, bus experience. And Jose is the Zero Emission Bus Programs Administrator at AC Transit. Jose, take it away. Hello and good afternoon. Uh, so just to, so everybody knows uh, PR, uh, prior to our BB pilot deployment, AC Transit did not have any experience with battery electric buses. So we started uh, with five 40 foot buses with a battery capacity of uh, 466 kilowatts. Uh, this bus arrived to AC Transit in May of 2019. So after completing acceptance process and the, driving, the drive, driver's training, uh, buses were entering service in January, 2020. So as of uh, today, our fleet has uh, three years of service and had accumulated 329,851 uh, miles and an average of 65,970 miles per bus. Uh, the miles uh, between chargeable roll calls are 5,997. This is equivalent to a diesel bus. So also uh, the buses run an average of 160 miles daily with an average of 15 to 18 hours of service. As for the operation cost, the cost per mile is $1.77. Uh, this is uh, together adding labor and fuel. As you can see in the number that next to that is uh, $1.25 uh, cents for labor and material and $0.55 cents for fuel. Also, we have an average cost of uh, $0.23 cents per kilowatt hour. Next slide. So infrastructure, our Oakland charging station was built uh, in 2020. We currently have seven CPE 250 chargers. 
Each uh, station can deliver up to 62.5 kilowatt. The station is wired with a configura configuration called uh, daisy chain, where we can use the two stations to charge one bus with a maximum output power of 125 kilowatts. Our, our charging station came with a one year warranty from the bus OEM as it was included with a, per, with, a bu, with a bus purchase. So I wanted to share some lessons learned. Um, so we had a lot of issues with the chargers, not charging at full capacity due to power modules and other components. Um, overall, we didn't experience many charger availability issues uh, because we were the one-to-one, -one, meaning that we have uh, seven chargers and five buses. Uh, as per the warranty uh, for the infrastructure is expensive. So just a, as a comment, it's, it's important that you, underst that you understand uh, your warranty terms and costs. And I'm mentioning this just because we had the one year uh, with the OEM uh, warranty and right now we're trying to uh, purchase five-year warranty just because the technology is still not there, they, they don't have uh, parts, spare parts and things like that. So we can take over and do the maintenance and replace parts as well. So we experienced also some communication issues during the handshake between chargers and the bus. And uh, uh, we find out that this, this was due to firmware. So currently they still work in OEM and the charge uh, uh, charging station people to try to figure it out, uh, the issue. So about resiliency, we didn't uh, put any resiliency in our current station, as we are now looking into resiliency for bigger projects, and this is expensive. Also, it can take a lot of space for solar or uh, microgrid applications. Uh, turnaround time for service uh, will uh, take uh, four to five hours to get the vehicle ready for service. So that this is another item that we kind of uh, pay attention to because the, for us, uh, we're trying to have uh, two technologies. Uh, this experience has helped us um, with our zero emission transition plan and lessons learned. So we updated the transition plan to 30% battery electric and 70% fuel cell. That's Thanks, Jose. Uh, a lot of invaluable um, experience there. So uh, next, we are going to uh, go with the case studies uh, two and the three. They basically kind of uh, are the same, but they all talk about the, um, the grid capacity and also uh, about upgrade. But the case study two basically focuses on smaller and also uh, more rural transit agencies. And the case study three will uh, talk about large guys. So uh, for case study uh, two, we're really grateful to have Amy Hans and those are drawn, drawn back from the morning to talk about the situations for small and the rural transit. So Amy is the general services manager for the city of Clovis. And she also organizes the transit manager meetings for Central Valley. So Amy is going to share a lot of experience from the Central Valley as well. Amy. Thank you, Yanchan, and thanks to the entire CARB team for organizing this call. Uh, this has been great. I'm gonna echo Rich and say that this has been a, a pretty amazing and fantastic experience so far. So I'm gonna be speaking to you today about what Clovis Transit is learning as we're continuing to manage the challenges of a small demonstration project we're running two small battery electric shuttle buses. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about specifically how it is to work with our power and energy provider here in the central San Joaquin Valley. What we discovered when planning for the installation of just two level three charges, chargers in our current facility is that not only is our current facility out of capacity, but the grid around us is also unable to accommodate the needed upgrades for the transformers and other substructures for a zero em emission fleet. We have about 35 vehicles in our fleet, so we're smaller than most, bigger than some. Um, so I think this is gonna be applicable to a lot of you out there. Uh, so what this means is that for our conversion plan, 
the option of building an entire new facility comes into the conversation uh, because the cost timeline and resiliency is similar to retrofitting our current bus yard and operations center. I'd like to bring attention to a study that Fresno County Rural Transit commissioned in 2020, and it was to assess the grid stability in Fresno County. And while its focus was on the rural portions of the county, the information was critical for the other operators to bolster our understanding of the grid as it relates to future capacity and the resiliency and durability of power. Um, I've embedded the link in the study in the slide, and I'd recommend everyone reviewing it just as a minimum to understand and, and gain really the language of um, knowledge of what components go into a power grid and how they function. I think that's critical to understanding what your future transition will look like. Um, it's also important to know that when planning your conversion to zero emission, you must engage your local power providers very early on in the process. And whether you decide to partner with them using their financial incentive programs or not, you, you must be aware of what the current power environment looks like and what the plans are for future fortification of power. Like Rich Tree mentioned, um, this will be different for every transit operation, and it'll require a detailed planning process that begins at the very start of your project. Um, I think you can change slides now if you'd like. Uh, the power providers, I just, I just want to tip my hat a little bit to our power providers because they are under extraordinary pressure to revamp their grids, and they too are also trying to figure out how, um, how to get this all done do, using the best case scenario. Um, I encourage you to develop a relationship with your local provider office and ask a lot of questions. And if you aren't getting the answers that you need, continue to ask and continue to dialogue. PG&E and SoCal Edison and the other providers are our partners in this project, and they are critical to our success. Um, I'm going to be around after the rest of the presentation, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much, Amy. I really appreciate uh, the insight. So. Um, while we see some large transit agencies deploy uh, both technologies, Humboldt Transit is kind of a very special uh, rural transit, but they also like to uh, explore all possibilities uh, to meet their needs. So, Jerome. Thank you, Yuchin. Um Yeah, just touching briefly on uh, our experience with um, looking at battery electric buses, we did, when, and bit of clean transit pro, uh, program started, we we did immediate initially look at battery electric buses. Uh, the technology appeared to be a bit farther along, um, and we put our focus on looking what it would at what it would take to start converting the fleet. Um, and we we absolutely reached a similar conclusion as Jose, where um, I think it was uh, he had said. Um, the on-route charging is uh, is daunting, um, given that you're you're effectively sort of roughly starting to fix where your buses are allowed to go. It kind of constrains the ability to um, adjust routes down into the future, and then also the geographic range over which we would have to deploy on-route charging is pretty significant and daunting in terms from a maintenance perspective. Um, and uh, the other big challenge as we got farther along was looking into grid capacity, similar experiences um, as uh, Amy. And uh, we are in the far north, uh, we're, we're quite remote. We're pretty isolated uh, from the rest of the state. Um, we have uh, uh, power outages uh, very frequently. Uh, we have low population density um, in terms of the amount of investment that utilities are able to make in this in this region. Um, and uh, an example of some of the barriers we've hit in in looking at a possibility of electrifying our fleet um, is the, the utility here notified the entire county. So this is not just a transit issue, but the entire county that uh, basically any development, new development that would uh, is that people are planning to to have happen 
in the southern half of the county uh, would essentially not be possible for roughly a timeline of five to 10 years because the entire uh, distribution system uh, from roughly Fortuna all the way down to the Mendocino County border had been completely maxed um, out. And this is for a variety of reasons. Uh, as Amy had, had mentioned, that utilities are really uh, facing a lot of pressure, um, a lot of challenges, a lot of changes from multiple angles, and transit is just one of them. Um, and you know, also electrification of, of the uh, on-road fleet in general. Um, so for a variety, for all of these reasons, uh, on top of our experience with um, running uh, earlier generation battery electric buses and the challenges associated with that, uh, similar stories as, as other transit agencies in terms of difficulty with range, uh, difficulty with um, uh, OEM support, uh, getting um, uh, parts replaced, uh, issues with uh, onboard technology parts uh, performance. Um, all of these pushed us towards uh, really looking at hydrogen and, and, and focusing on that technology. Thanks, Jerome. So uh, we heard about some of the conundrums and the uh, challenges for uh, the rural uh, areas of uh, grid capacity. Uh, we are going to go back to uh, LA Metro case again, because um, Metro has a lot of urban setting. And also, uh, not just that they are the largest transit agency in California, they also have the second largest bus fleet in the nation. So what they are doing and what the utilities have to uh, do in order for them to succeed is going to uh, teach us a lot. And uh, we want to welcome Steve and John again. Great, thanks, Yashvan. Um, I'd, I'd like to, to point out that, that Amy really had a, had a uh, key factor that applies to every agency, and that's, that's getting uh, in early dialogue with your, with your utilities, your power companies, and whether it be a, an IOU or a um, MOU uh, really impacts how things uh, can work in the timelines. Uh, John, John, John was very... Uh, prophetic when he when he looked at this and said you know we should be getting together with with dwp and and southern california edison who were the two uh power providers for uh la metro and we actually had meetings uh early on as early as 2015 or 2016 that got together with them and they were facilitated by the mayor's office who just happened to be uh pulling uh, instead of pushing the the electric vehicle conversion through la metro and and these meetings were very were super instrumental and and when we started getting into the um the timelines and and actual pr project of putting the orange line together uh they they, they took a uh, more narrow focus with just the dwp side um who was able to get us the power that we needed in the time frame that we needed at, at four different locations. And this is only due to the um, uh, interactions that, that the mayor's office was able to facilitate between LA Metro, LA DWP, and then also the um, uh, additional uh, agencies in LA City that would have things to do like building and safety, inspections, permitting, and all, and all these things. So it, it was a great, great um, barrier breaker uh, to have that in place. And instead of being put at the end of the line with your request for power, we were moved to the, to the front and even they even figured out that this is going to be happening more in the future and set up a whole department around uh, transit electrification. So uh, it, it was a really a, a model that's been super, super successful and really, really sped up the implementation uh, of, of getting the orange line done. Um, the, the next line that we had done uh, to do is the, is the silver line and that's serviced by Southern California Edison, uh, which is an investor owned utility. Um, the challenges there are that in the location that we were doing it out in El Monte, down in Carson, um, the, and especially in El Monte, the power available wasn't sufficient to do the project that we had that we wanted to do. So that, that site requires 10 megawatts of, of power. Um, Edison was able to provide 
um, roughly five megawatts initially. Um, and then the next challenge was to, to build a five megawatt substation. Well, the, the additional five additional five megawatts was is going to take a, between two to five years to get be, to get put in place, further hampering the uh, complexity uh, was we identified a parcel uh, that was jointly owned between LA Metro and Caltrans. And now we have now we had to have a uh, memorandum of understanding between two government agencies and a, and a, and a private utility. So the, the challenges and complexities uh, went up just geometrically. Uh, but, but I'm happy to say that, the, that we're moving forward and uh, finally starting to get things moving on getting the power installed uh, and, and that side converted over. But it's, 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 been, a, it's been a challenge uh, all these years now. So be, be ready for, for complexities and, and situations that just sort of pop up that uh, you may not be aware of when you first go into it. The other location uh, endpoint um, is Division 18 down in Carson. Uh, it's also looking at about a 10 uh, megawatt solution. Uh, it's also under California, uh, Southern California Edison. Although at this location, they're able to accommodate the 10 megawatt uh, uh, need. Um, when we did the, um, uh, you, the use study, uh, they, they gave out ranges of, they, they asked the question, how much, how much resiliency do you want uh, in the system and redundancy? And uh, the ranges, uh, like it says here, we could have had uh, with no redundancy uh, and circuitry that would have been about 300,000 in capital cost up to uh, f two full dual uh, 66 kV line transformers and two two uh, separate pipelines going into the location, but that was gonna run about $25 million. Um, as you can imagine, the monthly service cost from the single uh, non-redundant line to the full dual redundant uh, varies uh, wildly. So it's a consideration that you need to be aware of and look at as you start planning out for the service upgrades that effectively you're gonna be paying for and mo both on the capital side and then on also the, on the monthly side. So ultimately uh, that for LA Metro, we chose a moderate level of, of redundancy without going um, completely off the deep end for complete backup, complete uh, dual circuitry. So um, next slide. Wow. Steve, a lot of uh, lessons learned there. Yeah. So also in the urban setting, um, uh, Metro has already kind of started looking at their entire uh, scale up, but uh, we kind of want to maybe discuss another um, urban situation that AC Transit has. AC Transit currently has um, uh, diesel vehicles as their baseline vehicles. And for uh, the diesel fleets, Unlike the CNG fleets, I think a lot of CNG fleets went through a facility upgrade once when they converted to CNG in order to kind of um, be able to bring the CNG in and also to compress CNG. But a lot of diesel fleets, um, they're really, uh, I mean, uh, their facilities are very old and it takes almost like nothing to pump their um, uh, the, the, the liquid fuel. So uh, the uh, site capacity is going to be a uh, rather different. I think it's going to have some different experience there. So uh, we want to um, welcome uh, Jose back to uh, tell us about AC Transit's um, uh, experience about your infrastructure upgrade. Thank you, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, with a continuous effort to promote the zero emission uh, program, AC Transit started two new projects. These uh, projects located the uh, Emerville Division in Oakland. So the, the one in Emerville, which is currently under construction, this division has a configuration of 26 uh, distributed charging stations. Each station can deliver up to uh, 160 to 200 kilowatt with a dual 
charging ports, plug-in type. So when this project started at the time, uh, we provided all the information to local utilities and had no problems with the grid. It was communicated back to us that it was available. But uh, currently uh, we are having some issues, some delays with uh, switch gear and parts. And uh, they're talking about year delay. So we are kind of waiting for parts for now on this, on this project. Next slide. Uh, for the Oakland division, um, the, the station configuration for Oakland has 24 distributed charging stations. Each station can deliver 160 to 200 kilowatt with dual charging ports. The connection to the bus is going to be uh, yard overhead trellis plug-in connection. So this yard needs a 4,000 amp service from PG&E for the, the infrastructure we are, the, we are building. So we currently, uh, we contact, uh, we talk to PE a year a year in advance to let them know that our intentions, where they stated that there is no problem, that um, they will provide the power needed. Now, after submitting uh, permits and power application for the project, PE came back to us saying that, um, that's not possible that they can only provide 200 kilowatts. So big difference there. So now they are conducting a large uh, load study, uh, which is uh, estimated to take two to three months uh, uh, just to determine the power of the site and not to resolve the problem. So PGE also mentioned that they are not making any grid upgrades for now and they, they are focused on wild uh, wildfire prevention. So that, that just goes, goes back to the one of the, the, the presenters earlier saying that it's a big issue with this. And that's what that's all I have for our new projects. Yeah, uh, thanks Jose. Uh, Northern California does have a very unique situation, especially when it's in kind of a um, high uh, fire risk area. So uh, the next uh, case study is really about infrastructure resiliency. And we're going to have uh, two fleets talk about it. Uh, LA Metro is uh, going to kind of talk about their uh, resiliency design, even though uh, Steve kind of touched base a little bit, but he's going to go uh, more deep dive there. And also uh, we also have Rich to talk about the opportunities and the limitations uh, for their off-grid charging and also the resiliency planning um, in general. So uh, Steve and John. Steve's muted. Now, now I'm learning, here we go. Um, if we could go forward a slide. Um, like you yeah, to said a lot, um, I've already spoken about with about the what the equipment is at the various locations and early on um, resiliency was something that was kind of uh, percolating around the back of our minds but um, it, it's not it, at the time that wasn't something that could be addressed in the time frame that we were trying to get the project completed and with the um, offerings that are were available uh, and, and still pretty much available at the time. There's been discussion of, of battery backups and secondary uses of transit vehicle batteries, um, but we're still so early on into the deployment that uh, we had to put it out with uh, the, the equipment that was available and, and uh, installed at the time. And so for the orange line, where we've got effectively four different charging locations, um, if one goes down, then the, the the distance between from one station to the next is short enough where you could effectively bypass that charging station and just move on to one of the other two or do it back at the depot. Um, that to date in the you know two years or so uh, that it's been that has been up and running, we've only, to my knowledge, had one power failure at one station, and that was at North Hollywood and and they had some local uh, blackout, but it only lasted several hours. Uh, so at that time, we just moved on to the other stations. The, the other challenges that, that have popped up through the, through the year uh, have actually been uh, on the system side, and those are a little bit more daunting to figure out and get, uh, get resolved. And so 
uh, when if a station goes down for for whatever reason, then we just move on to the next and and uh, start employing uh, the depot chargers uh, that are stationed literally 200 yards from the alignment, and we were, we were able to uh, hot swap a bus if if need be. So the orange line sort of takes care of itself, uh, and and then with the silver line, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the new systems are new systems are coming in or circuits are coming in to feed the the five plus five megawatts uh, and simultaneously or similarly down to division 18 uh, there is redundancy built into the circuitry uh, but it's not to the extent where you would see microgrids or on-site generation uh, or or battery backups um, it's just uh, it's something that that is starting to come into play now, but uh, to the to the projects that LA Metro has today, it just hasn't been employed. John, you want to pipe yeah, in some me, thoughts? Uh, yeah, I'll add a few thoughts, and this is most of my work. If we go go to the next slide, and I'll spend just a minute talking about microgrids, DC microgrids. Um, there's a lot of tools at our disposal today that we can tap into. And, and while a lot of us are getting, getting around pilot projects that are just limited to grid power and chargers, um, we really need to start thinking a little more broadly with some of these larger programs, looking at things like backup battery storage at the site, at, at your, your main facility, maybe on-site power generation, um, solar, and then even the buses themselves can be a source of power for other, other activities. And, and we tend to connect all these through, while the power coming into the site's typically AC power, we connect everything on site uh, through DC power because it uh, tends to be more efficient that way. Um, but one of our, our clients was Capital Metro in Austin, Texas. Um, they deploy their buses and you know, they're having a freeze out right now in that region. They will take their buses and deploy them to community centers as warming stations and why, um, you know, Wi-Fi hotspots that the community can use um, when the power does go out. So there's a, there's a lot of opportunity here, and it just even if that's not part of your initial plan, um, operators should be thinking about how all the tools at their disposal, all the different ways they can they can connect together the different tools to make a truly resilient program. Thanks a lot uh, for uh, such a wonderful insight. I think um, resiliency and also uh, self-sufficient and also to be more resilient is something that all transit agencies are uh, searching for and wanting to uh, build. So um, following um, uh, Steve and John, uh, we also have Rich to come back to share with their thinking on building the site resiliency, Rich. Thanks, Yachan. I appreciate John's uh, comments that uh, that resiliency should be at least discussed in the original planning process. And that uh, I want to speak about our efforts in in building in resiliency into our projects, um, because at the really at the forefront has been all about resiliency. Um, and so we have some current planning. Uh, uh, projects in progress. I wanted to highlight a couple of them and what they're all about. Um, first, through the Federal Transit Administration, we were able to receive some funds through helping uh, their helping obtain Prosperity for Everyone program, their HOPE program. This is specifically focused on um, design, designing our first microgrid for, for our South Yard in Porterville. Um, but also looking at regionally, um, we were able to secure some, some funds in a partnership with CalStart uh, to develop a blueprint for the Southern Clary County region, where we're looking at not only the public fleets in our area, but also the private fleet and really developing this regional concept uh, or blueprint uh, for charging infrastructure, knowing that um, not too far up the road, uh, there's already Tesla semis being deployed and I think in our region with the high ag large agricultural um, industry, I think uh, many of those uh, battery electric uh, semis will be in our area and also the discussion of the hydrogen highway in, in the Central Valley um, is being discussed. 
And then last but not least, uh, we wanted to take advantage of the DOT SMART um, program. And this is an area that, um, that I'll dive into some of the challenges in, in uh, designing and uh, resiliency in regards to just having all the different pieces speak the same language. Um, we did find out through our, our deployment that not, not all the time that the, the charging station and the vehicles are speaking in the same language. Uh, so we developed a partnership with Panasonic um, to take a look at interoperability and the integrated infrastructure management piece, um, specifically looking at charging stations, the solar that we've already that we added when we built the charging station project, but also energy storage, and more importantly, communicating everything that's in place uh, with our utility provider. The picture that you see is really kind of our, our blueprint as we deploy uh, charging stations here in, in Tulare County is to um, install the charging infrastructure, but at the same time put put in early the, the solar, taking advantage of low carbon fuel credits, but also at the same time um, generating renewable certificates rather than having to purchase them so we can maximize our LCFS credits. Um, a common theme really in this afternoon is investment into the grid, right? And it applies both to hydrogen and battery electric. And I, I, I echo those uh, comments. We really do need to invest in the grid to help out our utility providers. It's going to allow us to move forward with our, our zero emission uh, bus transmit, uh, transition, but also it's going to build resiliency within the grid. Um, next slide. Gotcha. Thanks. Um, so taking advantage of what you have or what you've already you planned for is really an opportunity to, to build in uh, resiliency in your projects. Um, we really are treating these as living laboratories, um, ways that we can add pieces to the puzzle, right, to make it all happen. And we did our overall goal is to reduce our carbon footprint and generate energy on site if possible through solar. Um, there's also wastewater treatment facilities that uh, that are close by at some of our properties. But um, in addition, we want to maximize the investments that have been made. I remember a comment I think by Alex at San Joaquin RTD is these are public funds. We want to protect them. We want to ensure that they're invested wisely. And I think building in resiliency into our infrastructure planning maximizes those investments. But at the same time, you know, it could work. I think these efforts are our efforts that we're putting into place will ultimately reduce the total cost of ownership. Um, next, the, the next point I want to make and opportunity is, is focusing on optimization. Um, and I think this is both from the energy side and also on the infrastructure. It's really, how do you best optimize your investments to ensure that they're, that, uh, they're efficiently uh, communicating with the grid, um, being good partners with your utility provider, um, but also optimizing how the infrastructure is taking place through charging management. Um, one of the opportunities that we found in our resiliency planning, which is a low cost opportunity in our area. And I'd say that, that we may be unique is because um, the land that's available around us and around our transit properties is rather than centralizing all of our infrastructure on a particular circuit and potentially just overloading it, is can we build in resiliency by decentralizing our charging infrastructure and putting a putting our, our vehicles on different circuits. A lot of times when they have a demand response, they're focusing on certain circuits, right? That they wanna close down for a period of time, but other circuits will remain open. So we're having that discussion with our utility providers, what circuits are available with the land that we own and can we decentralize the infrastructure? Um, but I would say through our experience, not all the pieces are speaking the same language at right now, but um, really want to take advantage. I think there's an opportunity to reduce our total cost of ownership is if we can get the, the, the smart charging, the integrated charging management 
uh, moving forward. This is an area that I think is untapped, um, but also a challenge. The next slide, we'll, we'll definitely talk about the challenges. This is a picture of our first uh, phase in Porterville. There are 200 kilowatt uh, depot charging stations. Um, we partnered with our utility provider. It was absolutely critical to the success of our of all our projects to date is that partnership with our utility provider. But when you participate in some of these um, make ready uh, programs, there are some limitations that we found out, and some of these are these are finding out this later uh, has presented us some challenges when we're trying to move forward with our resiliency part of the project. First, in our case, um, our charging activities are on a meter, and um, through the program, we receive a, a waiver and demand charges for a period of time, and we really absolutely appreciate those. But there's some limitations when you get those waivers, right? And so we, our charging is one, on one meter, and our solar is on a separate meter, and they're not connected right now. We are receiving some virtual credits through our utility provider, but to be able to store that energy on site and then go potentially, hopefully back into the, to charge the vehicles, well, they're on separate meters right now. So we've got to work through that. And we're working with the CPUC on language about really treating these early, early adopters, the ones that are really pushing it forward as allow these sites to be treated as living laboratories um, so we can, uh, move this space forward. When we, uh, when, so we're traveling down the road of microgrid, we're in our, again, in the Central Valley, we're blessed with vacant land. Um, and so, but it is, even when you're speaking of microgrids and a fleet of our size, we've got 28 vehicles, potentially full build out is a hundred, um, space definitely becomes a challenge. And uh, land isn't that cheap right now. So, um, you need to understand what the space requirements are, and depending on the size of your microgrid, that could require a lot of land that we're finding out. And in addition to energy storage, we have a wonderful opportunity. We were awarded a smart cities uh, project with our utility provider. We have an energy storage project going in right adjacent to our charging facility, but that just energy storage requires a lot of space, depending on how much energy um, I, I have spoken a couple of times in this uh, brief presentation about the challenges about interoperability and integration. Um, I think our partnership with, with Panasonic and CalStart and others will really help us in this space. But uh, you know, for the last uh, two years, we've been trying to get vehicles and charging stations to speak that same language. Uh, right now, it's heavy labor intensive um, to ensure that we're charging our vehicles in the off peak time. Um, we, it, we, you uh, literally have to have a utility worker go out at 9 p.m. and, and charge, uh, plug in the vehicles. Now we can plug them in, but uh, right now our vehicles go to sleep and they don't wake up when the charging station says, wake up, I want to charge. And so we got to have a utility provider go out there. So I think that's that integration is really important. And it is a challenge to get everyone to speak the same language right now. And then last, resiliency. We spoke about the, the land, the, the cost of the equipment. There is a cost factor to that. Uh, thankfully for many of the programs from the state and federal side, there are competitive funds to, to, to um, do some of these resiliency projects, but um, it, again, it's competitive and it costs a lot of money. Um, so laying down the, the framework and the blueprint is important to be competitive and secure some of these funds, but we're all, all after uh, we have a huge need to transition our fleet, but at the same time, a huge need to upgrade uh, the grid itself, and not only from hydrogen, uh, but also battery electric. That's all I got you, Chan. Thank you so much, Rich. Um, really appreciate this. Uh, from this morning and also this afternoon, we heard about uh, um, all these uh, frontier agencies, uh, their 
successes and also their lessons learned. Uh, we, I think um, we, we, we learned that everybody basically, um, uh, their success is not random. It's uh, all uh, been done through very careful planning, very uh, collaboratively um, uh, working with their partners. And also they also have all conducted very comprehensive planning to make sure that all con uh, that they can cover a broad range of considerations. Of course, there are some trial and error there, but in general, um, their uh, successes are all through very careful planning. This is also why uh, we believe that planning is also kind of a key to success. Uh, this is also why um, we would love every transit agency to uh, work on a zero emission rollout plan uh, three years before you have to kind of start uh, purchasing your uh, zero emission buses. I also have to say that uh, this morning, Annalisa also mentioned that the transit agencies, they're now ahead of our 2027 uh, target. This is not done um, automatically. Uh, we do have a, a lot to, um, to thank uh, our transit agencies, their leadership, and also their commitment. So uh, the next case study is uh, going to be very interesting because we have also heard our um, transit leaders here that um, we really need to work with the utilities uh, early enough. And uh, it is really important to kind of understand how uh utilities how utilities, uh, they uh, plan their grid upgrades and also uh, they could, um, how they could fund their uh, upgrades. So uh, we are very uh, thankful that we have Roger Salas uh, from Southern California Edison and also Mike McCarthy from uh, PG&E to deliver this case studies together. So Roger is the principal manager on distribution system uh, distribution system analysis at Edison, and Mike is the distribution engineer manager at PG&E. So, um, Roger and Mike, please take it away. Yeah, yes, yeah. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, just want to confirm. Yes. Some? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so so yes, yeah, so thank you for the invitation. Glad to be here. Um, we have uh, several slides here to present. Uh, a lot of information. We'll try to go through as quickly as possible. But one area that I think that I'd like to echo from what I've been hearing many speakers is the collaboration. Uh, if there's one item that you wanna take away from all this discussion is that in order for us to be successful, we need to work together really early in the process. And so while we have some information here, that's, that's I'm gonna say, you know, probably the most important topic to, 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 to keep in mind as you continue with your projects. Um, in terms of uh, the question, how do great upgrades are planned and funded? Uh, so the first thing is, you know, we, we have our annual uh, distribution planning process, uh, which we perform on a yearly basis. You know, we'll go a little bit into, more into that. And as part of that annual planning process, we essentially look at you know, what is our system look like and what is new load, load growth coming in into the, into the pipeline. And so, you know, we account for things like the integrated policy report forecasting. Uh, we uh, look at new projects that come in through our local planning offices uh, that, that, that are, you know, have, have high confidence type of um, characteristics, as well as any other projects that you may have. Uh, uh, grid capacity limitations and so on. So, you know, this portion of the DSP planning process or distribution planning process is where it's very important for you to bring the information to us early. Even, even if you are thinking that your project is gonna change, it is important to bring it up to us early so that you can start thinking about it. Even if we're not, even if we don't build anything yet, we are still, we at least start looking at it to determine what needs to be done. Um, just again, to give you some ideas as to why it's important to, to bring this early. Here, I'm gonna say, uh, you know, four flavors of what we thought was appropriate in terms of system upgrades and how long it takes. 
So we, you know, out of this planning process, there's small system upgrades that are, you know, that, that are the result from there. And these are things like, you know, re replacing a conductor to larger conductor, uh, modifying the underground systems to prevent heating. Those typically are in the ranges of two to three years, uh, you know, from the time they are identified. Then you have the, the system medium upgrades, which are things like the need for new distribution feeder or increased substation capacity. Those we're looking at a time range of three to five years. And then you start getting into the larger projects, which is, these are where we may require a, a, a new, a, you know, high voltage source line. So, you know, our substations, you know, you know, at our very simple level, right? You have substations, you know, that you see out there and, and, and to be able to bring capacity to those substations, we have high voltage, uh, uh, you know, distribution or transmission lines that serve them. Well, when those get run out of capacity, now those become, those have a longer lead time to be replaced or, or upgraded. Or if we need a new one, we're looking at licensing requirements to be able to bring a new source line. And then you're looking at the very long system upgrades. Those are like seven years plus. And those are where we run out of capacity at our, at our substations. And now we need to put a new substation out there. And now that requires quite a bit of permitting and licensing requirements. So all of this comes out of our distribution planning process. And as far as how it gets funded, typically through our GRC, uh, through our GRCs that we file every, every four years. Uh, go to the next slide, please. And, so, and again, you know, continuing with the, with, with the, with the planning process, you know, these, I would say these are three levels of forecast that the, I'm going to say that I want to discuss. One is the long-term forecast. And these are situations where customers may have a pretty good idea of where they're going, or at least have some idea where they're going. We need to get that information because what's, what's going to happen is we may use that to sort of do the long-term forecast. Projects that, very large projects that may require plus or plus uh, five or more years to build we need that to be able to support and be able to plan for those long-term projects. Um, as you start getting uh, into the short term, like two to the five years, at that point, your projects need to start becoming more solid. And, and for that, at that point, we start, we need to start getting into where's your location, where's your capacity, how much capacity you need, how many, you know, you know buses do you have. We need to have that in that time range because we have some areas in our distribution grid that even a small amount of buses may require a distribution system upgrade, you know, the, the, the smaller system upgrades that I discussed in the previous slide. And so we need to be able to get that in, get these projects in, in this type of category during this time range, you know, like this is, this is the location, this is the number of buses, et cetera, right? And then we really want to stay away from the bottom, the one in the bottom, which is, we shouldn't be getting requests earlier than two years of new, new load requests. At this point, we are really, I'm gonna say potentially in trouble because our systems may not be able to provide the capacity and we know you need your, the capacity and that really puts us in a really bad situation on both ends. So really encourage us to not, you know, even consider being in the bottom line, let's consider being in the first two Two, uh, two bullet points there. And then um, next one here, just a very a graphical representation of, um, we go to the next slide. Very, very high level representation of our, just our annual process. You know, these are, uh, you know, air, airplanes level views as to the major steps. But this will typically, this is the way we do our system planning, right? You have the, our summer period where we see the high demand of the electrical usage during that time, we monitor our distribution grid. We look at where the problems occur. We look at what is materialized, what didn't materialize. Coming out of the summer, you know, October or so, we take a look at what happened. We start building our base cases to update all of our, all of our, all of our systems, all of our stations capacity, circuit capacities, finalize that, and then we inject the new forecast. So this is, again, this is where it becomes very important that we know your plans because we're gonna insert your forecast, whether it's a, a, you know, a, a two to five years or preferably a five year out forecast, 
we are going to use that to insert into our base case and create, you know, determine what the new impacts of this new forecast is going to be. And then from there, we develop mitigation plans. We develop projects that we put in our, into our plan. And then, of course, then, you know, package that year's uh, DPP into, you know, package it up, finish it up. We go into the next summer and then the cycle starts again. And now I'll pass it over to my colleague, Mike, Mike McCarthy. Sorry, Mike. Great. And let's just stay on this, stay on that slide for, for one more minute. You can go back. Um, just, just to reiterate, really where we can collaborate and where we can partner is on that input piece in the in the bottom, that load forecast visual there. We have um, you know, a couple pieces of input right now into our process um, as far as load is concerned. So there's the the IPER forecast, which is a CEC forecast that has to make it into our planning process. Um, there's a commission order that requires that we use that load forecast to actually model the load. So we have the IPER forecast as well as new business applications. So in the shorter term, that's really what the, the load we have that we use to plan our system. However, where we can partner is a third input into that is information from fleet customers, from EV fleet customers, including folks on this call, where we can plan a longer term uh, horizon for what to expect. So really knowing what is the roadmap? When do you expect to get the vehicles? What is your charging type? What are your load profiles? Um, what to expect where we can collaborate and understand those plans and actually build it into our multi-year longer term plan. You can go ahead and the next slide. All right, so when it comes to the, the larger projects, so when we're thinking about even the larger projects, it's the, the 10 plus megawatts that I've heard referenced here before, those, those require even more special attention. So, you know, every project requires special attention, but when you get into this side, there really is a need for some, some special planning. Um, we may have to come up with different funding um, approaches. Sometimes customer dedicated substations are required in these cases, so we have to actually um, you know, figure out how to permit that substation, figure out how to get the land um, and actually build, build the transmission lines to go to that substation. Um, and customers may be required to fund those, um, those sites as well, um, depending on the situation. Um, and because they're involving substations, because they're involving higher voltage lines, there has to be, a, we have to go through a special process under CEQA and GO131D to actually get the permit and get those approved. And so the ask there in those sizes, you know, in general, we want to know as early as possible, but specifically in that category of projects, we need to know at least five years in advance, given the long timeline and actually um, developing those projects. Yeah, uh, really appreciate Roger and the Mike, your insight here. I think this is also kind of a great segue that we move on to our panel discussions. We basically have three areas of uh, discussions. The first area is uh, really kind of focusing about how to plan for future uh, potential grid needs. And the, um, the second area of discussion focuses a little bit more about um, you know, uh, looking out um, into future years. Um, what's the best way to strategize, to optimize our upgrades so that uh, it can be both a uh, cost effective, uh, cost saving, and uh, also um, time saving. Then uh, the third area of discussion is going to go back to our uh, last um, uh, transit panel that is about the infrastructure resiliency. And we also have uh, allocate different amount of time uh, to make sure that all topics are well discussed. So uh, let's open to the um, the first area of discussion topics, the planning for current and the future potential grid, grid needs. Uh, let's make sure that we can um, wrap up our discussions for this topic area by 2.40 so that uh, uh, we can have uh, uh, everybody's input uh, all shared. So um, I think there are uh, a few questions here that we would like to ask our utility colleagues here. Um, do you guys feel that the, you're, as utilities, you're getting sufficient information from our fleet operators to accurately plan for grid upgrades? And also how far into the future do you really kind of have to plan for upgrades? 
we know that in your second slide, you talk about, you know, uh, near future and also medium term and also longer term. But sometimes I guess it is also hard for um, transit agencies or any fleets to understand which category they are in. We know that we should avoid from being in the uh, near term category. But I guess it is just that in the midterm and also longer term, sometimes people don't know. And sometimes people think that, oh, I have a relatively small um, small uh, fleet. If LA Metro can get that done, say, within five years, uh, I think I'm all set right now. Is that the <laughs> correct thinking? And how um, is the process or experience different from, um, you know, remote setting versus a very populated urban setting. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a, I'll give it a uh, shot and then um, my, Mike, if you can, uh, you know, give your point of view. In terms of the first bullet, I mean, we get some information. Uh, so I don't wanna say that we don't get information, but we need to get more. Uh, so so I would say that that would start with that, right? Like we, in some areas we get, like said, in the, in, 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 like we indicated in our, you know, in, in the, our slides, we get some information from some customers when they come in for service. In, in some cases that, you know, that may be a little bit too close for our comfort. So it would be a best if we start a little bit earlier uh, to be able to capture potential system upgrades or pot potential larger system upgrades. Obviously anything less than two years, as I said earlier, we probably shouldn't be doing, but two to, two to five years, uh, it's good, but that will capture the small system upgrades. What we want to do is we want to be planning together for the long term. And so, you know, five years out it would be best. So I'm not sure that we're getting, we're getting some, but it would be best to get more, uh, if, if that makes sense. Uh, the second bullet, I think we already mentioned, uh, uh, covered that very well in terms of how long we plan for upgrades, the 10 year plan that we mentioned. Um, and in terms of experiences in rural versus populated, uh, I would say, you know, based on my experience uh, uh, in SCE, bo both can have a problem. So meaning like, in, you know, if we run our capacity, is, is we, you know, at the substation level, we, we may end up with equivalent problems of having to license a new substation. However, uh, for urban areas, we have plenty of substations, plenty of circuits for which we can potentially do uh, localized upgrades to our substations, to our circuits. So we're in that two to five year time frame, um, and and yeah, susceptible potentially to to major upgrades, the seven year plans upgrades, but not as susceptible to that of the rural areas. Rural areas, we have very small substations, very small circuitry, you know, originally designed decades ago to serve very small amount of loads. So the wire out there is very, very, you know, thin, you know, not enough, not a lot of capacity. And so generally those, you know, are more difficult to do system upgrades because that those we're typically looking at a major system upgrades that will require licensing. And so, so Mike, I don't know if you wanna you know, provide your comments on that. Yeah, no, great, great summary, Roger. I mean, I'll go and, and reverse here and thinking about the rural versus urban, but um, I was going to think it really just depends, but they do have each have their own flavor of challenges. Um, if you think about rural versus urban, just from a percentage of load growth is concerned, one bus shows up into a rural environment versus one bus shows up into an urban environment, the the rural piece is like a much higher percentage as, as far as base load is concerned or the existing infrastructure. Um, and substations may be further, further apart, um, transmission lines further apart, um, and lines themselves smaller, as Roger mentioned. And so there's challenges associated with that. In an urban environment, obviously, the, the more buses, um, and the percentage is going to go up as a result of that. But you may encounter different challenges like space constraints or um, infrastructure constraints in the ground and, and um, things like that that we'll have to manage in the process. And so... Um, I'm just going to keep saying early is better. Earlier is better for us to know, uh, for that reason, so that we can identify those challenges earlier. Um, and uh, jumping maybe to the to the first question, and I'll use this as an opportunity to to mention this to to all these these customers out there on this call. But uh, we're working this year um, where 
pg e account reps are actually going to be reaching out to their fleet customers with a questionnaire on information about the about um, customers roadmaps so that we can actually incorporate that into some of our plan and try to get that information earlier um, in more of a kind of a longer term format that we can plan around and as that as those roadmaps kind of come to fruition we can true up our infrastructure plans to make sure that it aligns with those plans so uh, I think this is really a great insight that uh, um, uh, right now ARB, we do a uh, staff did a uh, work on the uh, fleet location. So we do have a list of uh, um, the fleet, uh, which uh, IOU or POU service area that they're located in. And we can certainly share that list with uh, all the utilities, along with uh, how many buses, large ones or smaller ones, each, uh, you know, how many. So uh, for you to kind of uh, understand about the potential loads, even though they may not um, have reached out to you, but uh, as uh, for the ICT regulation, the 100% purchase requirement is going to start in 2029. And also uh, right now, uh, all the uh, statewide um, purchase and also commitment, we are ahead of the 2027 schedule. So I'm thinking that when we talk about, you know, early, that actually yeah. means now. Should we kind of uh, maybe encourage everyone to reach out to their utilities now, even though they might be uh, purchased their very first one, in say 2027 but uh, um as mike you also mentioned about sometimes it's not about the total load it is about how heavy how big the percentage is uh to that area so uh uh would that be kind of a doable approach for you or um do you have any other uh considerations no, my yeah. In that context, I would I would recommend that each customer work with their account rep to provide that information, um, and then it'll it'll make it into our planning process, um, at least on the, the longer term horizon. On the as as Roger mentioned, on the medium and short term horizon, um, that information needs to come through in an application, but at least in the longer term, we can get that information by working with um, account reps and customers. That is good. So uh, we do have uh, uh, two raised hands from our panel, uh, Rich, then Rick. Yeah, thanks, Yachan. I'd just like to put a plug in for, for transit agencies that have developed their, their rollout plan, right? I think everyone um, should hand that nice copy over to your account manager and say, here's our plan, um, and then really start to lay out that, that foundation. I, I think back in the early days um, when we were able to, to to put together a project pretty quickly. Um, I think that's a very unique case now. Um, and even in those discussions, our utility provider was, okay, what's your need right now? And then also tell us what your need is in 20 years. But And, and so they got a, a very large picture of really the, the, the size of the scaling that we need to do but it allowed them to at least focus on the immediate needs that our agency um, needed at that time. But again, uh, maybe a plug in, some really good foresight to, to have a zero motion bus rollout plan and encourage agencies just take that nice copy and send it over to your account manager. Yes, the more people can uh, read the rollout plans, the better it is because every trend has spent so much time working on it. Rick, you're up next. Uh, thank you, Yai Chan. Uh, another great um, presentation, especially from the utilities. I think this is really interesting stuff for us all. And you know, one of the one of the first things that occurs to me, and I, and it's um, I think it's related to something that Matt Coldwell has put in the chat, and that is. I, I think we need to be looking at the planning horizons for the transit operators versus um, the utilities, particularly in, you know, like, you know, my comment I made right before I got out of the way of people going to lunch, which is um, transit operators now are competing for grants. And when they get those grants, when they win, when they lose is unpredictable. And that changes when they do a project and that changes when they, their project milestones, for example, working with their utilities on a critical piece of the project, 
can depend on whether or not what cycle they win a grant. And it makes it very hard for the transfer operators in some cases to go to their utilities and say, these are our plans. And in, the, in a level of detail, I think Roger and Mike are suggesting transit does. So I think this is another like light bulb. We're all seeing, haha, we need to think about this better as a as a as a state, as as an industry. Um, so I just think this is this is really interesting. And then Mike, I don't mean to um zero in on you, but you you said something about your, you know, surveying your customers. Um in the Bay Area, you know, we've got this complicated transit system that you may or may not be aware of or even care about where there's a number of operators in MTC, the MPO is often asked to play a quasi-transit planning role. And right now, MTC is about to embark on a consultant study on what their regional role should be in planning and funding zero emission based transition projects for Bay Area bus operators. I, I will probably be helping the operators navigate that study in the Bay Area. I would like to reach out now and talk to somebody at PG&E about that project and make sure that PG&E is plugged into MTC. Because if you think the operators are slow to come to the table in the way you suggest we should, MTC is even slower. And But they're going to have a critical role in who gets the money when amongst these Bay Area operators. So I don't know, Mike, offline, if I can get your contact or you can point me in the right direction at PG&E on behalf of the Bay Area operators or Yachin, if you can kind of offline also perhaps provide me a contact but it's your co your comments Mike made me think about that project and <laughs> we got to make sure MTC's plugged in as well thanks right yeah we should be able to point you to the right person thanks Mike and also uh, I think uh, Rick just uh, brought up a very important thing is that uh, when we're trying to uh, upgrade the um the fleet or also the make ready or maybe the grid it is not just about one single transit or one single fleet. It is about what the regional um um uh, total collect collective um plan is going to be. Because uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, when a utility you want to kind of uh, plan for uh, maybe like a substation, you also want to know that whom is going to be served by that substation. So you don't have to kind of plan for like a, a five substations in the county. Okay, this is an exaggeration, but I'm just using it as a demonstration. Um, you don't want to kind of plan five substations in one county within five years. This is a kind of a, um, uh, I would say a waste of a time and also a waste of a resources. So how we might be able to kind of pull all the information together to um, make sure that things can be upgraded in a more uh, optimized way. Um, so I'm also wondering uh, what the uh, utilities you uh, think about uh, um, trans agencies uh, uh, as a whole can kind of uh, um, work more closely to kind of give that you that kind of information. Now we welcome, it is Roger, and we welcome working together with the trans and trans agencies and really all of our customers to get that information because you're right, we, we you know, when we do our system planning, uh, we, we plan for an optimized uh, capacity need. So we will normally not plan for multiple substations in say in a county, I mean, it's, 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 it's uh, sort of rare we do that. Uh, but in order for us to plan the, the, right, lo the right project, uh, the right location at the right time, we, we need to have the input from, from all of our customers, including the trans, uh, transit agencies. I mean, so whatever whatever we need to do to make that happen, you know, for Seed, definitely w willing to do that and, and happy to engage in ways that we can make that happen easier. Thanks, Roger. Do we have uh, any other um, uh, comments or uh, questions about this discussion topic area? Because uh, the next area is going to be close to this one. And I think that maybe um, more discussions can also be done there. So if I don't see more raised hands from um, the panel, I think I'm going to, we're going to kind of uh, move on to the next uh, um, discussion topic area. Also, I would like to remind all the panelists 
uh, please uh, update your uh, screen name to also reflect your affiliation so our audience could uh, kind of uh, um, uh, clearly see uh, your uh, affiliation. So the next topic area is really about how ready are we if the electrical upgrades needs to be completed in the next few years, three, five, ten, how do we really plan for it? I think one uh, big question that uh, a lot of transit agencies they've been asking is that how to optimize the scale up process. And uh, uh, so should they uh, do staggered? Should they do one time upgrade? If uh, uh, at what um, threshold that would trigger a substation uh, construction. And after a substation construction is required, does it even matter whether they want to go with the um, six megawatt or uh, go to 12 megawatt directly? Do they have to stagger it? And also, um, uh, could maybe some of the um, discussion on the review and the permitting process also be discussed that uh, um, um, you know, at what stage we, we understand that uh, um, eventually all the permitting, uh, they have to go through the local planning and the permitting agency. But just if it's a really large project, like a substation project, just between the, starting the utility discussion design uh, all the way through a CPUC review, um, do we know at what um, steps can things be more streamlined? So I get, I know these are a lot of questions, but, uh, uh, and uh, Rich is going to add more questions to this. <laughs> well, maybe just a comment about staggering versus one-time upgrade. Um, from my experience in interaction with the utility uh, provider and especially these make ready um, programs that make it easy is, there are there are limitations, right? Uh, with participating, they want to see a, a procurement of vehicles, and they'll match the charging station with the vehicles that are being procured. So, in one respect, it's there are some limitations, and it almost forces you to stagger the infrastructure. Um, but I think long-term planning can be accomplished. But a lot, at least a lot of the programs that I'm seeing is they want to see what your procurement right now, what's going to happen, and then they'll match the infrastructure with that. Um, so it makes it difficult to do a one-time upgrade um, when there, when you got to tie your procurement of the vehicles with, with your infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah. So this is right. So, so I will start by saying we, we, we need to know what you're looking for altogether. Uh, so what, what is it? What are, what are the plans? for total capacity, what are the plans from when they're going to, you know, when they're going to be coming in? I know there may be some program restrictions that are not related to system planning, but from the planning perspective, we want to know what, what are the total plans. And, and from there, um, we can determine, uh, depending on, 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 on when, you know, this project is going to, or, or how quickly it's going to ramp up or whatever it may be, we can determine whether certain system upgrades could be done as a single shot, a single step, or whether a you know a, uh, a, a you know or whether those could be staggered as, as well. So, for example, right, if um, if we see the plans and we see that we're going to need certain underground systems installed that are that are going to be of certain size to be able to accommodate the whole the whole facility then it's better to put all the underground systems in place now ahead of time and not stagger those. I mean, we don't want to be breaking up the parking lot multiple times, right? So, you know, those type of systems we will do once for maximum capacity. Uh, things like, you know, a transformer installation, okay? We can go from, you know, a 1,000 kVA transformer to a 1,500 kVA transformer with no problem, right? Those could be, those could be staggered depending on when the, the, the need is going to be right if if customer only wants to start with small number uh, of, of, of chargers for some years and you know five years later they want to do something else then perhaps we may end up with a small transformer and then we'll upgrade it later on those are easy things to do in a staggered way but what we don't want to do is we don't want to be 
uh, especially in the underground systems, we do not want to be having to redo that over and over. And so for those, I think we will need the, 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 the total capacity was needed and, and when it's needed, and then you know, we'll determine what's needed to accommodate the full capacity. Hope that makes sense. So if I can try to understand that in layman's language, so uh, don't trench your concrete twice, just trench it once and get the conduit in and uh, uh, get all the unnecessary thing in and uh, uh, you can basically upgrade your transformer whenever you want. It's a lot easier, right? It's a lot easier to replace a transformer than, than replace conduit systems. And, and so typically our, our transformers and our secondaries are based on the demand request. Uh, so customers decide like how much, you know, this is how much we need. Um, we, we size the electrical infrastructure for that, but the, the underground systems, the, the pads, the, the conduits, all of that is based on panel size because we know the customer can go all the way to panel size and so we don't want to be ripping, you know, the stuff that was put under the ground. Okay. I, I the only think thing I would say the only only thing that I would add, add to that from PGE is is the the load ramp process is something that we as a at a utility um, work with customers on the large load process in general. Like um, in this in the context of zero emission buses, it's it's no different, or I should say it's no different, but it is similar to other types of load and how they would ramp if you're building a large new building or developing a new area. Some load's gonna come on initially and it's gonna grow and we may actually be able to serve some of that load earlier um, and meet that load ramp. And then maybe in the shorter term, do something smaller to our system to allow some sort of like, um, you know, mid range type load level. And then the ultimate solution is what we would ultimately work towards. But um, on that staggered load ramp process is something that we always work with, with our large load customers. Yeah, same thing for SE, I'll, I'll add. I mean, if, um, if there's a need, again, you know, not, not, the, not, not the ideal case, we don't wanna be here, but if custom comes in early, you know, doesn't come to us in time, you know, like we talked about in lower than two years or earlier than two years, in some cases, our grid is not ready for what they're looking for. And so we are required to say, okay, we will to give you, you know, and I think what I, we heard earlier from, from all the speakers, we will to give you X amount of capacity now until we build our upgrades. And then, uh, you know, you know two, two, three years later, then we fulfill the entire capacity. So in some cases, that ramp is needed just because of our capacity limitations. Uh, in some cases, it could be done, it could be because it's on the customer side. Uh, and I think we can achieve both, uh, you know, um, you know, as long as we coordinate appropriately. I see. So that goes with uh, one question we uh, recently heard. Um, some utilities say that uh, um, if the uh, upgrade is over two megawatt, that would trigger um, transmission analysis. Uh, <laughs> Could this be kind of um, explained in a more layman's term and also uh, how fleet managers could kind of consider it? Yeah, Mike, you want to take on that? Well, that's probably more applicable to pg e probably. Yes, yeah. So uh, somebody referenced our, um, I think, a, a large load study process, uh, which uh, typically applies to loads of two megawatts or greater. So in that process, um, af after you apply for load and go through and provide information and iterate with us on, on what to expect as far as your load ramp is concerned, we actually circulate a plan internally with, um, say I'm, I'm in distribution planning, so we have a plan with distribution planning. We work with our partners in transmission planning to make sure that that actually uh, works across multiple departments. So for example, we may need to actually install a new transformer bank at a substation or replace a transformer bank at a substation to serve on the distribution, we need to work with those our partners on the transmission side to make sure that they can also serve at that level too. So that's, I believe what you're referring to or what you've heard in reference to the two megawatts there. Okay, so I guess this is also kind of a natural a transition to um, another question that is um, on the entire uh, review process for a substation. Um, we do know that, okay, uh, we do know that for some of the large transit agencies, um, 
they're really trying to utilize a uh, high power charging. Let's say that uh, because their charging window is very small, let's say that uh, um, each charger is 150 megawatt and uh, um, uh, 40 buses, 40 chargers would be, equi would be equal to a six megawatt. Would that trigger a substation? 40 buses is really not a large fleet. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess that a lot of uh, transit managers, are, if they're listening to this, they may also have to kind of think about what they have to be prepared uh, for a substation upgrade. Uh, can um, maybe um, Roger or Mike maybe talk about the substation process and yeah. what kind of a um, review process can be more streamlined in order to shorten the time? Yeah, so, so first of all, you know, every location is different, right? You know, six megawatts, three megawatts, two megawatts, it really depends on the capacity available at the project location from the distribution grid. And, and, and when I mean capacity, I mean, you know, how much does the circuit itself have capacity for? So the wire from the project location out to the substation, and then how much capacity does the substation itself has? Uh, and so, so really it's not, I'm not sure that there's a really a magic number as to whether it's six megawatts, two megawatts, it is really a project location specific. Uh, some information that we have available out there for, for, for folks to, to, to know, uh, the utilities are required to publish uh, uh, capacity information as part of uh, PUC requirements under what we refer to as the GNA uh, DDoor maps. Um, uh, for SE, you can Google it as a DRPEP um, uh, map and, and, and you'll, you'll find it. Uh, and there's many layers, but one of the layers is the GNA layer. If you click on that uh, at any location, you'll be able to see how much capacity is at the circuit and at the substation level. And of course, every location is going to be different. So, so, uh, so, so there's really not, and there's really not a magic ma magic value, but each location is different. I would say. One point I also wanted to add to that um, something that we bring up with some of our um, you know EV developers today. So you mentioned 150 kilowatt charger, 40 buses, so that equals six megawatts. All 40 of those buses aren't plugging in at zero percent at the same time and doing a maximum charge. And so um, it, there's there's typically an energy management system or just general load diversity. And so that's that's something that we can work together on operating profiles and what to expect depending on what type of charging a particular location is doing. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I think Jerome has a, a question or an answer to provide. A question actually specifically what the topic you brought up, Mike. Um, and I was curious if you work with um, customers on strategies for ensuring that, uh, you know, the total nameplate of installed chargers is not what the transformer is going to see. And are there strategies to where the utility is confident that the customer will never hit what the nameplate actually says. Yeah, I'll that's something that we're, oh, go ahead, Roger. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you the SC perspective. We we do not, uh, we assume there's gonna be some diversity uh, and uh, we apply a diversity factor to the chargers to the aggregate level of charger capacity. Uh, we are learning more and more from what that diversity is and uh, adjusting as we learn more. So, so to, to your point, Jerome, we don't apply the full nameplate, but we apply a diversity factor that we are, you know, we are, I'm going to say, adjusting as we learn more from, you know, metering information from these uh, service drops. So there's, there's no, there's no, uh, pathway currently that the customer can guarantee they will not go above a certain KW? So so we, that's actually a really good topic that I, I was going to sort of bring up towards the end, but the concept of managed charging, if that's what you're referring to, um, I think that's an area that needs to be explored and figure out how we want to be able to 
act on it. Uh, at this point, I think, I don't know that we have the relevant uh, technical standards uh, to, to, to figure out how to, how to verify with uh, some accuracy that a, a given uh, control system is going to maintain a level of capacity. I'm sure there are some, but um, you know, you know, I'm used to the I'm say that the 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 control systems like for generation output, we we are I'm gonna say we're a little more rigid on that side, but for management systems for this for the charging, we don't have equivalent standards as what we have in the in the generation side. And so I think we need to we need to do some work in that area as well as things like uh, in agreements, interconnection agreements, and and, uh, and 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 ways to ensure that 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 system is going to stay within the 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 agreed upon charging limit. Because again, if we if we agree on a limit, at that point we're saying this is the point where the grid is going to see a a, a safety problem if you don't abide by it. And so it's very important for us, just like what we do in the generation side that we have things like certification of uh, control systems and agreements that we can then use for managed charging. But that's not, yeah, I, I agree with that. all of that. That's not to say that there aren't some level of physical assurances that could be implemented today, say in the form of a protective device that's set to trip when load goes, goes above a certain value. I mean, that, that's, that type of technology has been proven and we would certainly consider it um, today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, okay, <laughs> this kind of reinforces an earlier discussion that why collaboration is uh, so much needed, because I think uh, fleets and the utilities are still learning from each other to figure out the best practice. A lot of things, a lot of practices have been established in the past uh, when uh, we see population growth and also when we see um, some uh, area development. But uh, this kind of v, uh, zero emission vehicle deployment, I would say that it is uh, um, something new and uh, also uh, it's a little bit uncharted territory. So uh, it is really important that uh, um, uh, transit agencies reached out to your uh, local utilities. I would say not today, tomorrow after our work group meeting to really, um, and also uh, it's also a good idea to collaborate with uh, other agencies within your region to talk with your utility together so that your utility can get a more, um, uh, a more comprehensive information uh, from uh, everyone all together instead of uh, uh, individual piecemeal uh, by piecemeal. So I think uh, we also kind of, uh... Steve, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, that you know, transit agencies that are looking to uh, put in large installations for, for charging equipment, we're not your normal uh, run-of-the-mill uh, residential or, or commercial customer. We, 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 we we can work on a more collaborative basis than this, than those typical uh, black and white uh, relationships. And so we need to gray the lines between the utility and the agency more and more. Mm -hmm. Yes, we yes, very well said, very well said. Okay, uh, I think maybe uh, we are ready to go into the next discussion uh, topic area. That is the uh, infrastructure resiliency. I think from um, all these uh, transit agencies, every transit agency is so uh, concerned, cared about uh, resiliency. I'm also wondering that uh, um, it's also because transit buses are emergency response vehicles. Uh, being able to charge them, dispatch them, and mobilize them is uh, much more critical, especially than ever. Uh, especially in an event of emergency. That is why um, transit agencies, in addition to, you know, their regular consideration about zero emissions, um, you know, uh, the reliability, the range and everything, uh, site resiliency is also kind of a, um, a big uh, planning factor. Um, 
So I'm wondering, uh, we have heard a lot from our utility representatives, from our fleet operators. I'm also kind of wondering if our colleagues at the CEC and the CPUC could share some of the relevant state policy that could encourage uh, the site resiliency. Uh, do we have uh, uh, our colleagues from CEC and the CPUC here? Uh, feel free to unmute, uh, not mute, unmute yourself as a panelist. You uh, can mute and unmute yourself at your will. Hi, yeah, uh, this is this is Micah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, can you restate the question one more time? I'm sorry. So I'm wondering that uh, um, if a CEC and the CPUC, uh, you uh, can share any uh, relevant state policies that could encourage site resiliency, especially for uh, transit agencies. I see. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't know if I have that that information on hand. Um, is any other folks from the CEC on the line? Hi, Micah, this is Jamaica Gentry. I'm here, but I don't have anything to contribute on this topic. Uh, I think, uh, I guess this is kind of a, still kind of a new, um, new field of uh, uh, practice. Uh, I think we could always come back. This also probably also tells us that because uh, um, uh, for transit agencies, a lot of them, they're not looking at the 1C or 2C uh, deployment. Uh, everybody is playing for a full-scale conversion right now. Uh, so uh, I guess that uh, um, they're also a way ahead of uh, other medium and the heavy duty vehicle applications because other people are still trying to figure out, huh, uh, if I'm buying one truck, where am I going to put my plug-in or something? Or where is the um, charging or a uh, fueling infrastructure network is? But for transit agencies, they're really um, not looking at the network. Uh, on the contrary, they might be part of the network. Uh, but while they're trying to uh, uh, scale up and also uh, doing full scale, um, what kind of a policy drivers um, are, are needed to uh, help them succeed? And also, um, uh, if they want to do uh, on-site solar and also energy storage and also do uh, off-grid charging, what kind of uh, uh, regulatory requirements are involved? Are those encouraging or they're a little bit um, legacy that are not fully equipped uh, to facilitate uh, transportation electrification? Um, anybody able to comment on those? I can come in on that. I'm, uh, uh, from just from the you know um, the interconnection process of these type of systems. Again, uh, my my teams are responsible responsible for the approval of all the interconnections on the distribution system for SC territory. So I'm fairly familiar with the interconnection requirements of solar and storage. And I mean, we have we have rules in place. Uh, in, um, you know, namely Rule Twenty One. That um, that is applicable for the three utilities that outlines all the technical requirements for the interconnection of solar and store solar storage or any other technology. So Rule Twenty One is is our regulatory vehicle for interconnection. Um, for for incentive programs, you know, obviously there's like the the, the NEM or like the, the replacement to the NEM. Um, that has some additional restrictions for, for solar and storage uh, requirements uh, or what we refer to as any impaired storage. Uh, and it's just from pure, pure incentives. And we have the self-generation incentive program as well. The folks need to, should be become aware uh, for, for any incentives. But, but for interconnection, again, you know, this is typical type of systems. What, these are typical type of systems that we already interconnect into our grid. Solar and energy storage is nothing new. We, we do that all the time. Uh, and so as long as customers follow those regulatory requirements in Rule 21, NEM, 
um, then then we're pretty much set up to do that. That is a that is a, a pretty good for a, a lot of our transit agencies to know. Um, so I don't see any other raised hands from our panel. Uh, this is the first uh, that we are actually ahead of our schedule. I think this is also because uh, all the panelists uh, were able to kind of provide very uh, condensed information here and also, but also explain things in such a clarified way uh, so that uh, I think we, we really have a kind of a, um, a learned a lot and also a kind of a, a, a understand the entire um, uh, battery electric charging at a very different level, at least uh, for myself. So, okay. Jerome has a one more question or comment. I'm curious if uh, if any state agencies see the possibility of doing some level of uh, uh, outreach to utilities on behalf of transit agencies by taking you know innovative clean transit plans that have been submitted, all the discussions that are being had with transit agencies and taking that information. Um, and doing a statewide projection uh, and doing an initial engagement with transit agents or with utilities on behalf of transit agencies. Um, I don't know if other transit agencies would be interested or would welcome that, but I'm curious if that has, state agencies have considered doing that. Um. Will CEC be able to take a crack at that uh, um, question and to provide some of the um, initial answer because CEC does have the uh, IPER uh, process and also um, uh, kind of uh, contracted out about uh, um, the heavy pro uh, modeling. So um, will this be able to kind of uh, um, discuss that a little bit? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, Maggie, we can hear you, thanks. Hi, thanks, thanks, Yachin. Yeah, this is Maggie Den. I work on the hyper uh, energy demand forecast, specifically on medium and heavy duty side of things. Um, and I think Jerome, that's a really great idea and question. Um, I guess maybe in response, I'll share one um, project or work product that my team is working on. It's not formally a part of the IPER, um, but it's something called the Load Bus Allocation Project, um, which is taking our uh, IPER demand forecast, which is at the statewide level or slightly more granular, uh, the 20 forecast zones that the CEC uses um, for our demand forecast. It's taking that and breaking it down to a more granular level going down to uh, you know substation level and that's sort of our attempt or our effort um, to help answer this question that I know of course transit agencies um, utilities and everyone involved in this is most concerned about which is where is this low from electrified um, buses and other vehicles going to come from um, so just wanted to put that out that 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 um, you know, this is something that CEC is definitely looking at. Um, and we're also actively, um, I think, discussing with sister agencies, um, including CAISO, CPUC, um, you know, how to leverage the existing IPER process um, to answer those questions, but also um, maybe identifying where uh, we might need to work elsewhere, such as the load bus um, allocation. Um, but I definitely encourage, you know, if there's any representatives from transit agencies who want to reach out to me um, to talk more about um, what you're thinking or how we can better incorporate your plans um, into that, I definitely um, welcome that. Uh, thanks for the chance to speak. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Maggie. Um, I might I suggest instead of a bunch of transit agencies reaching out to Maggie, if, uh, if Forgive me if I'm overstepping here, but Yachun knows so much of what we're all doing that maybe uh, Yachun could reach out to Maggie 
maybe for yes. initial discussions. Yes. Yeah, yes, and uh, I will also coordinate. Yes. Yeah. So Thank Maggie you. and I are going to become best of good new best friends. Uh, <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Uh Mika. Yeah, this is Michael Walker with the CDC. Just wanted to real quick um jump in here because you had mentioned uh the heavy load model, uh, which for those of you who don't know, uh the heavy load model is um, you know, the CCS contract with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to uh develop a um highly detailed and, and complex model that uh generates sort of energy demand and um infrastructure need throughout the state. Uh we go down to the traffic analysis zone for that. Uh, analysis, um, and we're in the middle of uh, this. This is part of the Assembly Bill 2127 process, which is um, every other year we release a new assessment, updated assessment to uh, basically inform folks on infrastructure need and all the the policy barriers and, and things like that, implications uh, and things like that. We're in the middle of our second one right now, um, and heavy load uh, is being used to generate results for that. So. Um, I did want to say, though, that unfortunately, heavy load does not include um, any modeling for urban buses. Um, although I think the problem or the reason for that is because we just don't have data for it, for, for that specific vehicle application. Um, so uh, I will say that the, the vehicle load shapes that heavy load generates are used um, as a foundation within uh, sort of Maggie's team's work with the IPER, the transportation energy demand forecast piece of that. Um, so any sort of information we can get from transit agencies or or whatever, you know, via um, Yachin uh, and that sort of initiation, uh, initiated connection, I think would be helpful for us to possibly include that in future iterations of our modeling work. Absolutely. Well, uh, for the uh, uh, table that we're going to share with utilities, we'll definitely share with uh, CEC tonight. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for that. Thanks a lot. Uh, I would say uh, GTFS and GTFS real-time might be most of what you need, and that's all already out there and publicly available. Can, can you uh, talk a little bit more about that, what that is, actually? Yeah, the general transit feed uh, service. So all transit agencies publish their routes and schedules. Um, uh, it's a static feed, but it's updated regularly. Um, and and then a lot of transit agencies do have API access to real time sources. So it actually shows what the actual how the buses are performing relative to their static um, uh, route schedules. Does that also include like number of vehicles and sort of energy consumption profiles and vehicle characteristics and things like that? No, you would have to apply a duty cycle, a vehicle uh, okay. profile to that. Okay, gotcha. Uh, we do have uh, some information that we can uh, support. Uh, we may not have, a, a, you know, a individual um, a bus, how, which, uh, block it operates, but we do have uh, um, some uh, bus mileage information, their predominant reading information. I think um, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, good data that I think we can kind of uh, uh, maybe share with our CEC colleagues offline and to kind of discuss how data can be utilized in your modeling. And Amy. Yeah, thank you. This is a maybe a little off topic, but I, I want to make sure that um, everybody's aware that it's not only transit now who is um, getting ready to do this big conversion. Um, our friends in the other municipal fleets, the heavy duty fleets are also now getting ready to um, ha have to convert to zero emission under the advanced clean fleets rule that is currently undergoing um, some tweaking, but uh, you know, I know our fleet manager here at the city of Clovis is expecting that to go into place sometime this year, and they will be under the same kind of regulatory um, scheduling that we are, uh, I think, a little bit more aggressive. So our space that we're in for this conversion is now about to get that much more crowded. And so there's even more of a need um, for us to hurry up and really understand what our plans are looking like, even if it's just an educated guess. 
Um, make a plan and get in touch with your power provider and let them know what you're looking to do because it's not just transit operators. It's now going to be our solid waste vehicles, the drayage vehicles. All of those vehicles now are, are going to be required to go zero admission. Yes, yes, that is very true. Um, this is why uh, when we are looking at uh, um, uh, you know, uh, the regional needs, it's more than just the one fleet operator. It is a multiple uh, fleet operators. Yes. So I think with that, uh, we probably could uh, uh, open the public discussion one minute earlier. Uh, and we are, uh, Rick, you go first. Thanks, yeah, Chen. I don't, I don't know, you know, if you're going to come back and do a wrap up with the panel after the public comment or not. Um, so I, I will just make this observation now. This 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 um, discussion that began this afternoon after lunch, I, I think, you know, early on a comment was made uh, by by Steve and by John uh, about their experiences in Los Angeles that I think is again something that it just seems like we gloss over it, um, and oftentimes in the public arena. And these things that we're doing, you know, they're all really new things. Everybody's having to learn new ways of of planning and and operating, et cetera, including, you know, our friends in the utilities. It's 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 impacting us all. And it's it's really hard stuff. And we're all publicly funded except the, you know, the IOUs, and they've got ratepayers that, that they're responsible to. Um, and you know, a lot of people think when they get their PG and E bill, it's like a tax bill. No offense to PG and E. But uh the the point is is that in Los Angeles from from the get-go you had the mayor. Mr. Garcetti and the leadership, Phil Washington, just completely buying into this. Perhaps, and I'm not saying they were, but perhaps even out in front of the staffs. And that political leadership, I would argue, at the state level is, is really needed. And I think all of us can recognize that. And if we can start, you know, saying that to, to folks that we run into that might be in leadership or uh, ascend to leadership. That's really the missing piece that I see in all of this is we have a legislature that have set goals. We have various leaderships of departments that have set goals. We have folks that have said the state shall achieve these things by a certain date. But that that's not the leadership I'm talking about. Um, I think what we saw in Los Angeles was the mayor actually rolling up his sleeves and meeting with the utilities and the transit operators about what's needed or sending people on his behalf that sent messages back and forth. This is this is something that I think we all need to recognize and be willing to say as we go across about our business that we need political leadership to get this done. Um, because it's really hard. As we saw today, this is hard stuff. Very, uh, very, very well said. And also, we also need a lot of support from all the uh, residents. I always take a bus to work. <laughs> so uh, uh, let's open uh, discussions um, uh, with the, uh, all the uh, registrants here. Uh, please do use the raise hand function uh, on Zoom to ask your questions or provide comment. If you're calling in, please uh, press uh, pound two uh, in order to uh, put yourself you know, in queue. Uh, and also, um, when it's your turn, uh, please make sure to clearly state your name and affiliation before asking a question or making a comment. Uh, please also uh, make sure that, uh, uh, okay, please also be mindful that we want to hear from multiple stakeholders. So we'll move on if someone has continued to provide feedback about uh, 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 if when there are uh, still uh, raised hands uh, in the queue. So uh, with that, I think we do want to uh, go to the raised hands. The first one is uh, Mark. Uh, Mark, uh, I have unmuted your mic. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Mark Roost with Sustainable Energy, Inc. Um, a few things related to this discussion. Uh, could the IOUs be asked to quickly say what they know they can provide in a year 
and welcome interconnects, you know, expo to interconnects for those amounts, knowing the rest can be provided by solar and stationary batteries and maybe wind and energy management systems. Can CARB do outreach to customers to ask what level of track record they need to schedule conversions? So what's behind that is that instead of waiting for fleet turnover, we can do conversions. And there is a company that uh, was in Southern California and did a convert a 40 foot Bluebird school bus. And then a uh, company was stolen, so they've recovered. And they're now preparing to convert a school bus and you know, as a, as a, as a uh, benchmark, as, you know, as a demonstration. So, um, but school buses and transit buses and everything else can be uh, provided for in less than two to five years by putting up enough solar on rooftops and canopies over parking and driveways to, uh, to provide enough electricity and then storing that electricity in stationary batteries until the buses come in at night and are ready to charge. And <clears throat> that can serve the building as well as the vehicles. Now, instead of the 18 to 23 percent efficiency that is available commercially today, you could do some tentative planning based on 42 percent efficiency of solar thin film that we are developing. Um, and then on the and the cost of that is probably uh, like 20 cents a watt um, plus installation. And the um Mark, uh, yes. we do have to kind of uh, uh, ask you yeah. to focus on uh, transit yeah. agencies today because really for yeah. school buses, they're only using level two slow charging. The level of yeah. Uh, yeah. charging yeah. is very different. I, so I mentioned it. Yeah, I mentioned it because that's the track record from eight years ago. Um, but we are talking, I am talking about transit buses. And, and I'm also talking about the drainage trucks and the garbage trucks and everything else. The lady that, from down south who said, we're looking at having to do all of this under the state mandate. So we're, you need some comprehensive design science approach like Bucky Fuller talked about. And so if you look at what can be provided by the utilities in, by, in the time frame required by the state, and then what is the missing, what is, not, what is that short on? You know, how much is missing there? And what's missing can be provided by solar and batteries uh, you know, on site and owned by the customer so that when the financing is paid off, the customer is home free. All they really have to pay for is drivers because the electricity is free, the buses are paid, the conversions are paid for, and the conversions now cost a lot, but with our battery and actually with the IRA, we're looking at zero, almost zero energy costs for ours and maybe 40 or $50 a kilowatt hour for other people's batteries, maybe, maybe 100. And that me that changes the entire equation. So I'm asking that you all rethink everything you're thinking about and use this approach as part of the overall planning strategy. And I can give you plenty more information and plenty of backup for what I'm saying. Um, MarkLRoost at gmail.com. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so we're going to go with the next uh, um, person, uh, Ray, Ray Pingo. Uh, Ray, I have unmuted your mic. Please go ahead. Thank you, Ray. Now you're back on mute, Ray. Ray, you have to unmute yourself. There we go. Okay. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Thank yes. you so much. So uh, uh, first of all, uh, Ray Pingo, Sierra Club, California. Uh, Yao Chun, I want to thank, thank you and express my appreciation to you, the CARB staff, and all the presenters today for a truly awesome work group. This is just incredible. Um, my, I have two questions. The first one is for our two utility representatives. And so far, most of the discussion is still using kind of the legacy process that's always been in existence, where 
the utilities respond to customer requests to build out infrastructure. And as we've discussed today, sometimes those uh, the, uh, the, the fleets, the transit agencies may not know that their request might require five years or 10 years or something like that. Now the CEC of course is the lead agency for the state to, to do a lot of infrastructure planning. And as Micah noted, they're doing a lot with heavy load, EBI Pro for light duty and so on. And these models are great and they're getting more sophisticated uh, the more they're developed. And what they do is they uh, make estimates based on estimated trucks, not buses, we've got to fill the bus gap, but trucks and cars. They make estimates of how much, how many chargers do we need of which power, where, and in what year. And they're getting very good. And now uh, they're, they have another tool called Edge Tool, which takes the information from the models, compares it with the ICA analysis that all the utilities have, which are all these little uh, postage stamp size, if you will, uh, areas of their territory to see, well, how much capacity do they have? And they can compare the two and identify where the gaps are. And then with the new bill that was uh, chaptered last year, AB 2700, it says the utilities now have the authority to do what I would call least regrets grid development. So without necessarily waiting for customers to knock on their door and say, we're going to need these requirements, which is still necessary and must be continued and expanded. But they can say, well, we know that we've got these warehouses. We know that we've got uh, these fleets. We know that we have these transit fleets out there. And it's just a matter of time. So we're going to proactively, uh, if we're close to capacity or we, need, we know we're going to need this more capacity based on the CEC models, we're going to start building out some of these conductors and distribution circuits and even upgrading uh, substations before they come. Because the biggest error that we could probably make is to build it a year or two too soon. And so it may not get fully utilized for a year or two, but that's better than having uh, transit agencies or truck fleets have to wait years for the infrastructure to, to be built. So my question to the utility reps is, Whereas that, where is that concept that's been described at the CEC level uh, in terms of actually being utilized to develop least regrets, advanced planning of utility infrastructure? Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Um, do we have any utility representative who would like to um, maybe um, discuss this a little bit? Yeah, I'll go very briefly, right? Thank you for your comment. Uh, um, definitely moving in that direction. I mean, obviously there's some more work that needs to be done there, but uh, please be aware that we do have publicly available information that we already published. Uh, mentioned earlier, uh, the GNA DDoor maps that have the available capacity, uh, substation and circuit levels that get updated on a monthly basis. That is a direct output from, from our system planning process. And uh, we're working uh, together as well to create better tools. I mean, you mentioned the ICA maps that that's going that that needs to be refined, and we'll continue to make that those those values even better. So, so I guess I would I would just say that we are definitely building the tools that will allow us to do uh, better projections for you know for for capacity needs in the future. In the meantime, while we get all those tools done, I'll just reinforce the need to need for customers and and uh, transit agencies to come to us early ahead of time and, and and we can you know hopefully not have the situation of not having the capacity available thanks roger uh so we'll go to the next commenter uh catherine catherine i have unmuted your mic please go ahead Hi, thank you. Um, this has been excellent. Um, my name is Kathy Studwell. I'm from the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency. Uh, as you know, San Francisco's one of the densest, if not the densest urban area west of the Mississippi, at least. Um, and that presents a lot of challenges in terms of building out our infrastructure. I have a comment and I have a question. 
Um, the comment is from Micah, who requested information about the demand, the energy demand for going 100% electric. Um, we are happy to give you that information. We have studied this. We've been working with our PUC and with pg and &E and with WPS to estimate that demand. We can give you that information. We'd be happy to do that. Um, to go 100%, uh, first of all, we have over 800 buses and electric trolleys. To go you know, 100% um, electric, it would be over 1.8 billion, not counting upgrading our 100-year-old facilities. Um, so um, we, you know, we have not succeeded in getting any state funding. Uh, partly because, uh, for many reasons, I could go into it, but I'm not going to take all your time. Um, and um, my question is, in terms of resiliency, um, is it better to go 100% electric or in a case where you have 700,000 riders, um, and who are dependent upon transit to get where they need to go, is it better to also have some biodiesel buses to be able, you know, to run on critical routes that get people to hospitals and major employment centers, et cetera, um, especially in an area that is not necessarily the best for solar in light of all the fog we have. So question, uh, I'm wondering is, in terms of resiliency, isn't it, uh, might it be better to have, you know, in, in, for a city that is so transit dependent to have some capability to use non-electric uh, dependent transit in light of outages, et cetera. So, uh, Kathy, uh, I do want to kind of um, uh, uh, respond to your comment about uh, uh, not using zero emission technologies. Um, uh, we do you know this? We we do understand that transition to zero emission is really not like a, okay. We switch from flip phone to our smartphone. This cannot be done overnight. We totally understand that. That is why in our regulation, uh, we uh do have um a phasing schedule. That is really a part is to give people flexibility to plan out. Two is really kind of a, a, to give people opportunities to deploy pilot projects, to learn more and also to gain more confidence. And also uh, for transit agencies that uh, uh, act early, like a San Francisco Muni, um, also you get uh, um, uh, more flexibility when you uh, do early action that can buy you uh, more time. And uh, uh, certainly uh, we appreciate that Muni has started using uh, renewable diesel even before ARB required it. So all together, um, that is going to really kind of give our local residents and also local communities the maximum benefit that we could. And also uh, the regulation does provide some off ramps, some exemption options, uh, just in case a, regula uh, a transit agency couldn't really, after all sorts of uh, effort has been exhausted, still couldn't uh, deliver it, uh, we do have exemption options that the transit agency can utilize. So I understand that uh, uh, this kind of a question is really not the purpose of uh, today's uh, meeting, but I still kind of want to address it because I understand that uh, um, uh, we do have a, a uh, more than one agency that has the same question. So, Kathy, I hope that uh, I address your question. Um, thank you. Thanks. So, uh, we'll go to uh, Ed next. Ed, I had unmuted your um, your uh, mic. Please go ahead. All right. 
hopefully you can hear me. The question yes. is for Edison and PG&E. Since neither one of you has built a power plant in quite a while, how do you, how do you add capacity to the system? Is it all relying on power from other states, power from uh, hydrogen and an electrolyzer dumping into the grid? Where does power come from? We've got massive amounts that are needed and we're not building any new power plants. Where does the power come from? That's it. Thanks, Ed. Um, I'm wondering if Roger or... Yeah, I mean, I can answer that on a general level. For, for, for me, and I think even for Mike, we, we, we work in the distribution level. So we just deliver the energy uh, uh, that is generated uh, from higher level system voltages. Uh, so, so I can tell you that for us, uh, it's the ability to serve uh, the energy and deliver it. Um, however, your question, I think is probably more appropriate for our other PUC proceedings in terms of, uh, in terms of our resource acquisitions. And I know there's a planning process for, for new generation and probably that question would be more appropriate for, for someone in that level. Thanks, Roger. I was going to say the same. Yeah, this is uh, Paula at the PUC. Just to clarify that we do have the integrated resources planning process that takes into account uh, demand, uh, need, and uh, GHG targets, and it plans for any like new build outs that are necessary to meet uh, the the needs. And there's also the uh, resource adequacy proceeding that you know makes sure that there's enough contracts on the short term to serve uh, uh, the system. So the, there are uh, separate processes that look at gener generation needs and, and procurement and uh, need for, for uh, build out. Uh, most uh, normally it would be, uh, you know, some time of like uh, a clean type of generation powered by batteries. But, uh, but there's a team that is uh, responsible for that. So Where would we find that data? Because it seems like it's a massive amount of power. And if it's coming from batteries, I'm hesitant to think that that's going to be immediately available. Uh, you know, like if, if you want, we can put you in touch with, uh, with the materials. Uh, the, the, the planning process happens every few years and is updated uh, depending on, on uh, new information. So I don't, I'm not, I don't have exactly the, uh, you know, what is the mix of the, the last uh, um, uh, procurement um, uh, analysis, because I'm, I'm not, um, I don't work with that team, but, you know, I can, uh, I can give you the, the information if, if you reach out. That's great. Uh, That's all I'm looking for about, at some point, it seems like there would need to be a nuclear power plant thrown in there. Uh, Paula, will you be able to kind of uh, uh, put the link into the chat box so that the entire audience could also receive it? Uh, I'll see if I can get it right now. Um, just, just give me a sec. Thank you so much, Paula. Um, I think Ed is uh, really the last hand raised so does that mean we should really go uh, talk about next steps? I think uh, we heard a lot from um, uh, everyone today about all the insight and also invaluable discussions. Uh, we heard about questions, we heard about situations, we heard about um, recommendations, but how do we really turn recommendations into feasible steps? And also how do we really carry out best practice? What next steps do we really need in order to continue our learning and also minimize our risk? We want to uh, really uh, again open the discussions with uh, our panelists and also uh, our audience here regarding next steps. Matt. Hey, thank you. So 
Uh, Matt Colbert from the CPUC. He says this is the next step, and there is a little bit of an undertone to the discussion to this, um, just in terms of the transit. Sorry, I was getting another call on my computer. Um, just the transit agencies engaging in the planning process. I, I, I mean, this the uh, concept of you know early um, engagement with the youth utility in terms of you know what the, the trans agencies plans are moving forward I think is really key I just wanted to to note that again but also at the CPUC too so one point that I just want to make you know in terms of when we're talking about infrastructure is there's sort of two two forms of of infrastructure when it comes to transportation electrification just generally there's the the needed charging infrastructure so the physical charging uh, stations that you know these vehicles need to pl plug in. We need to plan for where those are going to be best located. Uh, but then, you know, what I think a lot of the conversation today was about was about the utility infrastructure needed to support that um, that charging infrastructure and help facilitate um, some of California's uh, longer term goals. And so, a lot of that discussion around um, the utility infrastructure um, is active at the at the CPUC. Paula just mentioned um, on the generation side, the integrated resource planning proceeding and resource adequacy. Um, we additionally have um, our distribution planning proceeding that uh, includes utilities had mentioned the, the grid needs assessment and the distribution deferral opportunities. Um, so I, this is just my way of saying as a next step to really encourage the transit agencies to, to engage in, in all of those things, because it's not only helpful for utilities to know, you know, what the plans of these transit, uh, the transit agencies are, but also, you know, from a state agency perspective, definitely from the CPUC, and I imagine from the CEC and CAR perspective as well, um, is to have that information um, um, you know, early as well. So just wanted to put that plug in and just thank you for the, the great conversation today. It's been really helpful for, for me. So thanks. Thanks, Matt. Um, next, we have Steve, followed yeah. by Michael. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just want just a comment in general, and that and that that's that that transit is is notoriously risk averse. And we like to plan for every contingency. Uh, known to man, uh, and and shifting to zero emission, whether it be battery electric or hydrogen, uh, requires a great deal of planning. That being said, you can, you can only uh, plan for so many contingencies and exigencies, and things will happen that are beyond your control or beyond your understanding. But to get to that point of finding the things that weren't contemplated, you actually have to take the plunge and and uh, get your processes started and and that's my recommendation is to do the best plans you can but also be ready to make adjustments uh during construction during implementation deployment whatever because things are going to change uh as you get more experience and as you get farther down the road but you got to get on the road to to find these things and, and uh start tackling them so. that's a good advice thanks steve uh I don't see Michael now, so uh, Jerome, you are promoted now. Oh, Michael just came back. Michael, do you want to go first, or do you? Okay, you go first. I'm to Jerome, and I'll I'll come back after Jerome. Okay, okay, thanks, Michael. I, Jerome, you go next. Thank you. I I just want to echo what Matt said about um, the value of transit agencies participating in those plans and those planning efforts. Uh, but I do want to say that um, most, my, I, you know, my opinion is a large majority of transit agencies are not going to do that. Um, they, they don't have the expertise. That's a challenging world uh, that the vocabulary used alone takes a while just to learn all of the acronyms that you all say. Um, so I would, I, I think it's a fantastic suggestion, but I would put that back towards agencies like CARB or CEC to help represent transit agencies um, along with entities like Michael or, or you know, California Transportation Agency who might actually have that bandwidth. That's fair, yes. Uh, Michael? Yeah, and thank you, Yachin. And in fact, my, my comments are gonna align, I think fairly closely 
uh, to Jerome, at least in, in the initial, and then I want to touch on some additional recommendations. Uh, but to uh, the comments about engagement with CPUC, I think this is one area where the state of California uh, should be contemplating modifications to the CPC process for engagement that will ease the path for participation from agencies like transit agencies and then eventually things like school districts. I uh, just really want to emphasize having participated in a variety of CPC proceedings over the years, uh, the, the bar uh, of rigor and uh, the really Byzantine structure that the CPUC operates under serves as a disincentive for public agencies that may not have the resources, may not have the ability to hire an attorney that is fluent in CPUC processes to participate. And so while the CPUC does oversee a very you know, robust public process, I do want to emphasize that one area where we have encouraged uh, the state and the CPUC uh, to open up and find ways to take in informal feedback that it is separate and apart from proceedings and rulemakings uh, is to have some form of public engagement, work group meetings, perhaps like this one, to take in feedback that can then inform uh, their proceedings and the rulemaking. And in you know, no way in leveling these comments am I looking to cast aspersions on the CPUC. There is a reason for the rigor of their process, and it was built up uh, over uh, decades and uh, almost a century. Uh, but with that said, as we move into this, this uh, role of needing all hands on deck, there probably does need to be a reevaluation uh, to allow for more parties to participate in that process. Uh, the other thing I do want to highlight on the, the CPUC front, uh, and this is one area where I think CARB, CPUC, and CC can provide some additional support, is that the CPUC just went through a proceeding uh, to talk about uh, extensions and modifications to the various investor-owned utilities uh, programs uh, related to make-ready infrastructure, and there are new investments that are going to be coming online. Uh, and we want to, uh, I think, as an association, ensure that our member agencies have broad fluency on what investments are going to be made available over what time horizon and what the parameters are for accessing the dollars that are going to be supported um, through uh, those IOU investments. And so as a follow-up, I think we should have some focused conversation about uh, those uh, new investments that are being brought online. Uh, the other thing that was touched on earlier in, in the conversation uh, was uh, the reality that we have currently, uh, at least in uh, one region of the state, some temporary uh, commercial electric vehicle rate structures that will soon be expiring. We need to have a broader conversation about how we extend uh, that temporary relief and perhaps build into a permanent uh, relief structure, recognizing that as soon as demand charges come right back into place, many of the agencies are going to find that the economics of running, running battery electric buses uh, become uh, less attractive. And so we're going to have to address that on the front end. And I think our, our interest would be to anticipate that change uh, and send to place uh, the changes that are necessary before we see a lapse uh, so that we don't have a slowdown in this transition. And so those are areas where I think there needs to just be some continued uh, conversation. Uh, and then as I made uh, comments on the hydrogen fuel cell front, having ongoing discussions like this one with the industry that are free flowing and open is really a benefit to all who are participating in this transition. All of us who are going to be vital for making this transition a reality. And so just want to close there and, and thank you, Yao Chen and team, for pulling together this forum. Thanks a lot, Michael. Um, much needed assignment um, to be done by uh, state agencies. We certainly will um, kind of uh, take this back and uh, discuss with the, uh, all the uh, involved sister agencies and to figure out the best way to serve the community. So, um, Steve, okay, next is Rick. Rick, please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you, Yan Chan. And um, my comments will be similar to Michael's. 
And I'll start with, with uh, what Michael touched on last. I, I would like one of the next steps for this group of folks or similar group of folks to be meeting somewhat regularly. I don't know what the right cadence is, but as opposed to let's wait next year or the year after. Uh, hopefully everyone's learned a good deal about each other's role in this and what they're um, you know, struggling with, they're grappling with. Uh, you know, as far as the CPUC goes, it's really good to have them here. I'd like to keep them engaged. I think, um, as Michael said, having individual transit operators engage with them is going to be tricky. Uh, you know, SFMTA has a really good working relationship with with their own PUC, with their own C PUC, uh, and the CPUC is in San Francisco. But it, it, for most transit operators, that's going to be um, even more tricky than it is to inter, you know, engage with CARB or Caltrans or Cal STA or, or whomever they normally do. So, you know, this could be a forum, and I think I think we need to, you know, be mindful of that. The final thing I'll say, and and turn it back over to you, is, you know, the thing we didn't touch on today, and it's really not part of these deliberations, but should always be in the back of our minds. You know, and Michael touched on this: is the affordability of this. And the constant pressure the transit operators have been on and will continue to be on to be efficient, and in some cases cut costs. And you know, labor costs are going up. There's a tremendous labor shortage across California for bus operators and mechanics. Uh, you know, we're, some of the contractors that the transit operators use barely pay the minimum wage in California, and they they're under pressure for those wages to go up. That means those operating costs go up. We should be mindful of that. We should be mindful that many operators are nearing what they consider to be this thing we're calling a fiscal cliff. Part of it's due to the pandemic and the loss of ridership. Others, other causes are the expenses for operating transit in California are going up on a lot of fronts, uh, not just the energy front and the labor front. Price of bus has gone um, significantly higher because of the supply chain issues. All those things are out there, and all those things put pressure on the public transit operators. Therefore, it behooves us if we really want to meet these goals that have been set out, that everyone works together to help the transit operators succeed uh, as much as they can. And this, this group meeting regularly could be a small but important step in that process. Thanks a lot, Rick. Um, Steve, uh, your hand is uh, raised. Oh, Lord. Okay, you forgot to Sorry, lower it. Sorry, it was wrong. <laughs> no, don't worry. You're never wrong. Uh, always great to have your input anyway. So, uh, okay, uh, Esther from CEC, go ahead, please. Yeah, so just to respond to Rick's uh, comment quickly, I know uh, it's a lot about infrastructure and the funding that is required and the transit agencies are concerned about all this. So we know that the CEC, as CEC, we will continue to explore all these new, uh, both the public and private partnerships so that we can be able to leverage all these limited resources that we are talking about. And that's using the clean transportation funds that are available. And of course, for our investment, we want to make sure we actually maximize all the benefits that come from all this infra uh, infrastructure in investment. And I know right now we are in an excellent position to actually reach this zero emission operations for not just the light duty vehicles, we're also looking at the buses and of course the trucks. So we are making all this effort and we are committed and we are collaborating with CAV and other agencies to make sure this happens, not just for all the other fleet, but especially the transit fleets because of all this uh, sim uh, uh, significant amount that we have within the CEC. So we are really working with everybody to get these uh, funds out the door and to ensure that the transit agencies have these funds at the right time. So we are working on that. Thank you. Thanks, Esther. It's a very uh, uh, encouraging to have uh, uh, you know sister agency support and also all the uh, participating sister agencies support. This is also uh, what we have heard uh, today. Um, I think everyone wants the transit sector to be successful because um, uh, the transit agencies, the transit buses are really our very first way for heavy duty vehicles 
to go zero emission. And uh, um, there are so many technical reasons, but also some of the um, uh, spiritual spiritual reason is also because uh, transit buses go to our local communities. If you are successful, you are our best ambassadors uh, to demonstrate the uh, the uh, technologies. So uh, with that, uh, do we have uh, any other? Um, uh, I have something. <laughs> I'm just learning that our panelists have been able to post things into the chat, but only to, so that other panelists can see. And there are certain things that they might have been wanting to share with all the members of the audience. I, I'm starting to backtrack. I, um, uh, I've got Paula's posts uh, in there and Roger's posts in there, but if there's anything else that you all have, have wanted to share during this session um, with the general audience, shoot it, just put it, repost it to the, um, you know, to the hosts and panelists, and I will um, just copy paste it and post it to everyone so everybody knows. Uh, There's certain that is links. A, that's it. Such a good reminder, Leslie. And also, uh, if you missed any um, uh, link there, don't worry. I think we're going to um, collect all the uh, posting, uh, all the links from today, put them into one pager and uh, post it on our website. So you can always go back, you know, uh, after today. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm not seeing any others, so good. Okay, so with that, um, Annalisa, would you like to maybe uh, provide a closing? I think we're actually ahead of our time today. Sure. Um, I really want to thank everybody for um, input, consideration, suggestions. This has been a remarkably constructive uh, conversation, and I have really appreciated being able to sit back and listen um, to all of the great uh, dialogue um and sharing of information i think it's important for us to take all of these uh suggestions and comments back and follow up on the next steps i also really appreciate that all of the next steps have been very concrete and specific um that's always really uh, valuable for us to work with um zero emission buses as i said before are beachhead uh, uh for the transition to zero emission uh, technologies, and we want to make sure that deployment is successful. I was sitting here listening um, to all of these suggestions and experiences and lessons learned and thinking, I want to, um, when this recording is available, make it available to the uh, Advanced Clean Fleets stakeholder community, because I think there are a lot of opportunities to learn um, uh, for that sector as well. Uh, and uh, we'll continue to update everyone through our listserv and uh, on the latest activities and information. And I wanna take back and um, speak with our team about a cadence for uh, future conversations, um, getting this group together and, as well as other sectors uh, to keep the dialogue going. Um, I heard the theme of coordination and, um, uh, uh, shoot, the word escaped me, but coordination and working <laughs> together um, throughout the whole day. And uh, I would love for us to work with our sister agencies um, to create that platform for everyone. So again, thank you so very much. Uh, and uh, we look forward to working with everybody. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody, bye-bye. Thank you all, bye-bye.